do a quick new share and uh, hopefully in the new share, it'll do the right thing. Individual behavior, behaviors of participants or co constituents, that doesn't, the sum of those individual behaviors doesn't match with the observed overall behavior of the system. Um, and, you know, causes can be very nonlinear. So I'm, I'm definitely a butterfly effect kind of guy. Uh, you know, small cause can have huge consequence uh, sort of thing. And every once in a while, things just seem to, there seems to be an order or a structure um, that, that is uh, kind of, uh, you know, defining, you know, what's going on underneath the hood, so to speak. But again, it's very difficult to assess. So when people ask me, hey, talk to me more about, you know, near Earth space and what's going on. First, I say, well, we have a space environment that is extremely uh, dynamic. You know, we have gravity, you have solar flux, charged particles, all these kind of things, the milieu, uh, as it were. And then you have objects uh, in that environment. Uh, we're going to focus on anthropogenic space objects, human made, human derived. There's an interaction between the environment and those objects that causes them to behave in certain ways, not just motion, but other things as well. And uh, because this is a shared resource, uh, there's a lot of competition and not everybody is out there for, you know, benevolence and, and, and hugs and, you know, uh, pillow fights and tickling each other sort of thing. So, so the thing is, I mean, the threats are real, but not everything that is not understood should be considered a threat. So that's, that's not good. Um, finite resource. So people keep on thinking this whole space is big kind of thing. Um, people thought that of the oceans, look where we're at, where we are with that. And uh, what I've done here, what you're seeing here uh, plotted is I've taken a snapshot of like 4,000 uh, objects, uh, human-made objects, anthropogenic space objects in Earth orbit. And I just took their positions and velocities and I mapped these things. Uh, I mapped them into what's called um, their specific orbital angular momentum space. And so uh, the colors are the inclination uh, of the orbit. So basically it's like, the, 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 the basically the orbit, the orbital plane of the object, uh, its inclination with respect to the equator. So something that was orbiting kind of along Earth's equator would be zero degrees inclination. Something that goes over the poles would be like 90 degrees inclination. And the cool thing is, is that you can see these neighborhoods, uh, you know, in this space and they naturally kind of cluster here. Um, you know, here you have low Earth orbit objects here in the middle, you have like geotransfer orbit type stuff. And then this little thing here up top, this, this halo thing on top is, is geo. So you can see things based on orbital energy. The size of the ring uh, is dependent on like perturbations and that sort of stuff. But this is to say we have highways in space. Just like we have highways on the, on the earth, we have you know lanes on, on the ocean uh, that are shipping routes, right? So we have this in space. And the thing is, these things are becoming more and more congested because many of these things above low or orbit, they never come back. So we just keep on putting stuff up there. So what do we want to avoid amongst other things? For sure, harmful interference. What does that even mean? Well, uh, you know, it's not clearly defined in, in, in legal terms, but let's just say we want to prevent loss, disruption, or degradation of space services, activities, or capabilities and even science uh, impacts like to astronomy and that sort of stuff, okay? So that bang box on the bottom, to know something, you have to measure it, to understand it, you have to predict it. Please keep that in mind. We're interested in really understanding the entire population of anthropogenic space objects, everything, everything that's human made, human derived in near Earth space. But back to the, if you wanna know, know it, you have to measure it. We can't actually measure the entire population. So we can't perform a census. Uh, interesting, you know, that term census uh, kind of rigorously defined in statistics means basically being able to measure an entire population. Interestingly enough, when, when we perform a census of people in the U.S., we actually don't perform a statistical census because we actually don't measure everybody. Um, so we can only measure a sample of that population, of the stuff in space. So we have to leverage what's called inferential statistics to draw conclusions from the sample about the entire population. That's where we start getting into trouble because we don't have a common pool of data that we share globally. So the conclusions that we're drawing are actually different from each other. 
uh, and there are some inconsistencies between, say, NASA and the European Space Agency on uh, the, the number of objects and all this other stuff, okay? And oh, by the way, whenever we draw conclusions, there's this thing called uncertainty or ambiguity that we have to deal with. The only way to really get rid of the uncertainty uh, is to apply prejudice. And so we don't want to do that because, well, if we apply the wrong prejudice, uh, for lack of a better term, then we could end up making very poor decisions. So the inferred uh, anthropogenic space object population, again, because we're only measuring a sample, not the whole, we can only measure about, I don't know, 30,000 of these objects. We believe that there's you know over a million going down to like millimeter size, but we can't track things that small. So only uh, about 30,000 things from space station down to like softball. Out of those 30,000 things, maybe there's like 4,000 that are actually things that work, provide a service, things that we care about, uh, and everything else is garbage. So you know, 90, 90 plus percent of the stuff that we actually track is garbage, and, and clearly the stuff that we're not tracking is also garbage because it's like too small to you know. There, nobody's controlling specks of paint, at least to, to the best of my knowledge. Um, so all right, so so kind of inverting the uh, this this you know model from the United States, I, I say et unum pluribus. So you know, out of out of one many, out of one common environment, many needs, competing needs, disparate needs for safety, security, sustainability, geopolitical tug of wars, saber rattling, these sorts of things, all happening in this finite resource that has no global coordination and planning. Okay. From an environmental perspective, one of the things that I think is uh, we're bringing to the table, and I saw that Asha was uh, uh, Jane is, is is listening here, so she she was helping us with this uh, idea of how to come up with a, a definition of orbital carrying capacity. Uh, European Space Agency has come up with an initial definition of this, but um, you know what is what does that mean? People talk about Kessler uh, effect. I'm not really a believer in Kessler uh, for a variety of reasons that probably go beyond the time I have here. Maybe somebody will ask me the questions and I'll answer that. But I do believe that um, instead of this whole Kessler thing that we can saturate the carrying capacity of any orbit, just like carrying capacity gets saturated on highways and in ecosystems and orbital regimes based on what I showed you, that carrying capacity can get saturated. What does saturation mean for carrying capacity? Well. It means that if we if if our decisions and actions can't prevent things that are undesirable, then by by in all intents and purposes we can't use that orbit anymore. If we want to keep each other safe and stay out of each other's way and that sort of stuff, and we find that we can't do that, then we can't use the orbit, and so we've lost we've lost the capacity for 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 uh, you know that space resource uh, utilization, and. Um, the capacity can be consumed by natural and uh, dead objects, uh, you know, uh, artificial objects, human made, that sort of stuff. And it's fed by this thing called a space traffic footprint. And the space traffic footprint, kind of, kind of like a carbon footprint analog, you can think of it as the burden that any given object poses on the safety and sustainability of anything else. So, so when I get into my vehicle every morning and I turn, it, turn the engine on, and as soon as I put it in reverse, I am now a burden to all pedestrians and other drivers. And even if they can predict my every move, the fact that they have to take my existence into account for their own actions is a burden. So that, that's what the space traffic footprint really is. It's a burden on other stuff, even if you know it exactly and can predict it exactly. So this brings me to this kind of Johari window for space domain awareness in terms of understanding you know, what are the risks and the impacts? What's our level of knowledge? And so you kind of jokingly with the whole, you know, Donald Rumsfeld thing years ago, the whole, you know, known knowns, known unknowns, unknown unknowns. Um, there is rhyme and reason behind that. I, I want you to think of the two terms as the first term speaks to uh, the things that uh, you are aware of, okay? And the other things are, uh, the other term is what you've measured, okay? So awareness and what you've measured. And again, to know something, you have to measure it. So a known known is something that you are aware of having measured. A known unknown is something that you are aware of that you have not measured. The unknown unknowns are the enigmas. You're unaware of it and you haven't measured it, so you can't really know it. 
And the unknown knowns are things that you're unaware of having measured. That is where big data science and analytics comes to shine. We want to aggregate massive quantities of uh, information, heterogeneous data from all walks of life, aggregate these things into a framework that lets us then ask interesting questions and see, can we have, have we unknowingly measured something? That's the question that we're trying to, to ask of that aggregated data set so that we can discover stuff that we didn't know before. And let's see, yep. So space domain awareness, really we wanna measure ourselves with, are, you know, are we making space more transparent? What is it, who does it belong to, what can it do? Are we making it more predictable? You know, what are any two entities gonna do in a common situation? Do they interpret space law and implement it in the same way? That sort of thing, is there cultural context to these things? And how do we develop a body of evidence to hold people accountable for their behaviors in space? Detecting and tracking aren't the same things. Detecting or just sensing stuff. By the way, I got to tell you, I'm tired of people talking about, oh, if we just put more sensors up there, we're going to do better with understanding where stuff is. Well, that's, that's partially true. Sensors sense. Sensors don't track stuff. Algorithms do that. Okay. So, so, so uh, I, I've just seen that in the news. A bunch of people that just want to convince people that just sensors alone does the trick, and it doesn't. Here, case in point. Here's a space surveillance telescope, a single night's worth of detections. All the, de all the dots are detections. Things that are, that are black dots are things that we actually know what they are or believe to. And everything else that's not black is an unknown thing. Who knows what it is? Who does it belong to? What could it do? So detecting, sensing is insufficient. Necessary, but insufficient. We need to actually track stuff, which is associate individual names, first and last names to objects. Um, this is part of trying to conduct a census and figure out the demographics. And uh, most of the stuff doesn't report its identity. That's part of the problem, right? Most of the stuff up there is dead. It doesn't tell you what it is or who it is or whatever. So this is part of what we need to figure out. We'd like to start from the far right with things that we can measure and then, sorry, far left, and then go towards the right with, can we aggregate these things and sort the data out so that we can move further and further to the right with unique uh, identification. I hear lots of stuff about uh, data lakes and repositories. Oh, all we just need is more data. Here's what you get. You get a, a room full of books scattered on the ground. How do you use that? Good luck with trying to find a piece of information that's meaningful to you or relevant. So we don't just need data lakes. La I, I got to tell you, um, you know, lakes can have potable water, but I've seen also, uh, you know, lakes that are used in septic systems. So the thing is, you know, all lakes are not created equal. What you want to do is you want curated information. Not only do you want the data lake, but you want it organized. You want it curated. You want things mapped into a lingua franca that helps you figure out what information you need and how to query the right information at the speed of relevance. That's what you need. Okay. So anyway, uh, as an example, we developed this uh, thing called Arcade partnership with IBM, MIT, and Neo4j. And this is basically our way of, of getting to this is having not only the data repository, but curating it, doing the right data engineering to basically facilitate analysis. Uh, it's a three-tiered system. Uh, this kind of explains it, but in the interest of time, I think I'm gonna skip, skip over this. Uh, this is just to say that we bring in multiple source information, map it to this, the middle layer is where we actually curate things with schema. We, we label things semantically, nodes are entities, edges are relationships, and it, it exposes it to the penthouse layer, which is just applications and uh, diverse inquiry from both scientists, policymakers, that sort of stuff. Uh, Arcade in a flow diagram just kind of looks like this. We have sources of information on the, on the left, uh, people that have queries on the far right. And then this middle ground is where we have like Azure Graph, Neo4j, IBM cloud storage, that sort of stuff. So we have interesting questions that we want to answer. I'm sure all of you have some more, so I'm not going to belabor this, but I'm just going to leave you with this. You know, Rudolf Emil Kalman at his Kyoto Prize in like the 80s uh, made this statement kind of paraphrasing, whenever a model is built, it's always proper to ponder the basic scientific question is a model really based on the data or is an artifact displaying the prejudices of its creator? 
we want to be allergic to confirmation bias and just applying prejudice to get rid of uncertainty, and, and which means we need to respect the problem. Thank you very much. That's great. I love how you jump back and forth between talking like an economist and burdens to others, to an engineer, a physicist, a management consultant, um, and then occasionally a, a, a host on a children's show. It's it's a great combination. So thank you so much for, for that insight. Um, we do have a question about orbital capacity from our audience. Um, can orbital capacity be scaled through the use of very large space structures and aggregation into fewer but considerably larger objects. Yeah, so look, I think um, actually, you know, orbital capacity kind of, it, it's it's subjective and, and, and certainly, mm -hmm. and, and it's subjective and it depends on who the owner operators are and their ability to understand, uh, reduce uncertainty and ambiguity ability to predict what's going to happen, you know, as, as, as uncertainty is reduced, um, as you're able to predict uh, things more and more accurately, you have more, you actually have more capacity. So if, if, if you kept the objects, the same number, all the objects are the same, but you have technology to help you reduce uncertainty and improve predictability, you actually gain capacity, right? Mm -hmm. And so the thing is all it's nuanced, it's, it's nuanced. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Hussein Bokhari says, don't we need confirmation bias to create a baseline? Where is the baseline to understanding what's what and what should be important? Who determines this? Should this be left to countries or operators? Yeah, so I, I like that. Um, actually, uh, I, I would say this, right? So I'm gonna rephrase things and say, we don't want a single confirmation bias. We want an ensemble of confirmation biases. So that is to say, given the evidence, can we enumerate all the hypotheses that explain the evidence? Each hypothesis in and of itself is confirmation bias. It says, I believe that I'm correct. And so the ensemble of opinions, everybody believes they're correct, but clearly not all of them can be, right? Um, but that's the ensemble of possibilities. And what we wanna do then is say, okay, what does each confirmation bias predict? And then can we measure the distance between empirical evidence and the prediction? And that amount is called surprise. So, so if, any, if any opinion is really surprised, chances are it's not the correct one. Because if you know the truth, there's no surprisal. If I can predict the truth exactly, there's no, then, then, then my prediction actually matches what I observe and there's no surprise. So I think all these, uh, yeah, that's, that's my long winded answer. Yeah, and I think that kind of gets back to some of the point about data lakes into Arcade is that you had to make certain calls about how to organize the data, what gets its own unique ID. That's right. Um, yeah, yeah, fascinating. Um, Talk about, you know, you've been on uh, once before, and that was several months ago. Talk about um, progress since then. I know that there's a lot of convincing to do, a lot of work to do, and a lot of work going on behind the scenes with products like Arcade and the taxonomy that you're working on. What have people started to engage with uh, more since uh, a few months ago? Um. Well, I, I have to say this. Uh, certainly, I see that there's movement in the U.S. government towards um, trying to address the problems and find some solutions. So that I, I like, I like hearing and knowing that people are meeting and talking about these things and trying to come up with a strategic roadmap to address some of this stuff. So that's a positive thing. Um, I think the place where I'm still uh, where I'm still shaking, shaking my head a bit is, look, there, it's, it's like every day there are more and more startups and companies, uh, space. This is great in terms of there's a lot of interest in a, in, in a growing awareness about stuff in space. The thing is, there's only a, a finite set of resources to throw to this stuff. 
And I feel that we're still in this zone of the spray and pray model. I'm gonna spray resources on the wall and pray that something sticks. And that's just, that's just not strategic. And I, mm -hmm. and I don't think it gets us, we don't have time to waste um, with, 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 with spraying and praying. So um, there needs to be some leadership to focus on very specific things. Don't try to boil the ocean kind of stuff, crawl, walk, run, but be methodical. One of the things I love uh, hearing from somebody when I was much younger was, make sure that you always move quickly without haste. We need to move quickly without haste. And right now we're hasty. Yeah. And seriously, but not without a sense of humor. Yes. Um, that haste uh, and, and the organization, where do you see that leadership? I, obviously you talked about US government, you've worked with AFRL, um, there's movement within NASA, there's movement within ESA, the FAA, Department of Commerce may or may not be making progress on this. So where do you see the leadership coming from and are the leaders who are emerging talking to the right people? Are they attacking the right problems? Um, I would say this, right? Uh, lots of people believe that they have the answers uh, and they have the solutions and, um, and they want to get the funding to do it. Yeah. I, don't, I don't see a whole lot of folks saying, let's develop a consortium to do this and recognize that the answer lies uh, within diversity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what the, the whole Lord of the Ring, one re ring to rule them all, one Acme Incorporated to solve it, that's not going to cut it. So we need, we need a diversity of thought and of uh, proposals to basically, just like the ensemble of hypotheses that are all possible, what are all the possibilities of how we solve this stuff? And, and through this ensemble, then we can start testing these things and kind of harmonizing these things to converge towards something that's workable and makes sense. And I think that's where the, the leadership is not forcing the consortium, uh, you know, the ensemble thing to happen. That's the thing where I think there's a mistake. I keep on seeing people say, hey, we want best athlete. We're looking for best of breed, best athlete. I still hear people say that nonsense. It's like, look, take Usain Bolt and have him run a marathon. He, he ain't going to win. I guarantee that sort of stuff because he's a sprinter. Take, take right, Iliud Kipchoge and make him like compete in the 100 meter. He ain't going to win that either. So the dude's fast, you know, fastest marathon runner in the world, maybe not so great in the 100 meter. The thing is you need a team. Everywhere where I've seen excellence, it's been a team effort. It's never been about individuals. And I think that's what's missing from the leadership is recognizing that it needs to be an ensemble that addresses this. Stop trying to find the best of breed and the best athlete. Because guess what? The events change and you may have just screwed yourself royally by trying to do that sort of thing. Yeah, I completely agree. Heard that a lot uh, in other venues as well. The limitations on that are staggering. Um, you talked a little bit about pillow fights early on, and I kind of want to get a pillow fight going between Astro Scales, Elsa D, and maybe a, a Terminator tape from Tethers Unlimited. That'd be kind of fun up in space. Um, you, you meant when you brought up pillow fights that different governments do things different ways. Um, talk about which governments you think will be best at the combination of leadership and making sure that, that there's that, that diversity of thought um, in solving yes. this problem. Yeah, so I, I think, I think the, be, the, the governments that'll probably do the best is actually, you know, just like with COVID, we talk about trying to flatten the curve of, of, of the pandemic. There is a need to flatten the curve on the proliferation of debris and that sort of stuff. So I think governments that'll do best is recognizing that internationally, they have liability for damage and all this stuff. And because they have uh, the responsibility, right, to provide authorization and continuing supervision of space activities of non-government actors, they should basically work on not only their national space policy, but their actual national space law, and basically uh, encode 
the, the you know what science is saying with debris mitigation and all this other stuff make that into national space laws un copos came up with some guidelines figure out which ones make make sense to to codify into your own national space law and then hold your own people accountable for that and show that to the rest of the world hey i'm holding my people responsible for how they behave in space and, and i'm measuring their intended and unintended consequences and i'm trying to come to the table with other countries to recognize coming up with the whole Star Trek Federation thing to rule near Earth space, that ain't gonna happen anytime soon. Stop trying to do that. But countries ha have, have the ability to just work like an ensemble, like a team, to come harmoniously together and say, all of us are gonna hold each other's feet to the fire and, and make sure that our own constituents are behaving responsibly and sustainably in space. Yeah, terrific. One last question. There are a bunch of them in the chat and I'm gonna to try to capture one. Um, one that gets right to the point, simple, um, and maybe good for some of our newer audience. Hussein Barkari asks, what is the commercial benefit? To, to behaving sustainably, making money. You're, yeah. gonna lose that, you're gonna lose that ability. The commercial benefit is keep on making money. Here's the thing that I don't get, right? It's like even if it was just for, this is how stupid the, these people are. The thing is they haven't even realized that in the, in the best intent of ultimate greed, with ultimate greed, they should be embracing sustainable behaviors so that they can make sure that their stakeholders are gonna keep on making money, you know, per secular secularum. So, so if it's just for greed alone, you should be embracing uh, sustainable behaviors because it's in your best interest to continue to make money. and. Try to promote other people doing that because you know we're only as safe as the the dumbest driver on the road kind of thing. So if everybody has great drivers, Ed, well, your defensive driving skills don't have to be as prominent as they would be otherwise. Great, really appreciate your time. Um, no worries. And uh, as you can tell, to... I have no passion about this subject. You know? No, you're you're just pretty deadpan about the whole thing. We look forward to having you back sometime soon and really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your expertise and your generosity in sharing it. Yeah, thanks to everybody. Look, stay safe and healthy and we can all do this together. Just, uh, you know, step up. All right. Our next segment is What's Going On with Laura Forzik. Um, Let's see, it's sponsored this month by the charming and generous Terry Trevino, who spoke with us this morning. Terry, we're again so grateful for your steadfast participation in and support of Conversations for the Future. Thank you. And now for what's going on, Ms. Borzik is the owner of space consulting firm Astrolytical, specializing in space science, industry, and policy, and offering space career coaching services. She is a NASA subject matter expert for planetary science missions and is also the primary author of Astrolytical Explore Flybys and Orbits Analytical Analytics, which I highly recommend every month. Ms. Forzik is also the author of the book Rise of the Space Age Millennials and is a frequent source for news publications, regional newspapers, and public radio. She's been everywhere lately, uh, really out there, and, and it's exciting to see her expertise recognized over and over again. Laura, we love it when you keep us up to the minute. So what's going on? Thank you, Lee. Thank you for having me back again, and thank you again, Terry. Um, so there's been so much going on in the past month or two on this subject of talk. So I'm just really excited to first start off congratulating AstroScale. I know we're going to hear from some of these speakers later today and also tomorrow, but that's the big news I want to start out with because we don't have a whole lot of evidence yet that there's actual technology that can grab onto stuff in space 
And so Astroscale and Northrop Grumman and a few others have really been at the forefront of demonstrating that, yes, we can set service satellites, clean up space debris, and all the wonderful things that we've been talking about. So I want to congratulate Astroscale on their end of life services by Astroscale demonstration, LCD, which was launched in March and just on August 25th. So what was that, two weeks ago? Um, successfully completed the first test of capturing a little satellite that they released for a few seconds. It, it went out for a few centimeters and then um, they turned back on that magnet and they captured it again. So congratulations. That's a great first step. I know that they have some other tests that they're going to talk about, including some tumbling things, uh, you know, tumbling their satellite and all of that. Um, excellent first step. They're already in the process of doing the next uh the demonstrator, I think, the end of services by Astroscale Multi, which I'm sure they're going to talk about a little later. Um, and I, I just, I think it's a wonderful thing that we have all of these different diversely, just how Morva was just talking, all these different diverse ideas of how to tackle the problem. And so that is just one idea of how to tackle it and proving out these concepts is of great importance. Um, so also going on, and I know we're going to have again a speaker later today talk about Tethers. Uh, Tethers Unlimited, uh, they have something called the Terminator Tape, which is just a pretty much just something that unravels a drag tape. Um, and Millennium Space Systems, which is a subsidiary of Boeing, they um, just about two weeks ago again demonstrated or announced that they have successfully demonstrated a uh, Tethers Unlimited Terminator tape. So they had launched two identical small sats um, at the same time. And one of them had the Terminator tape and one of them did not. <laughs> and the one that actually um, had the tape on it, the drag tape, it deorbited within eight months. And the other one is expected to stay up there you know, about seven years or longer. And so we are already seeing all these different methods of either capturing satellites or space debris or deorbiting them on purpose, um, which is really, really vital when we're talking about all these constellations that are launching and will be launching small satellites and, and um, you know, really um, figuring out how to be responsible stewards of that or orbital environment, because it is, even though space seems vast, the orbital environment is finite, and we need to make sure that we can kill satellites on purpose and not in an irresponsible way. I'm going to talk about that later. Um, so another announcement to make is that um, there are now 208 dog tags in space. Now, what is a dog tag? That is a universal grapple system attached to one web satellites. They are built by um, Altia Space Systems, which is a subsidiary of Voyager Space Holdings. And um, when was that launch? That was maybe three weeks ago. There was another launch of 34 one web satellites for their constellation. And they have been using these dog tags, um, I think the whole time. And so now there are 208 of those dog tags in space. Space, um, figuring out ways that we can really um, track, just like Morva was saying, track these satellites and be able to figure out a way that we can capture them in the future. Um, and, and to back up, this isn't recent news. I'm trying to focus on really recent news for this talk. But if you remember back in um, 2009, Yes, maybe. <laughs> Shoot, I'm sorry. I didn't look up the exact dates for this one. But there was something called the Mission Extension Vehicle 1 that was launched by Northrop Grumman. And then last year in eight in in shoot, yeah, I'm, I'm messing up time frame here, but it, it within the past year or so, it captured, it grabbed onto an Intelsat satellite that was already up there. And it was um, up there in a um and an orbit that was no longer useful. So that satellite was not initially launched to be grabbed onto. So there's two different methods here. One is actually having something for these satellites to then be future, in the future be grabbed onto, or coming up with a system that grabs onto satellites that were never meant to be grabbed onto. Um, and I think both of these are really important to pursue. The majority of satellites already up there were never meant to be grabbed onto. So anyway, back to MEV-1, um, that was demonstrated last year um, to have taken that uh, retired until sat satellite that would have stayed up there for many years and bring it back down into a, a geo um, operational orbit. 
And then in April of this year, MEV-2, so the next version of this uh, mission extension vehicle that Northrop Grumman made, attached onto a different Intel cell satellite. And it actually brought it, it, it was already in geo orbit, but it brought it into an extended service. So that MEV-2 is going to stay onto that satellite for five years. And I want to bring this up because about a month ago, um, Intelsat actually announced that they're using that satellite that was that MEV-2 attached satellite, the, um, let me see, Intelsat 1002, which is NGO again, it's actually using that to provide mobile services to French Guiana um, through a telecommunications company called Orange. So this really proves out the concept that um, extending satellite lifetimes can bring about um, it, more profits, you know, improved capabilities for the companies that are using this technology. Um, Another thing is keeping in mind that government is going to be very all over this. So um, Lockheed Martin just announced that their GPS-3 satellites are ready. And um, something new with these GPS-3 satellites is an in-space upgrade satellite system that, um, not more, that Lockheed Martin has attached to the GPS-3 satellites. And again, GPS-3, that's government. So that's US government satellites. Um, and the special thing about this upgrade is that they are going to be serviceable. So um, Northrop Grumman, I'm sorry, <laughs> Lockheed Martin is going to be launching tw uh, two 12U CubeSats later this year to GEO, and they're going to demonstrate that satellite servicing. And so that's really important because it shows you that not only some newer players like Astroscale, Tethers Limited, not only they are involved in this whole effort of satellite servicing, but also the big players of Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, again, Boeing is the owner of Millennium Space Systems. So this is a real um, universal effort in a sense that we have not just U.S. companies, but global companies getting involved. Astroscale is head headquartered in Japan. Um, OneWeb is headquartered in the U.K., I believe. Um, you know, it, it's, it's universal also in the sense that it's older space companies, more established space companies, as well as a lot of newer players that are getting involved here. Um, and there is... One other thing I want to talk about, which is not necessarily new news, but there is um, a reason why we want to talk about the fact that there's, I, I missed the beginning of more of his talk, so I don't know if he actually got into this, but we have the, the satellites we put up in purpose, uh, for pur you know, for a purpose that either um, have, have outlived their usefulness or have stopped working by accident. But we also have uh, the creation of space debris by um, kinetic impacts, whether that's accidental connect, kinetic impacts to, to satellites colliding into each other or whether that is purposeful, um, you know, anti-satellite kinetic impacts. And so we wanna be sure that we do not create additional space debris on purpose. And so there's actually an open letter right now by the Outer Space Institute. I just wanna point you to it. I'm not actually affiliated with them, but I've signed my name to their international open letter on kinetic anti-satellite ASAT testing. So you can find this at outerspaceinstitute.ca, and I will put that link in the chat, just so that we can um, be responsible stewards of the environment by not only taking care of what's up there, but, but mitigating against preventing further space debris. Because it's not just about the satellites, it's also about not creating you know, the, the pieces of the satellites by blowing them up on purpose. Um, and that was a really quick overview of the past month. There are a lot of other things like I could talk about, for example, I've lost my notes already, but um, there are a lot of other companies that are working this arena that you're gonna be hearing about. Um, for example, Momentus, which is a company that has been developing their space tug Vigoride. Um, so they have gone through a number of delays, but in the past month, they've gotten new leadership. So there, there was some drama over their previous CEO and national security concerns. So they got a new CEO at the beginning of August. They also um, uh, got... Um, uh, they went public. There's the SPAC, the Special Purpose Acquisition Corporation. So they merged with a SPAC um, in mid-August, so just a few weeks ago, to um, become public, to, to give them an influx of capital that they can use then to create um, or continue to develop their, their space tug. So there's a lot of companies that are developing different mechanisms of either satellite servicing or uh, satellite capture or space to recapture. And we want to make sure that we can encourage all of these different systems and 
all these different concepts because we don't know what's going to work. Earlier this summer, I actually helped lead a, a team. I was the coach of a team of students through the Brooke Owens Fellowship that were actually tasked with how do you solve the problem of space debris and the congestion in um, Earth orbit. And they had this concept of a Swiss Army knife satellite system um, where it's just multiple different ways of capture, you know, nets and magnets and, and all of these things. And they had just a, a couple of days to put up to this, this concept together. So um, you could imagine though, if a few students can put together a, this, this vast concept of how to deal with space debris, then we can welcome all different kinds of ways that we might be able to tackle the problem. And we want to tackle it now. Um, and so I know that we're going to go into legality later this uh, today in, in some further talks, but that is one area of um, uh, that needs improvement <laughs> because right now um, there are companies that can do business to business, which makes them money. You know, for example, the Northrop Grumman and the Intelsat. There's also companies that can get money from the government to service their satellites or whatever. But it's really going to be the governments of the world that need to work together to both mitigate against future space debris and also make it legal to um, do some kind of salvaging services, recycling. I know there's speakers talking about recycling a little bit later because right now that is a legal gray area. Also. Uh, very illegal, <laughs> depending on how you want to look at it. And I'm not a lawyer, so I don't want to get into that. But these are some of the topics that we need to start considering that have not gotten much momentum in, in recent news. So I would love to see and be able to talk in the future, um, uh, you know, what's going on segments about how um, our elected officials and, and um, the UN and whoever else might be helping to make uh, satellite recycling and um, ASAT, kinetic ASAT tests and all these things, how they might be working together to make things either legal or legal to, to, um, to better the space environment and all the things that we're gonna be talking about later today and tomorrow. So I'm gonna open it up for questions and I also wanna stick in the chat that link to that open letter that I spoke about. And if this interests you, um, a lot of these topics I talked about um, in the newsletter that my company puts together every month, um, you can go to astrolytical.com and you can sign up for the newsletter that we put out every month on um, the, the topics that have been going on over the past month, not just you know space servicing and, and space debris, but also other relevant topics and the insights that you can gain from that. And I'll put a link to that in the chat as well. But I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions because I see that there's things going on in the chat that I haven't been following. Great, great. Um, you talked about a lot of successes. So we have LCD, Terminator tape, um, dog tags, MEV1, MEV2, uh, and the GPS3. Sounds like everything worked. So we talk about that Swiss Army knife. Sounds like, you know, all those things are being verified. Do you know any examples of something that has failed and why? Not recently. No. So I'm not in a a great expert on this topic to know the history. Uh, to, I'm, I'm sure that there are things that failed on the ground. I'm not familiar off the top of my head with anything that's failed in space, um, mainly because this is such a new area. When I used to work at um, CASES ISS National Lab, we actually got proposals for different types of um, space debris capture or satellite capture that generally were not seen as uh, uh, fundable, even though they met the criteria of ben benefiting Earth because space environment is, is a benefit to Earth, but also because there wasn't an obvious return on investment for uh, ISS National Lab is primarily funded by NASA, which is U.S. government. So, you know, where's that return on investment? And now we're starting to see that a little bit more over the past few years. Um, and so I think as people, as, as companies make the case and as governments become more aware that they should be investing in this, um, not just governments also, but private individuals, we're gonna, we're gonna hear a lot from investors as they become more aware that this is an area to invest in, then we're gonna see more activity and not all of that's going to succeed. You're absolutely right. Just as we've seen a lot of interesting rocket failures lately with um, Astra and Firefly, um, we don't expect rocket launches to succeed every time, especially <laughs> so we should not expect to see these systems uh, it succeed every time, but each failure teaches us something. And um, I think it's been great that we've seen a lot of successes initially, um, but failures can teach you just as much as success can. Yeah, yeah. Talk a little bit about um, the different company sizes. Obviously, um, you know, Astroscale, 
small startup, but still the se second largest or first largest Japanese funded company uh, in the space industry. Um, Tethers Unlimited, long history, still kind of relatively small. But now you've got Lockheed, Northrop Grumman jumping into this game that, you know, Lockheed just announced like last month that, oh, we're going to get into this business. And now yesterday, maybe they announced a partnership with Orbit Fab. They're investing in Orbit Fab right alongside Northrop Grumman, who's also investing in Orbit Fabs for uh, satellite servicing and refueling. Can you talk about like big company versus small company and how that seems to be working out? I don't think it's any different from any other um, sector of the space industry um, where you see newer technologies being developed largely in smaller companies that then sell it to larger companies or acquired by larger companies or, um, you know, become larger companies themselves. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and, and you do have sectors within large companies meant to um, work on research and development. Uh, but I, I'd say that for the most part, larger companies are focused on um, the larger contracts and yeah. less so on more groundbreaking technology that they can easily acquire <laughs> elsewhere to put it, you know, I'm not an expert in that area either. Um, but I, I definitely foresee this being a partnership um, with, you know, the, the, a lot of times you also see partnerships with universities and we see that here as well, um, where some of this technology is developed in university labs by, by students and professors and, and that technology then ends up um, either spinning off as its own small company or um, in some way being licensed or uh, developed by a larger company um, or a government grant. And so yeah. um, I think it's gonna be, uh, uh, again, a, a part of, I don't see a need to limit or uh, even a benefit to limiting who's involved in this. I think it needs to be universal and global, but that also means it's very fractured. And so um, there is no coherent way to really categorize. I, I mean, my hat's off to you all who put the speaker list together because there's no real e easy way to categorize um, space servicing, you know, recycling, try you know, all of that. Um, and, and right now it's a free for all in a sense, but I think it'll become more coherent as we see what's working and what the industry is willing to invest in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to capture a couple of the comments. So uh, David doesn't really have a question, but just wanted to point out the propellant depot discussion last month, reducing the amount of debris was a driver for the initiatives at NASA over the past decade and a half. Uh, and by refueling systems and extending their operational life, we could greatly reduce the number of extended stages and satellites. We also consider depots for servicing active debris mitigation spacecraft. So sort of double whammy, uh, two-tiered um, servicing for the servicing <laughs> sector. Um, Adrian Times asks, what is the return on investment for cleaning up space debris? I think if Adrian can answer that question, I think he'd make a lot of money <laughs> because that's the big argument, right? And we're going to hear from a lot of speakers and they're all going to have their different perspective on that. And my personal perspective is actually mirrors what Moriba was saying about how um, if, if we don't collectively deal with it, we're going to collectively pay for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when yeah. we're, whether it is through collisions and loss of service or whether it is through um it insures and premiums going up or or whatever the case may be, we're all going to pay for it in the end if we don't deal with it. So um, that's not an easy ROI case to make, uh, but I'm looking forward to the other speakers to hear how they phrase it and what they say, because, um, you know, again, back to my time at Cases ISS National Lab, where I was arguing that we should be doing it altruistically, um, mm -hmm. but that's not, that's not the same thing as, as doing it for profit. Um, right. So again, I think think also the laws are going to need to be tweaked and changed over time to allow for um, you know, recycling, to allow for uh, the ways that we can transfer ownership of space materials that have been launched by one um, company or one launching party to another. Um, and I, I don't know if we're there yet. Yeah. Um, I know I've heard some concepts of uh, companies that want to pick apart different satellites that are defunct or are at the end of their life instead of burning them up, um, which makes sense, right? Right now we're at the stage where we have recognized that reusable rocketry can save a lot of money. So it's going to be not too far in the future that I can imagine we'd get to the point of recognize that we need to reuse what's already up there, materials already up there, instead of just either burning it up there or having it stay up there for centuries. 
Yeah. So following on those points, um, the ESA's experience with looking at removing Envisat, uh, their cost estimate for that was 350 million euros. The member states decided not to do it because it was too expensive. Uh, and because they measured an 80% 80 80 probability of it not being a problem that needed to be solved. Um, what they mean is not a problem right now. Yes, and so I think when you talk about ROI, I love that you put it in terms of like, it's not that it's gonna make you money today, it's that it's gonna save you money down the line, right? You're just simply not gonna be able to operate at a certain point if things keep going the way they're going. Um, you talked about legal gray area, transfer of ownership, um, and right now uh, companies seem to be testing only things that they bring with them, throw off, and then capture again. You know, makes a good re press release, but it sounds kind of easy. Um, if you bring all the stuff with you and then you're like, oh, I let you go, and then you grab it real, qu real quick, right? Um, are there things in space that can be grabbed by anybody or is everything limited um, in that way? Do you, are you familiar with that? Yeah, so we did see that MEV by Northrop Grumman attach on to until set satellite. Right, right. Like a business to business. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I'm looking forward to the, hearing the lawyers speak about the Outer Space Treaty because I know that they're um, is definitely legal problems with attaching onto a satellite that is not yours. Um, yeah. and, and the fact that governments are ultimately responsible for what their, um, what their companies uh, you know, launch or what they're, yeah. what they're going to launch. And um, it's an area where that could be a huge moneymaker in the future, salvaging for parts or, or restarting, um, you know, dead satellites or reusing spent rocket boosters. I mean, it's an area that could make a whole lot of money, but the le legal issues need to be worked out first. And that's not going to happen quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so what you're seeing is the, the easiest, the low hanging fruit, which is business to business arrangements or bringing up your own thing to, to test a prototype, um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that because you want to start out with those low hanging fruit and then work your way up to, to salvage. Um, and, and I don't know how that's going to play out. I don't think anyone knows, but I think it's to our benefit to figure out the legalities there so that we can make money. You, you, so you asked again, who pays for it, right? You can make money that way, but right now it does not make you money um, to try to um, get into the legal quagmire of attaching to a defunct satellite that belongs to somebody else. Yeah. And when you say belongs to someone, somebody else, are you talking about countries or individual companies who are launching? So both. Ghost, both. Okay. So if let's say um, goes T goes up there for 10 years and works great and then it dies and people want to salvage it um, under the current rules, which again, we can ask Chris tomorrow, um, what would you need permission? So for those defunct satellites, did they have to know they were U.S. satellites? Did they have to know what company had put those up there? Um, or was it just so, sort of a... Um, GOES is, for your example, is a government satellite. So yeah. it's U.S. government satellite. So you'd have to have an agreement with the U.S. government. Um, otherwise, I think it's like, I'm not a lawyer, but I think it's it's illegal <laughs> to, yeah. to try to grab onto a satellite that is not your own that you do not have a, an agreement with. Yeah. Um, again, that's an area where it could be a big money maker if we can figure out those legalities. For right now, though, um, we're seeing companies only operate in the realm that they know is legal. Um, and so, again, a business to business or um, you know some kind of demonstrator um, with your own technology and. Uh, I, I don't know if we need to tackle this like today, but legally, it, it, I mean, laws take a long time and especially mm -hmm. international laws take a very long time. So um, if we want to have an amendment to the Outer Space Treaty or whatever it is that can um, help us to get past this legal um, uncertainty, then that's going to take many years. And, you know, I'm really looking forward to the talks by the lawyers who can actually speak to this more than I can. Yeah, Chris just weighed in. He says, I'll, I'll cover some of this tomorrow. So um, be sure we all we all stay tuned. Um, Chuck Dickey jumps in and says, uh, cleanup of existing debris must be paid for by the three to seven governments who created it cooperatively based on the overall risk these objects present, not based on ownership of individual objects. 
using an NGO like TCTB could facilitate cooperation, cost, and risk sharing and overcome hurdles to ADR, that's active debris removal, of the most dangerous objects in high LEO. The ROI you speak of, or Adrian speaks of, is actually future opportunity, just like you said, Laura, in space, which these seven governments share, but not necessarily in the same proportion as the number or mass of dangerous objects they own. <laughs> I don't know if I completely agree with the concept that only seven governments are responsible. I mean, we certainly have some governments that are more responsible than others, the United States, Soviet Union being probably yeah. the top two there. I mean, China also, if you want to count the space debris from the, the ASAT tests. Um, but, you know, space is international and has been international for quite some time. And we've got, I don't know how many different countries represented in terms of the satellites that have been launched. Um, and so when you have satellites that are built by even tiny little countries, yes, they weren't launched by those countries, but they were still built by or operated by those smaller companies countries. Um, I think that's where we need to come in as a global understanding. And, and I don't know if it's going to work out well to try to figure out like a, a tiered responsibility system. I don't know. I, that's not something I've looked into. Um, but certainly the people, the players that can be more responsive, which is again, the United States, for example, um, are the ones who surely should be more responsive in helping to clean up or helping to develop this technology to satellite service or service satellites or uh, clean up the space debris simply because we have been most responsible. It, it, I don't know the most, but we have been up there and also we can. Um, yeah. Same with Russia, same with China, you know, all the major players that have a future stake in keeping the orbital environment clean for their own operations should be thinking ahead, regardless of the past, regardless of how much they've actually launched in the past, they should be thinking ahead to how much it's going to affect their future. Yeah, I, I think Shelley Brunswick brings numbers with her on this. And I think it's 85 countries have space operations and all countries are using space data in some way or other. Um, and so those numbers may be off a little bit. I'm just going on a memory of a verbal comment, but um, you know that limiting to seven countries is not entirely the whole story. Um, we'll do one more. Uh, Oh, quick, quick uh, question from Yaman Rock. Would you recommend a sort of space startup guidelines in space debris to be read or articles or resources that are your favorites on this topic? There's so many. Um, first off, check out the speakers who are going to be speaking the next two days. I'm sure they have a lot out there. Um, there are some great nonprofits and NGOs out there that have put out some great things. Um, there's too much to mention just in this. So we could talk offline if you really want a, a whole list of <laughs> recommendations of the ones that I, I know of. And, and again, there's a, probably a whole lot more that I don't even know of. Um, this is a, a well-studied topic. It's just not a well-demonstrated topic. So now we're getting to the point where we're demonstrating. Thank you so much, Laura. What a great discussion as always. Appreciate Thank your time. Thank you for having me. All right, our next speaker is Austin Link of Starfish. So we've had a mix of overarching topics and now we're gonna get into a specific company doing specific things. Uh, and this is one of our early stagers. Austin is co-founder of Starfish Space where he's giving life to on-orbit services. Originally from Iowa, he went to Stanford for BS in physics and later Purdue for an MS in aerospace engineering. In the aerospace engineering, Austin has worked at Lockheed Martin on THAAD and at Blue Origin on a variety of launch vehicles and engines. His particular focus has been on space system architecture, modeling, and operating under uncertainty, all tools that are being applied at Starfish Space. Austin, the screen is yours. Thank you, Lee. Thank you for having me. Um, the first question, I have a couple of slides to show sure is, is, is visual backgrounds here. Is that a good thing for me to pull up? Yes, that would be great. And I'll let you know when we can see them. Ooh, um, am I limited in my ability to share my screen right now? Um, you oh, shouldn't no, I'm not. be. You shouldn't here. be. Okay. Lee, can you see my screen? They look, the slides look great. 
Well, you only see the first one. We'll see how. That well, goes. true, true. <laughs> they could go downhill from here. <laughs> they sure could. <laughs> uh, um, all right. Well, uh, so thank you for that introduction, Lee. Um, I'm yeah, Austin Link. I'm a co-founder at an early stage startup called Starfish Space, and one of the things that we're working to do here, which is notable and makes us relevant today, is that we believe there's a business case for removing space debris. And I'll kind of walk you through a little of, of my background, of Starfish's background, and a little bit of why we think that, that this is a problem that can be at least in part solved by businesses. Um, and, and I'll also say that for anybody, as you have questions, as you have thoughts, as we go here, uh, please go at it. Happy to answer along the way and, and have a conversation along the way. So just a little of the overview, and I know Lee gave some intro. Um, I'm Austin. I, uh, some of my journey, I originally from Iowa, kind of crisscrossed the country, going to various schools, study physics, aerospace engineering, um, worked at Lockheed for a little while. And then before Starfish, I was at Blue Origin, uh, which, was, which was really tremendous and a lot of amazing engineers to work with. Um, and that's where I met my co-founder, Trevor. Uh, and despite all the exciting things we got to work on at Blue, we said, boy, we think satellite servicing and space tugs for satellite servicing is really interesting. And so we decided to set off on our own and start Starfish. Uh, and just to give a little bit of background and maybe inform my perspective or, or why we set out to do things here, my, my background is generally on sort of the physics modeling, the simulation, the architecture for space systems, and then Lee, as you mentioned, working under uncertainty, I have kind of a statistics background, which will explain some, some slides here. <laughs> um, so for us, we're Starfish Space. Uh, we founded in October of 2019. It turns out to be a heck of a time to start a, start a company, but uh, I'm, I'm enjoying, I'm actually in Washington, D.C. right now because I'm going to uh, satellite for, for part of the week here. Uh, and it's a weird full circle because the previous satellite in March of 2020 was Trevor and I handing out our shiny new business cards to people saying, look, here we are, we're a business. Um, we still got a long ways to go, but we're not quite in the same stage of the two of us working out of the library anymore. Uh, some of the background, so, so we're early stage startup. We're based out of Kent, Washington. Uh, we are building the Otter Space Tug, and we're really broadly targeted at two missions on the commercial sense that we think we can provide value in. One of these is the life extension of geostationary spacecraft. So think Northrop Grumman a mission extension vehicle. And then the other area is the disposal of satellites at the end of their life. Uh, this is a market that Northern Sky Research projects is four and a half billion dollars through the next uh, five or so years here. Um, and as we develop our approach and, and recognize that we're at an early stage, a big focus for us early on is our rendezvous proximity operations and docking software, which is currently on orbit. So we're going to get to run a, a couple of little tests soon to help build some of the reliability into the system. And as you think about a, a company that attaches to various objects on space and disposes of them or relocates them to new orbits or whatever it may be, um, the ability to safely and reliably do that document is super important to how we operate as a company. That if we go up and we smash into somebody's solar panel, that's very counterproductive for the reason why we're there in the first place. Um, and then an exciting milestone for us recently to just give a sense of, of where we're at is a couple of weeks ago, we were selected as winners of Space Force Pitch Day, which was a, a great milestone for a great team. And we're excited for the potential for the next steps here. So I mentioned one of the two areas, at least commercially, which we're focusing is, is the disposal of satellites at the end of their life. Um, and that's really all about space debris. And, and you'll hear from a lot of folks who probably know more about it than me over the course of these couple of days. Um, but to, to kind of give the super high level overview and maybe a couple of key pieces in how we think about it, um, you know, the reason that debris is really a problem is because this is potentially a threat to the things that we have on orbit, whether it's valuable satellites, whether it's valuable astronauts. We don't want 
junk floating around and, and, and threatening them. Uh, and there are several of types of debris from the decades of operation in orbit. And so functioning satellites and non-functioning satellites are one that are particularly relevant to us. There's also a series of old rocket bodies. There's also small pieces of objects that have broken up or, or um, in some way sort of been discarded in orbit. As we think about the business case, we think the business case really is, is around satellites as we see it right now. Um, and, and we don't see, I don't know who's going to pay us to remove the, the second stage of some rocket from the 1970s. And the nature of doing this as a business is you need somebody to pay you to, for the value you're creating. Um, part of the longer term view of the challenges of debris, and one of the things that we think is important is that you know, collisions between large objects can create many smaller objects which themselves cause threats. And so we think a, a key thing to be limiting the, the danger of space debris is to remove some of the early stage objects so that you don't get the, the thousands of, of smaller objects that have that long-term potential for something like the Kessler syndrome chain reaction. And the final thing to highlight here is we go out and talk to people and and try to persuade them this is a problem really worth solving. A question that comes up often is, well, isn't space really big? Why is it a problem if I have my satellite floating around? You know, imagine if I had it floating around on the surface of Earth, what are the, what are the odds that somebody just randomly drives their car into this satellite? Uh, and, and that's an important thing to think about that if you're, if you're going to be solving a problem, there are the, the pros have to be worth the cons to going and tackling the problem. And, and one of the things that we try to do as a company is go, well, let's bring the cost down as we can so that the, the cons of trying to solve the problem are less here. And then, and then we also think that now is a time where there's starting to be particular value in really taking action to limit or dispose of, of satellites or space debris. And there's kind of two reasons why we think that now is a time that it's really important to start tackling this problem. And so one of these is that although space is itself really, really big, there are a couple of specific orbits that satellites tend to cluster in because those are the most valuable orbits. And, and sometimes it's geostationary orbit because there you can, you can be over the same spot on Earth. You can really concentrate where do you want your throughput to be. And sometimes it's going to be low Earth orbit because you want that lower latency or you want the ease of getting to orbit. And, and the picture on the left here is sort of the yellow zones is marked out as the useful areas. And outside of that, the graveyard orbits, we treat as effectively empty and worthless for the most part. And you can dispose of your satellite there and just leave it be there. Um, this makes it challenging as more and more satellites go up because everybody wants to be in the most desirable orbits. Uh, and, and this is something that is particularly relevant as more and more satellites go up. And, and this chart I have on the left is a little old. I saw a number yesterday at the conference saying that 10% of all satellites ever launched were launched last year. And we're going to beat that again this year. Uh, and you know, with the rise of the mega constellations, it's a tremendous chance for these constellations to provide value on, on Earth. You know, think about affordable connectivity for people all over the surface of the globe that's that's uh, incredible access incredibly empowering for these people um, but at the same time it does have the trade-offs and so figuring out how do we manage these satellites and make sure that we can maintain these valuable orbits and maintain this infrastructure on orbit is super important and all of that is why we think now there's potentially a business case to be removing space debris. And, and as many folks often call this, they call this active debris removal. Um, and one of the ways to sort of address space debris and objects that are up there, you know, you can do the management, you can ensure that people are trying to dispose of their satellites, but that's not always going to work. And sometimes it's worth it to go grab an old satellite, drag it down into the upper atmosphere or potentially to a graveyard orbit so that it's out of the way of uh, the infrastructure that, that we're building up there. But there's a great question to this, which is even if you can do active debris removal, which at the moment nobody has done, uh, who would pay for it? If you're a business, you need somebody to give you money for this. 
And what we believe at Starfish Space is that businesses that operate satellites benefit economically from using a space tug service and paying a space tug service provider to dispose of their satellites. And we think that this is really as a supplemental space tug. So you'll try to deorbit your satellites. 90% of them might succeed in that. 90% would be a really good track record for how people do right now, but people get better at it. Um, and then having a supplemental space tug to come clean up the rest and ensure that your orbit, that you're deploying the infrastructure at the core of your business, ensure that that orbit is a safe place for you to continue to operate your infrastructure. Um, and I have my little asterisk here because it's worth highlighting that that this solves a, that this is a solution to help a portion of the space debris problem. Um, but there are many aspects of it that aren't helped by this hypothesis and by this business case as we see it. So this is where the statistics come in. And I have too many sigmas and normal distributions on this chart, but bear with me for a second. Uh, this is my attempt to try to illustrate why we believe that it's worth it for somebody to use a, a supplemental space tug, why that's a positive economic thing for their business. And really at the core of it is we see when there's a supplemental space tug, it's, it's uh, sort of an independent assurance and it allows you to operate with a little more risk with your satellite. So if you think, boy, there is a small chance that things might start failing, whether that's our reaction wheels, our communication, our propulsion, five years into a satellite lifetime, and you don't have somebody to help support the disposal, if you're trying to move all your satellites, if you're trying to clear your orbit for your next generation constellation to safely operate, then, then you really have to start ending these satellites life at the negative three signal or at the first sign that anything might go wrong. If you're willing to take a chance, if you're able to say, well, let's operate to a point where vast majority of our satellites can still dispose of themselves, but some of them we need the outer space tug to come clear it up, you can get a lot more lifetime because in the early years of that sort of normal distribution of end of life, there's not going to be that many satellites that fail. And so in this example, we sort of walk through, well, if you have a hundred satellite constellation and I assume five-year design life with a one-year standard deviation on that lifetime end, if you take a chance and let just 5% of your satellites fail, as sort of an expected value, you'll get almost a year and a half of extra life from all of the rest of your satellites. And that ends up being 125 or so extra satellite years of operation. And the cost is really just five satellite disposals, which will depend heavily on your orbit, but, but around $25 million or so. Excuse me, I got a sneeze sitting on me here. This is going to happen in any second. Uh, but we'll try to continue. Uh, and so broadly, our case is, well, for a lot of satellites, unless you're operating a CubeSat, if you can get 125 extra satellite years, for just $25 million, that's a really good return on your investment, basically. And so there's, there's value as a business to being able to get that extra value for really limited extra expenses. And that happens by taking a chance during that early time in life. And this is a, a problem that everybody's going to have to deal with, especially if you're a mega constellation, somebody with 100 plus satellites up there, because if you don't dispose of these satellites, if you leave them up there, you're, you're really jeopardizing the assets that you have in orbit. And, and, and this is not us saying this in a vacuum, right? This is something that satellite operators are telling us during discussions with them. Austin, I wanna interrupt just a minute when we have a question in chat. And I also just, this is uh, one aspect of the business that I haven't heard talked about as much, which is the design not just to be capturable or to include a piece of equipment that would be used later, but just to accept more risk. That's something that that's talked about in human space exploration. Um, and to have this introduced in the discussion on satellites so that you're beginning the problem solving problem much sooner in the, the manufacturing process and the, the whole life cycle is really fascinating. Um, we have a question, what's the base price that you are using here to obtain that 25 million? So in, in this particular example, I say, hey, here's 
five satellites need to disposal and, and I estimate about $25 million. And so that would be $5 million for a satellite disposal. The, the thing to highlight is that it, it, the sort of resources that we have to expend to do this depend a lot on the particular satellite. And if you have somebody that's already in a pretty low orbit, or if you have a satellite that's relatively low mass, that's a lot less propellant, that's a lot less time thrusting and lifetime. And, and that's a gonna be a lower cost. And if you have, you know, if we're trying to go take the Hubble up to a graveyard orbit, well, unfortunately that's gonna take more than $5 million. That's a, that's a, a, a big beefy satellite and that's challenging for us to do. Um, and so there's a, a wide range of kind of where price points end up, but, but for this example, and I think something that's relatively reasonable for a lot of satellite constellations, we have floated out this $5 million per disposal number. Um, and, and, and Lee, I'll also highlight, you, know, you talk about the, the, the framing of this as risk, a parallel that we often like to draw, it, it's similar in, in the world and the way that we experience our life is you take the same risk to a certain degree with your car. And, and I can highlight this as somebody who has started his own company and therefore has an 18 year old car at the moment. And, and when I drive my car around, I accept, and this actually happened like three weeks ago. And so it's very relevant. Sometimes the engine might go out, but I only have one car on my engine. I only have one engine in my car. And, and, and I take that risk because I know there's tow trucks. And I know that <laughs> if my car you know, barely gets me to the work parking lot and isn't able to get to the car repair station, which happened, um, that's okay. There's a tow truck that can come and get me. And overall, that's gonna be much more affordable for me than trying to buy a car that has a backup engine on board than trying to drive around the mass of two engines for 18 years along the way. Uh, and that's, that's especially when you don't have humans involved, taking that risk is a, a more mathematical calculation. Uh, and, and oftentimes it's worth it to, to take some risk, to take a calculated risk. Uh, and, and I think in many ways, some folks are almost doing that already but there's just not a supplemental space tug to help you really solve the problem. Yeah, fantastic insight. Really, really great analogy as well. Sometimes the battle of, of communicating an idea is in finding a great analogy and you've done it. Um, and so I'll, I'll just highlight quickly, we talk about the business case here and why somebody might do this and why we think that there is value for a company paying for the space debris removal. And that's all for us why we're developing our Otter space tug here. Um, and this is uh, a small spacecraft that is able to uh, attach to and manipulate satellites on orbit. Um, and that means that it's very capable of doing the space debris removal mission. Now, we've got a long way to go and it's important as an early stage startup to always highlight that, that you're not gonna see the news story saying, hey, we launched and did this next month. Um, but we think that there's an exciting path to, to, to go. And as, as maybe I'm overly apt to do, I'll frame it as a risk. And we think this is really a risk worth taking that we think if we are successful in developing this system, successful in developing the business case, then we think that this is a really effective way to try to address the problem of space debris and to try to say, well, how do we preserve our our orbits for operation in the future to continue to provide value to humans on earth and, and eventually off earth. Um, and, and we also think that these same sort of technologies to be able to interact with satellites on orbit really set the table for a lot of exciting capabilities in the future. And then someday, and, and maybe I reveal my blue origin heritage here someday when everybody has their own needle cylinders and we're assembling them and we're maintaining them that uh, I think a large part of that is going to be something that looks like an otter space tug and is really contributing to that off-world economy. Um, and a lot of that starts today with, well, let's go try to make space more sustainable and, and ensure that we continue to operate and address the challenges of space debris. So I have my little overview here. I don't know if you need this, but really the, the 
rapid increase of new satellites uh, has brought us to think that space debris is really a problem that is not just a nuisance, not just you have to do you know, dodge occasionally, not just it makes good Sandra Bullock movie, but really a problem that, that we need to solve as we're deploying this trillion dollar infrastructure on orbit. And so for us, we think that the disposal of satellites is something people want to do to make their orbits clear, and that a supplemental space tug like our Otter Space Tug is the best way to do that and, and worth pursuing as a business. And so with that, uh, Thanks everybody for being here. Thanks everybody for listening. And let me know any questions you have, any thoughts that you have. We do have a, a question or a comment and it's from Michael Maloney, but it sounds a little bit more like Michael Mealing, our resident um, naysayer and uh, reality checker. Uh, he says, based on NASA's Orbital Debris Office recent statements, they believe we can wait decades to start ADR. What are your thoughts on that? Well, maybe, obviously, I don't believe that. <laughs> um, I think that what, what really changes this perspective and to me maybe makes some of the decades-long assumptions a little out of date is the rise of the mega constellation, the idea that you might be putting a mm -hmm. hundred or a thousand or tens of thousands of satellites in an orbit. Um, and that number one changes the math as you look at the risk environment on, on orbit and you start to say, well, there's a lot more objects up there to potentially be colliding with and a lot more objects up there that could potentially be colliding into you. Um, and to us that, that I believe that that really changes the environment and the risk posture. Um, and then the other thing is, as you deploy these satellites, when you deploy them in, in an orbit, you make that orbit considerably more valuable. And so maybe broadly, if you do the integral of the areas in which humans operate in space, sort of integrating the, the low Earth orbit to geo, then, then broadly over that range, there will be orbits for which active debris removal is, is not worth it. Um, mm -hmm but we think there are orbits where it is worth it and, and where it's rapidly becoming more worth it. Is IP a reason for satellite companies to become customers of Starfish Space? Is IP as in intellectual property? Yes, so individual companies own specific technologies that are used in their satellites, uh, especially perhaps um, military stuff, but, you know, I said companies, satellite companies, and that's a little different, but um, is making sure it's disposed of properly the best way to protect IP? I think that there are cases for which you could, you could argue that, right, where for some reason you have something that you don't want other folks to be able to come inspect at some point, um, or you have something that you want to really clearly maintain your ownership over. Um, and in, in that case, that's the sort of service that something like the Outer Space Tug could provide. Um, I think, as maybe you touched on, Lee, that's likely more of a military application or a government application and maybe less likely to be a commercial space operator application, at least as sort of we envision it in the short term, but potentially at some point it, it, it might become more of a challenge. Yeah, and any legal developments in this conversation are beneficial to your business. So anybody who starts requiring things to be done a certain way, um, you know, maintaining carrying capacity, you know, in my kids, if they get a new toy, they have to get rid of an old toy. Um, and if we start putting rules in place like that, it just uh, enhances the opportunity to, to start making a difference there. Um, as well as oil and gas wells, you know, they, they've all solved this problem with uh, liability for plugging and abandoning oil wells. Um, talk for a minute, we just have a few minutes left. Talk for a minute about your partnership with your founders, moving from a big company to a small company, the relative strengths within your team, um, and entertain us with that. So it's a very unique feeling to have a nice job, live a nice life, 
leave your job, convince your co-founder to leave your job. We both convinced each other. Sit there in the library in Renton, Washington and go, okay, well, here it is. We did it. Like we're going to start a company. What the heck do we do now? Uh, and you know, we'd spent several months in the planning process and, and this is not something that you want to go into blindly, but we also, to, we didn't feel that it was, we didn't feel that it would have been right to Blue Origin to dive in too much to things ahead of time to really be trying to run the company while we were working for another company. Um, and that's really sort of a unique feeling. And I, I, I think one of the things, even at this stage, we're very fortunate and we've had a lot of fortunate things happen to us. And one of the things that is, is worth highlighting is the fortune that I have to be able to work with my co-founder, Trevor. Um, and he is you know, not just a co-founder and, and not just a former co-worker, but somebody who's really been a friend of mine before this process and very much so throughout this process. And that's important because there's a lot of tough conversations that you always have to have together. Um, and, and those conversations range broadly. And there are days in which you're feeling wonderful and, and super optimistic and like you just have the, the best path forward. And there are days when you hear back, you didn't win this proposal or you, you realize, man, I did this pitch really, really poorly. And there are days that you just feel terrible about it in the process. Um, but I think one of the things that stands out is how exciting that you get to try. And, you know, broadly, many of us are fortunate to be able to work in the space industry. And there's a, a lot of joy that we get to experience by seeing, um, imagining the boundaries that we can push for humans and imagining the future that we can help create. Uh, and that is really tremendously exciting. And I think why a lot of us got into the space industry in the first place. And in a startup world, you have a unique lever arm to do this. Um, and so all of the highs are magnified and all of the lows are magnified. Um, but we really, it's great to be going through it with a great team and, you know, several of the folks who've joined us so far are, are great partners to have along the way. And, and, and several of whom were, were already pre-existing friends also the nature of being in the aerospace industry a while. Um, and we've got a lot to learn and we've got a lot to develop and we're going to be starting to take steps here where no longer it's all engineers working full time. We're going to have to have uh, a team with a more diverse skill set. Um, and it's going to be an exciting journey to take. And, and I think that we'll enjoy it along the way. And uh, we'll, we'll, hope that, we'll hope that it works out. But who knows, maybe everybody will conclude in the end that it's several decades before we need to do active debris removal. And then, it, it, then we'll see how that works out for us. <laughs> Austin, thank you so much for sharing your story and telling us more about Starfish Space. Uh, it's great to hear from an Iowa boy who's decided to name everything after sea creatures. You know, <laughs> uh, I is actually from, I'm from Coralville, Iowa, where Iowa used to be an inland ocean like 400 million years ago, and there are coral fossils all over the place. Very nice. I'll have to come, come uh, do a little hunting there myself. <laughs> Well, you'll be glad to know that our next speaker, when he first presented, um, was was very early on in his, in the U.S. iteration of his company, and has since gotten all kinds of advancements and excitement that I can't wait to hear about today. Um, so, thanks again, Austin. Thank you, Lee. Good luck, Gary. <laughs> Gary Calman from Cis Lunar Industries. He's the co-founder and CEO. Uh, Cislunar Industries is a space technology startup focused on developing, building, and operating metal foundries in space. <clears throat> in this role, Gary is applying his diverse background in entrepreneurship, capital markets, and corporate finance to building a key component of the emerging Cislunar industrial economy. 
with a BA in Economics from the University of Colorado and a charter from the CFA Institute, Gary took action with his lifelong passion for space by completing the ISU Space Studies program in 2017 and now strives to help lay the foundation for a sustainable human presence beyond Earth. Welcome back, Gary. Thanks, Lee. Hey, Michael. <laughs> um, all right, let's see. So I'll share my screen here. Okay. So I can do this in presentation mode. Mm -hmm. All right, we're seeing your slides, but not yet in presentation mode. And there Good. we are. Or at least the one, like uh, Austin. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the goal is to have one, right? <laughs> yeah. Let <laughs> me just uh, this you set up here. Okay. Cool. All right, great. Well, thanks for inviting me back uh, to speak at this event. It's always fun to participate in these. Um, and obviously, this this topic is, <laughs> you know, near and dear to our hearts. Uh, it's sort of where we're starting with our grand grand uh, vision. But you know, as you heard, I'm Gary Cannon. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Syslinger Industries. Um, you know, I'll, I I want to tell you guys about. Uh, for those of you who don't know about Syslinger Industries, I'll give you sort of an overview of the company and our vision, where we think things are, where we want to head, um, our path to get there, which, you know, starts with space debris recycling. And, uh, and then an update, as, as you heard, on some of the tangible progress we've made building uh, our first prototype of this uh, microspace boundary concept here in, in the lab in Colorado. <laughs> so, you know, our, our our larger goal, our grand vision, if you will, um, you know, we, we, we see in our view that we're at the beginning of a new industrial revolution that we think is actually now starting to emerge in space with in space manufacturing and ISRU technologies, uh, you know, and a lot, whole host of things that are sort of the what you need to have uh, an industrial economy are, are now actually happening. Um, and this development that we're seeing is, is what we believe will enable humanity to expand beyond Earth um, and, and settle the solar system in a sustainable way. And if we do this right, you know, we think that this will allow uh, humanity to move into you know, an abundant future with truly unlimited possibilities. I mean, we're, we're a definitely optimists uh, when it comes to what's possible with, with us you know, expanding out into space. Um, and, we, you know, this this sort of industrial economy that's developing is is going to need uh, metal materials, just as any industrial economy throughout human history has has needed. Um, and those materials also require processing. And so, what Cisner Industries has been created to do is to develop those technologies for processing those materials, and then we want to be able to provide those materials to our customers, really wherever they are in the solar system uh, at some point. Um, and and interestingly, recycling space debris actually provides us a, a, a tangible path to, to achieve these, these goals um, by, while also addressing this near-term challenge of creating a sustainable space environment. So for us, the micro space foundry is what will make this possible. Um, you know, to, to achieve this goal, we're developing this technology we call this a microspace foundry. It's a small scale, uh, modular, distributed metal processing capability. Um, it's, it's low cost. And you know, the, the goal of it is to be able to make just standardized uh, metal rods. As you can see in these images, we're giving there's a little rendering of, of how the, the system that would go you know, onto a spacecraft might, might look, the core piece of it. Um, it's about a meter or so in length in this configuration. On one end, we have, you know, you would have uh, materials feeding in from one side of, of uh, uh, the, the device. They're processed with a electromagnetic um, induction and levitation technologies, which are building upon work that's been done for decades on the space station and the shuttle um, for, for material science. And we want to take that technology and sort of scale it up um, for, for commercial and production capabilities. It feeds that the materials processed with those methods into a mold. 
um, eventually will be contactless kind of development, moves the, the materials through the rods that are made to the other side of the, of the device. And um, on the end of the device, we have two Newman thrusters, uh, which are a metal-based propulsion system, electric, electric propulsion system that uses pulse plasma um, thruster technology and uses metal propellant, really any conductive material. But you know, ideal, for us, conveniently, it can use um, metal that's like we could find from space debris, like aluminum or titanium or steel. So um, it's shown here as well in relation to an Esper ring, if you're familiar with what an Esper ring is, to give some idea of scale. But um, that, that, that's kind of how, it, how it's configured. And what this enables us to do is, <clears throat> is to, is to uh, do an enhanced debris removal, enables us to do debris recycling. And it's really the, the key technology that allows us to develop the capability for transforming space debris uh, into a resource. Let's see. So starting point for this, um, there's a path we follow here that we think is, is very achievable and addresses near-term needs. You know, the, I posed a question here of, well, what if the debris was the gas station for the space tugs, like what Austin is developing um, with Starfish and, and, and Astroscale is developing with their, with their devices? What if you could use the space debris itself to refuel your spacecraft? Well, this enables a couple of interesting possibilities. Um, you know, right now on the left side, you would see a situation where a, a in the standard configuration using traditional propellants, you know, a, a uh, a debris removal spacecraft is nearly out of propellant. It needs to either deorbit at this point with the last piece of debris, or it needs to find a, a, a depot to refuel at. And you may not be in an orbit that's convenient to get to a depot. So this may not be you know, feasible at that point. Um, with the microspace founder, you could actually add that device to the spacecraft. And then that would enable the, the system to harvest materials from that piece of debris. That debris is then fed into the microspace foundry device, which creates propellant rods. And if you have a Newman thruster on board uh, to do the bulk of your propulsion, you can refuel the whole system and, uh, and, and get enough propellant from just a fraction of, of the mass of the debris object to deorbit that object and get to the next one. And this removes the, pro the propellant capacity as a limiting factor in the duration of your mission. Um, and, and therefore, if you can you know, do instead of three or five missions before you run out of propellant, if you could do 50, well, now your cost per mission goes down dramatically. Um, it makes this, you know, the, the debris removal case much more achievable, easier to close for various uh, potential customers um, and potentially could in increase the profits of the debris removal company. And so that's, that's, a, that's the initial case, right? Still deorbiting things to, to Earth and going back into the atmosphere, but doing it in a way that is maybe an order of magnitude, lower cost <clears throat> in a permission basis. If we take that, and, and this, this, this kind of, this idea here is, is illustrated in sort of a concept of operations where you can see and what we did here is we did a case study on um, uh, the sun synchronous orbits and, and some of the, the old uh, American owned upper stages that were um, still up there. And we looked at, you know, how much could we remove with this kind of configuration I just described. Um, and it sort of describes how that would work. You can launch that, that to capture that first piece of debris process, really only two to 10% of the mass of that object into propellant allows you to then deorbit that object, drift to the right in the next uh, position in, in the orbit, and then raise that orbit to get the next object. And you can do this really from any altitude in LEO with that amount of propellant. In the sun synchronous orbit case study, we found that um, based on our calculations anyway, that one spacecraft with the you know, proper amount of, of power could deorbit four to five of these upper stages per year. And uh, you know, there's, been, there's been research done that shows that upper stages are some of the most dangerous um, objects out there for, for uh, the debris situation and you know, creating more debris. Um, and so removing them helps to you know, bend the curve, as, as more of us said earlier, in favor of a more sustainable environment. So taking that one step further, instead of deorbiting those objects, because really we, we don't want to have to throw those objects back into the Earth's atmosphere, and you can only do that in LEO anyway, um, we, we see a potential for, instead of doing that, 
we have a whole recycling ecosystem where we, we position our microspace boundaries on a platform. Um, this could be something like what you know, Nanorax is developing with their Outpost program, for example. Um, and, and that platform would be able to host those microspace boundaries and serve as a place where you know, the, the debris removal spacecraft wouldn't have to carry the space boundary on board anymore. But they, if, as long as they use the metal-based propellant, they could go out, grab space debris, bring it back to the platform. The microspace foundry is processing that debris and, uh, and they could be refueled there to go out and get the next one. This, you know, configured in, in the right way with the platform in the right location, this could, you know, require less propellant um, than deorbiting. So it makes it a more efficient operation. And then it creates materials could, that could then be further delivered to other customers or could be supplied to customers on the same platform for an in-space manufacturing uh, operation. So it sort of helps to build that ecosystem and that supply chain turning debris into an actual resource and not just the hazard. And if you take this to the, the, the next level for us, you know, where we see this headed is, is a whole ecosystem where we have micro space foundries in this distributed con con configuration where they're on, you know, propellant or uh, debris removal spacecraft. They're on the moon processing uh, lunar regolith and aluminum and uh, other metals that are extracted from lunar regolith. They're out at the asteroid belt helping, you know, those spacecraft get back from the asteroid belt. And they can, all those sources could be supplied. And even from the earth, you could supply materials, bulk materials to a platform where the micro space foundry could um, in a you know multiple configuration could process those materials, build large structures even, um, and create those those materials for other in space manufacturing concepts um, that could eventually help us build large you know structures like space based solar power, large antennas, and you know a whole variety of things people are considering. So that that kind of takes me to the the next. So that's sort of the background on the company, right? That's where we're headed. That's where we want to go with this. That's where we see the potential for this as a bridge to get us to this full-scale metal processing economy. Um, a little update on where we are today. We, thanks to NASA and uh, and our partners at Colorado School of Mines and our early investors, we have been able to make rapid progress over the last three months um, in building our prototype of the microspace boundary. Um, and, and testing it in a couple of unique environments. So on the left, you see, and I'll show you a couple of quick videos um, kind of describing what this looks like so you, so you can see it in action. But on the left, we have uh, an electromagnetic levitation coil with uh, this using induction to heat up that metal in the middle, which is aluminum, non-magnetic metal, right? But you can induce a magnetic field in it and cause it to levitate against, even against gravity. Um, and so that's what's happening on the picture on the left. This was done in our, lo our lab in Fort Collins. Um, and then we moved that device to the School of Mines, who've been amazing partners from the beginning of this concept, um, and have really, you know, they're part of our SBIR right now, um, and we have a number of professors who are helping us with this, but we've been able to use their Space Resources Lab to see how this system on the left works in the vacuum environment. And, you know, if you're familiar with, uh, if anybody's familiar with the vacuum environment versus non-vacuum, there are a bunch of interesting things that happen and we'll be sort of reporting on the results of that research here in the next couple of months as we wrap up our, our SBIR. But it, let, needless to say, it's been interesting to see, <laughs> to see what happens when you take the concept on the left and try to put it into a vacuum chamber. Um, challenges, but none of them are beyond, you know, overcoming, so <laughs> I'll just say that. But uh, so here's a little video on this first one on the left that where you know, it's exactly that same thing, but sort of seeing that in action. I'll show you. This was the first time we were able to show this contactless processing um, from the beginning to end for us. Like and I'll kind of explain it as we go. So what we have here is a, uh, a ribbon being fed and this is an aluminum ribbon. I um, mean, the back, you see our power electronics that were custom built by our team. Um, and you know this this setup to kind of hold the the processing coil, and in this this ribbon is being fed into the magnetic um, you know induction zone, if you will. So what happens is you'll see it starts to melt pretty pretty rapidly. It's sped up two times, but it's it's a pretty rapid process. Um, and you can see that the the ball the ball of molten metal is being lifted up by that coil, right? It holds an interesting shape because there's an oxide layer on the outside of this material that kind of keep it doesn't really melt and it keeps it in that shape. And here we're able to pull that ribbon out away from the ball and allow it to, to levitate all by itself. So we're feeding it in and pulling it out. Then we decided to see, well, what if we added more material while it was in place? And as you watch that, 
you can see how stable it is. You know, we're pushing on it with this ribbon. It's computer controlled, by the way, but we're pushing on it with this ribbon and it just stays right in position. It kind of rolls around a little bit, but, but it's, it's held there pretty strongly. Um, and, you know, we're adding material to it, basically doubling the sample uh, size. And we just wanted to see if we could do that. Um, and you know, it turns out we can. Um, so this could be an interesting way to feed material into a refining chamber in orbit at where you're controlling it with the so that levitation uh, forces. And then we, you know, we'll, in a second here, we'll pull that ribbon back out again. And it's, you know, the ball stays in place. It's kind of held down by this top coil, which is pushing down on it. And the bottom coil is pushing up. And, uh, and you can sort of see how it stays there and, and levitates and jiggles around. So it's kind of fun. So that's contactless processing. Um, certainly the most sort of wow factor one. The next one I want to show you is uh, what we learned about, we're starting to look into, uh, that's wrong. let's see if I can go to the next slide here. Okay, uh, so this is, this one is meant to show magnetic manipulation. We also, you know, cast some sample or prototype rods, if you will, because um, we're going to send those rods down to, to Newman Space in Australia and have them test them in their thruster stand to show that they actually make, you know, the propulsion characteristics that we, all are, have theorized are there. Um, so we're casting these rods, but one thing we did with in, in no, noticing this, and you know, casting it with uh, induction is nothing new. That's been done many times before, but what we're looking at here is not so much can we cast aluminum? I mean, that, anybody, certainly that's doable, right? Um, but we wanted to see, well, what happens with the field here? And what you can see here is that you know, this pulls away um, but instead of that layer going flat, it's held in place. And then it goes flat because we turn the coil off. So the magnetic field is actually pushing that material together and forcing it up into that shape. Um, and, and that's, you know, we see that leading to a future where we can use this magnetic manipulation to control the shape of the melt in a contactless way, eventually, where we may not even need the crucible to do sort of rough shapes um, in orbit if we have the right configuration of, of electromagnetic coils. And we have experts at the School of Mines that we work with, Andrew Petruska in particular is an expert in um, a magnetic uh, manipulation. And, you know, he, we're working on projects to see about how could we do this, you know, in microgravity, especially um, without any contact at all. So that's sort of a down in the future thing, but this was leading us to that idea of how can we adjust, you know, the, the power in the system and the frequency to you know, gradually change the shape as you watch that kind of changing. So that's the two little videos I have for uh, some of the progress we're making. Um, here's a couple pictures of the rods that were cast. We have this one on the left. This was cast in the open air, I think. And we we took we wanted to see what it looked like on the inside because on the outside it's kind of rough um, looking. There's this ugly layer and everything, but. When you cut, we thought, you know, when we looked at this, we thought, well, there might be some voids or some holes or whatever. But when we cut them open, we found that they, they appear to be pretty homogenous. Now, this isn't cut all the way through, right? We're just trying to see what it looks like inside. But it was much more uniform than we originally expected. We thought there would be layers of, you know, oxide kind of mixed in and everything. But, but it really looks pretty good. Um, now, this is just visual. We're sending this off for proper metallurgical analysis. So we'll find out what kind of and the hole in the center is there to sort of simulate what a Newman thruster rod would look like. And those, so last, lastly, from, from here, where we're headed, just to give you an idea of the timelines, uh, and we think this is perfectly feasible. Um, we're doing our bench prototype right now at School of Mines. You saw that we just wrapped up our, our vacuum testing. We have another version of this that uh, you know, we'll be scaling up to show a fully automated rod making system, which we hope to demonstrate in October. Then we want to take that same system and test it in, in, uh, in a parabolic flight to show that it works the same way when you don't have gravity. So this is testing the mechanics of moving things around in, uh, you know, 20 seconds or so of, of zero G. And then to really understand, you know, the metallurgy piece of it and what are we making, we want to take it to the ISS and do a demonstration and be able to bring those materials back, do a full analysis so we know what kind of materials we can make with this method um, on orbit, you know, in a large scale. It would then point to certain manufacturing techniques that can use that material. Uh, and then we want to go to a lunar demo in 2024 to sort of lunar qualify uh, a lunar space boundary. Um, and, and that eventually, you know, after that, and we see sometime around 2025 being able to deploy these systems commercially, the first version of the systems um, with companies that can use them. So that that is uh, 
we're in charge of the submitting people thing. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, that, that's where we are headed with, with our roadmap. And with that, I will leave it to a, you know some few minutes left over for questions. So uh, that, that's it. Thank you. Well, I really am excited about uh, the progress you've made, Gary, since the very first time you presented here and the slides have evolved uh, in quality as well. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about the fact that you talk about the value of the objects that are in space. I mean, I think there's a lot of discussion about deorbiting, shoving them up into another location. Um, but, you know, I could see us really regretting down the line if we don't utilize what we've already spent a lot of money to put up there. Indeed. Um, there, there are a ton of comments, so I'm going to give priority to, to those. Um, uh, David Chevron has experience with the electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic levitation devices um, from way back before the ISS. Um, Austin would like to use your rods for, for reading. <laughs> um, and Rob Cranston would like to know if you were awarded a phase two SBIR and that they have a partnership with School of Mines as well. Cool. Yeah. The, the, well, we'll see about the phase two. We're we're um, we're in the last. I think we're in month four of our project. So it wraps in. Uh, it's due. The final one is due November nineteenth. So we'll you know fingers crossed. <laughs> also looking at the potential for um, you know working with the space force and and seeing if uh, you know if there's an opportunity to do a direct phase two with them as well for different aspects of it. You can do you know both hopefully so. There's definitely plenty of opportunities. I found that the, it seems like the, the Space Force in particular and NASA are both getting, you know, this this whole idea of like recycling metal in space has become something that they're very interested in. Um, and the, the debris problem also something they're interested in. And so we, we can touch a lot of bases here with this concept from using it as propellant to manufacturing and dealing with the space debris problem in a more sustainable fashion, trying to make it something that's, you know, more profitable for companies to do, not just for removing, but also on the back end as well. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you talked about two to ten percent of a satellite being useful to you uh, in this process. Michael Maloney asks, how critical to successful recycling is understanding the materials used to make the satellites and how they are constructed? I mean, it's it's definitely important, right? We we want to be able to develop a system to be flexible. Um, you know, we. NASA, when they put this SBIR out, they asked for aluminum, steel, and titanium. Mm -hmm. So we tried to put steel in the same exact system, and we found that it didn't have enough power to make it hot enough. So you know, we think it, that this same method can be used for a variety of metals, um, but we're going to need to develop a capability to adjust the power requirements and the frequencies and whatnot to make sure that that's possible. Uh, we think that you know things like using it as propellant you know, you might be able to have materials that are, you know, dirty, if you will, that might have some impurities and imperfections for that purpose. For, for manufacturing, 3D printing, you know, the purity becomes more of an issue. So we want to develop technologies for refining. And since we won't know exactly what this old debris is made of, we'll probably need some way of remotely assessing what's in there. And, and I know there are companies working on this kind of technology, so we'll be employing that stuff we don't want to invent things that other people are working on. We're, we're focused on the space foundry and we hope to partner with companies across the, the new, you know, the space economy who have those expertises that we need to bring in to create this, this whole ecosystem. Yeah, I, I think um, looking at it a little bit like Austin uh, talked about, how do we change the decision-making in manufacturing to benefit this process overall? And you may find that even though you want partners who are experts in that to do it, that it's beneficial for you to lobby for certain materials to be used more than others in the construction of new satellites. Because yep. when you talk about space junk, it's not just old space junk, there's new space junk too. Oh yeah, no, that, yeah, exactly. I mean, there's gonna be a lot more new space junk than there already is in orbit now. So um, yeah, that, that's a good point. And one of the things that you know people have pointed out will be a challenge is like, how do you pull the aluminum wire off of the skin of the, the aluminum, or the, sorry, the copper wiring off the aluminum skin and those sorts of things pulling, especially when you get to from a upper stage to a satellite, now you get really complex pieces and you talk about rocket motors as well, also complex. So designing you know systems that can be consumed I think would be, you know, as this evolves and we show that it's it's viable, 
there will be an incentive for companies to design them so that they can be broken down more easily. Uh, and I'm sure there are ways we can structure, you know, the revenue stream such that it, it makes sense for companies to do that. You know, maybe they they are able to save money on insurance because we they can enable recycling capability on our bed later and it removes that liability. And who knows? There's a, there's a lot of different structures that are out there for that people have floated. But yeah, well, I'm fascinated to learn about the the composition of the metal and its its mechanical properties uh, for both manufacturing and for propulsion uses. Just really, really fun stuff. Yeah. Um, have you tried, it's a question again from David, have you tried subcooling the liquid metal sample of aluminum to well below its me melting point? Our results at UF with nickel alloys and dropping mm. them are very interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm familiar with how they do that on the space station and, and in microgravity in particular, it's it's much easier as I understand to do the subcooling where you cool the liquid metal below its melting point or yeah, so that it, and it still doesn't solidify until you trigger that solidification. It's sort of fascinating. I think on, on Earth with gravity, there's my understanding is there's too much convection, but maybe I should talk to David some more about this and get his, his wisdom on this topic. But um, yeah, I mean, there, you know, really there's going to be the other opportunity that I didn't even mention is creating new alloys in, in space that you really can't make on Earth because we'll have this furnace capability. And there's a whole other avenue of, of business around, you know, refining these metals out and then recombining them in a way that, that creates something of different value or solidifying them in a way that creates bulk metallic glasses, for example, which have other interesting properties. So there's you know, a whole a, array of manufacturing capabilities that we think our system can enable. We're trying to stay with this you know, narrow focus of what can we do now mm -hmm. that has a, a potential market case um, that we can you know, use to support development to that future but there's a lot of possibilities here just a quick question about that the oxide layer you mentioned mm -hmm. did you, was that a chicken or the egg thing was it there because everything in space has that or was it no, i mean like if you have aluminum and you expose it to an atmosphere with oxygen it, it almost instantaneously forms an oxide layer yeah everything that was made it's in space now started on earth and it has an oxide layer either intentionally or unintentionally um so there's no avoiding that we did find not surprisingly since you know atmosphere creates the oxide layer that um you know the, the oxide layer on the sample is very 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 thin when you heat it up in atmosphere that oxide layer gets thicker because the heat creates that reaction if you heat it up in either a vacuum or in a you know no noble gas environment like helium or or argon or something we find that the metal is much shinier, which sort of indicates that there's less of that oxide layer. Um, you know, and like I said, we'll have the real uh, metallurgical analysis to kind of tell us <laughs> how true that is. But you know, that's kind of what we've observed so far. So there will be an oxide layer regardless. Now, when we process things in orbit, potentially in that starts in a noble environment and ends in a noble environment, you could have no oxide layer. But you know, it has its uses as well. So there's it's interesting. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming back to talk with us at yeah. Conversations for the Future. Thanks for having me. Yep. Pleasure. Can't wait to hear the next phase down the line. Awesome. All right. So our next act is uh, our executive director, Tim Chrisman, is going to have a conversation with Wayne Monteith from the FAA. Uh, we tried this format uh, last month with an interview and just really brought the conversation to life. So we're gonna try it again, one today and one tomorrow. So Tim is the executive director and co-founder of Foundation for the Future. A former CIA and Army intelligence officer, Tim supported the National Space Council and the joint staff at the Pentagon. He holds master's degrees in intelligence studies and international relations and affairs from American University. Mr. Chrisman is the author of the book, Humanity in Space and of various articles about the expanse of our civilization in space. His next challenge and mission is to make space accessible, survivable, and ultimately routine enough to be very boring. Wayne Monteith is, was appointed to his current position at the, as the Federal Aviation Administration's Associate Administrator for Commercial Space Transportation in January of 2019 after retiring from the U.S. Air, Air Force as a Brigadier General. In this role, he is responsible for regulating the safety of the U.S. commercial space transportation industry. 
Mr. Monteith's last U.S. Air Force assignment was operating the world's busiest spaceport, leading over 9,000 military, civilian, and contractor personnel. As the commander of the 45th Space Wing and director of the Eastern Range, he oversaw the successful execution of 66 space launches, 23 booster landings, and the first successful operational use of a fully autonomous flight. Welcome, Wayne and Tim. I'm really looking forward to your conversation. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, Lee. Yeah, welcome, uh, Wayne. It's uh, it's great to have you here. I uh, uh, listened in on uh, the talk you gave a couple months back with the Commercial Space Flight Federation, where um, you really sort of pulled back the curtain behind how and what FAA is doing. Uh, and, you know, you did it in an accessible way and you did it, um, you know, the just like uh, how the FAA's licensing tool for commercial space, uh, spaceport licensing is a, you know, more user friendly than the majority of government sites. Uh, that's sort of the vibe you brought. And so I'm really excited we're able to bring you here uh, to chat more. Well, I, I appreciate the time, Tim, and, and uh, I'm going to take just a little exception with the opening. Um, I hope space never gets boring. Uh, normal, yes. Uh, uh, Semi-routine, absolutely. Uh, but I can tell you from, from my perspective, uh, this, where this, we see this industry right now, uh, this is a second renaissance of space. And uh, on, a, on a scale of boring to something else, it is so far from boring that I can't even put that outer bound on the right. No, no, I'm, I'm with you. Um, and, you know, when, when we talk about that, uh, I'm, uh, <clears throat> we're really thinking like, I'm going to go get on a plane once I'm done talking with you. Uh, I don't know how that flies. I don't know why it flies. I just, I just mindlessly get on. I fall asleep. I wake up. I'm there. <laughs> Um, and so that's the sort of, uh, you know, background nature that we're trying to make space and it can't be done without, you know, the work that you all there at the FAA are doing. And, um, you know, that begs the question, what brought you to the FAA? You have a you know, long military career, uh, launching, uh, you know, running ranges, leading ICBM squadrons. What? So it's it, it, uh, you know it's a it's a, a unique journey. Uh, I would say interesting uh, as well, and one that was uh, incredibly full of opportunity and tremendous mentors. Uh, but but the journey really started all the way back in high school. Uh, I I was fortunate to have grown up in Hawaii and lived on an Air Force base. I was uh, my father served in the Air Force and. I could ride my bike down to the end of the runway and watch F-4 Phantoms take off. Uh, and we were also very near Honolulu International. So I had just a tremendous love of aviation early. Uh, and as a matter of fact, as soon as I was able, uh, my best friend and I uh, learned uh, how to fly, got our pilots, private pilot's license, licenses in, in high school. And, and so you know, now we fast forward a little bit you know, and when I got to college, I was uh, super interested in physics, uh, mathematics, and computer science. And that was all going well until uh, I ran into or decided I wanted to join ROTC and, and I originally wanted to fly. Uh, but unfortunately, my eyesight wouldn't allow it. So, but I did decide I wanted to go on operations. And so they had me change my, my degree and I ended up with a degree in geography focused on climatology and remote sensing, so the environment. Um, and came in as a uh, uh, nuclear weapons officer into the Air Force and, and eventually transitioned into space and just fell in love with, with all things space. And my, that last assignment we talked about really kind of brings this all home. So not only it, was it operational and, and launching rockets, uh, but I was also responsible for free or three airfields. So I understood a little bit about airports. Uh, I understood about air traffic control and, and absolutely understood about safety. So all of those core things that the FAA does, I never expected to come back into government service. Uh, I certainly never, uh, I didn't 
expect to move back to Washington, D.C. I did both of those things. And I stayed fully retired for a grand total of six weeks uh, before I transitioned from the Air Force to the FAA. But that's because this job seemed perfectly suited uh, for my background. And it was an opportunity to work with some tremendous uh, professionals uh, throughout the FAA and in my organization uh, in hopefully to make a difference. Yeah, no, I mean, it sounds like uh, you were, you know, groomed for this position, you know, former army guy. And so I very, you know, well understand the idea that, you know, you're put in a position and told, no, no, it's going to, you're not going to like it now, but you will later. Uh, and that's what it sounds like happened to you with this, because, I mean, just that, just the running multiple airfields while also managing space launches seems like the, uh, you know, ideal thing to have as you're going in when, you know, a lot of the talk now is almost, you know, how do we transition space launch from this once in a while thing to almost the commercial aviation model of routineness and, you know, bringing those lessons in, what, what can we learn from, you know, the, that transition in commercial air flight? So I, I think that the biggest lesson learned uh, uh, it's something I was told a, a couple of years ago when I got into this job. As, an, as a regulator, uh, we can either be uh, inhibitors or accelerators. The industry is going to move forward, particularly in this dynamic time. And so we choose, uh, consistent with public safety, to be accelerators wherever possible. How do we keep the public safe by also allowing innovation in this dynamic industry? And I think that's critical. And you talked a little bit about, you know, the kind of the growth that we're seeing. I think it's important to, to kind of cage the audience's perspective on where we are. So just one decade ago, 2011, my office only licensed a single commercial space launch for the entire year. Fast forward five years, and we were at 11 launches. So we went from one a year to one about every five weeks. We're now about every five days. Uh, it is incredible that the pace that we're seeing, and as a matter of fact, it was interesting. Um, I've been here at the FAA for about two and a half, a little over two and a half years now. We have uh, our current uh, count of licensed launches, commercial launches that we've done sits at about 414. A quarter of those have occurred since I arrived. One quarter. And so when, when you look at that and, and you also look at, you know, the difference between 2016 and now, we are projecting we're going to see a 400% increase in cadence. It is incredible what's going on. And so, so again, we can either, we're in the middle of it, whether we want to be or not, and we do want to be there, but we can either allow this industry to innovate and go forward, uh, or we can slow them down unnecessarily. And, and I'll kind of close this little bit with, you know, as, as being responsible for public safety, it is our job when required to every now and then just tap the brakes on the, on the pace that industry is moving. Uh, and, and we do it uh, with the lightest tapping of the brakes uh, that is necessary uh, to, uh, to make sure that our industry continues to be safe. They all want to be safe. But sometimes, you know, you just got to slow down a little bit and say, let's just make sure. Because in those 414 launches that we've licensed, we have never had a serious injury or fatality to a member of the uninvolved public. And you got to keep in mind, these are controlled explosions, every single launch. And so, you know, I would say that's an enviable safety record. Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, you're replacing the, uh, the payload of a nuclear missile and putting humans in it and saying, see you in a bit. Uh, like, uh, it's, uh, it's truly staggering um, how this works and how we're, you know, involved in this. And so, you know, bordering on 500 launches, no, no fatalities is, is pretty uh, pretty impressive. And it's, uh, you know, it's, if, if we look across the industry that, you know, uh, for the first 50 plus years of, of uh, space flight, you know, is primarily a government function uh, and, and did a phenomenal job. But what we're seeing now with the so much uh, focus of this in the commercial industry, 
is we're really seeing revolutionary change, not just evolutionary from the days of, of Goddard. We're seeing revolutionary change with autonomous flight safety systems, with flybacks. You know, when you can, when you can reuse uh, or refly a, a rocket booster 10 or more times, can fundamentally changes the landscape that, that we're seeing and, and really opens up that aperture for more and more companies, satellite companies, or you know, private citizens to be able to get to space or experience space. Yeah, no, it's, you know, it's exciting in the, in many ways, this was the promise of the space shuttle that we never really realized. Uh, and to see it coming uh, is so cool. And um, no, I, when I was, uh, I was laughing a little bit when you were saying, you know, it's your, you as the regulator's job to occasionally lightly tap the brakes. And, you know, I, the, Every morning when I get up, I have a huge list of space related news and, and policy stories. And any of those break tappings is 50 or more news articles about how could the FAA be doing this? But when you read into it, all that's happening is you all asked for some information. Um, and so uh, an unenviable position to be in, <laughs> to be sure. Well, I can tell you when I, I show up on the wrong side of Twitter, uh, it, with anybody who's got millions of followers, uh, I can tell you the, the eight people who follow me on Twitter are outraged uh, because they understand what I do. But, but that's just part of the job, you know, and, and, and we understand that. And at the end of the day, you know, in my statute, in Title 51 of the U.S. Code, it actually says regulate only to the extent necessary. Uh, and I embrace that. You know, we don't want to regulate to 101 percent, uh, never to 110 percent but only to the extent necessary to protect the public, public property uh, in the national security and foreign policy interests of the United States. And, and that's it. And I think we've been relatively successful thus far. Yeah, no, and um, I think the track record and the pace of how fast you all have been able to scale. Uh, and if I'm right, without adding a ton of new people as you know, the, the throughputs increased. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So when I, when I talk about our staffing and our budget, I never start with, in the last five years, we've increased the size of our staff by 15%. Because people are like, you know, their first response is, well, bloated government bureaucracy. <laughs> uh, but but when, you, when you put it in the environment that our workload has gone up over 400%, that 15% increase uh, to keep pace with industry doesn't seem that terrible uh, a price to pay because our industry... Uh, the U.S. commercial space or space transportation industry absolutely leads the world. And it's appropriate because it's an economic driver. It's a driver for national security. It's quite frankly, it's even a driver for STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering and mathematics uh, in our next generation. You can get excited a little bit watching the rocket launch on television, but there's nothing like seeing a rocket launch in your own backyard from you know a place like Cape Canaveral or the iconic Kennedy Space Center. Yeah, no, and uh, uh, both my kids uh, are at least moderately interested in space. One a lot more than the other. Uh, and we were talking earlier about how her tenth birthday is coming up, and uh, about like what she would want to do. And you know, she would want to see a launch from Cape Canaveral rather than Disney, right next door in Orlando. Uh, and I tell her all the time, like, you're, you're not right in the head, kid, yeah. um, but I like it. So let's, and you can let's do both. go. Exactly. You can do both. And, you know, as we've seen this proliferation of spaceports around the country, I'm sure you're asked all the time, how many is the right amount? Um, and of course, the answer is just, just enough. But um, it is there, you know, a continued appetite for more spaceports around the country? You know, it's a, it's an interesting it's an interesting question, and I, I'm not sure what the right answer is because it really depends on industry and the continued growth in industry. What, what I believe you're going to see is, uh, and we're already starting to see this. You know, most of the launches today occur on the two big federal ranges, which is on the eastern range, which is Florida in the Western Range, Vandenberg Space Force Base out in California. But they have natural capacity limiters. 
Uh, in California, it's because the launch sites, the launch pads are, are lined up north to south. So if you've got a, a rocket sitting on the southern launch pad, you don't want somebody launching over the top of you, rightfully. And at, and at Cape Canaveral and, and Kennedy, they're just running out of space for available new launch pads. So there's natural con constraints there. And so there, then you have to look forward. Do you want access to space to be your limiter to be successful in space? And, and my suggestion would be no. And the way we're set up right now is, is we don't go out and actively say, okay, uh, uh, for instance, New Hampshire, you need to, to stand up a spaceport uh, so that you can be part of this. But if New Hampshire comes to us and says, hey, you know, we want to, to uh, have a spaceport in our state or our local county, then we will evaluate that. And we don't evaluate the business part of it. There are two primary things we do on a spaceport. Number one is safety, of course, public safety, but even more so the environmental aspect. Can you be environmentally sound? And because it, it takes a, uh, a, a significant amount of time to make it through the licensing process, you don't actually have to have an actual rocket provider as part of your application. So it's really a two-part process. So on the spaceport side, it's really heavy environmental and less so safety, which means you only have to have a notional vehicle and a notional plan to get to space, like a single launch asthma. But once you get that spaceport license, then if a rocket provider, a launch provider comes in, now we really shift to far more focus on safety and less focus on environmental. Not that environmental isn't important, but a lot of that work has already been done on the spaceport side. So it's really a two-part process that we found works really well, because if, if you happen to be a launch provider and you say, I want, to, I want to start launching from New Hampshire, and you go to New Hampshire, it could be three, four, five years before you complete that spaceport uh, portion, which means then as a launch provider, you probably already look to go somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. No, and uh, I was just talking with Maine's uh, State Department of Economic Development and uh, saying like, look, you know, this is the application you put in for your spaceport. It, it doesn't need to be real in a sense that you have the full plan. You need to have what it's going to look like, where it's going to be. You can fix the rest, you know, while you're licensing in post-production, as they say in Hollywood. Um, right. It's and, really about who's going to come in and fly there. That's really where the safety, you know, it, it, and, and that's why the environmental is so important up front. And, you know, and that's another thing that, that, that brought me to the FAA because they are so focused. They are all also focused on the environmental aspects mm -hmm. and making sure that, that operators are good neighbors. You know, one of the most important things we did at Cape Canaveral was maintain the most prolific uh, endangered sea turtle breeding ground uh, in North America. That was all on the on the property that I was responsible for, and so again, it's another nice connection. But but we want to make sure they're environmentally sound, and and it's it's uh, we refer to it, you know, on the spaceport side is you're 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 planning on a notional vehicle, so a small class, medium class, or a big heavy rocket, and then we'll evaluate that uh, to the extent that we can. But if you're a rocket provider coming in, now we start that process over to make sure that we maintain that perfect safety record. Yeah, no, and I mean, they're, they're really two sides of the same coin is, it's, is what it sounds like, uh, you know, and the whole topic of this month's event is sustainability in space. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as we saw with Columbia and Challenger, not having the safety there put a grinding halt to a lot of ambitions and dreams. And so every bit as much as recycling in space, having you know, mechanisms in place to prevent accidents. And then the trust that if there is one, the regulators are going to come in on the backside and review it and evaluate what happened. And we don't just need to start from square one. Sounds like those are, you know, two sides of, of what you're working on. It, it absolutely is. And, and, and I would say, though, that, you know, even with the shuttle program, NASA is the premier space engineering organization in the world. Uh, and those were, those were tragic and unfortunate uh, accidents um, that, that we hope to never see again. But, you know, when, when we come in and, and, you know, notionally about somewhere on the order of 10 to 15 percent of the launches that we license experience some sort of mishap. Now, the first thing people think of are the big uh, uh, 
uh, fireworks type displays. But that's some of them. Uh, but more often than not, it's, it's something didn't go according to plan. So an engine throttled back a little bit early and, or you were just a little bit off course or something else occurred. And so what, what we have done is shifted our focus over the last couple of years that rather than wait, and we oversee all of these investigations, uh, and sometimes we conduct the investigations ourselves, but rather than wait to the entire investigation is complete, because that also includes mission success, we work diligently with the companies to uh, validate that the safety systems work as advertised uh, and would work as advertised again. In other words, we clear the safety case so that when the company is ready to return to flight, again, we don't become an impediment unnecessarily uh, to their return to flight. And so it is, as much as we are interested in mission success, uh, it's, it's not in our, our uh, core responsibility, it's public safety. Well, and as you're saying that, I was thinking, um, if one of the engines on my plane home this afternoon throttles back at the wrong time, I sure would like an investigation as to why. And so, uh, yeah, <laughs> this just seems like uh, sort of natural things uh, that we should be uh, all getting behind. Yeah, it, it really is. And, you know, and quite frankly, the FAA has got a tremendous record uh, of, of uh, being a, a successful safety organization. And quite frankly, our uh, administrator, uh, Steve Dixon, uh, refers to safety as our North Star, uh, which I think is appropriate for, for space uh, folks. Uh, he's all in on space. And, but we really do, we embrace it throughout the organization that it's safety first, safety always. Yeah, no, and um, I, uh, I wanted to shift gears there a little bit and talk about, um, you know, I, I am a, a non-scientist uh, coming into the space community. A lot of the people on here uh, are as well. And it's, in, you know, indicative that of the space economy that's moving away from rocket scientists and, uh, you know, almost Olympic level astronauts. Um, what, as you look out and are looking into the future, what are those careers and uh, trades that you are most excited to see emerging here? Uh, well, before I get into that, well, first thing I'll say is we still need STEM uh, and we need a lot. Mm. Uh, you know, we, we, we seem to run out of uh, 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 engineers long before we run out of engineer jobs. And so it's, an, it's important that, that we do our part uh, to help uh, excite and prepare the next generation of, of rocket scientists and, and engineers going forward. But, you know, one of the, so there are many different, many different opportunities here. You know, everything from, you know, if you look at the aviation industry, there's a, there is a whole secondary industry that's built up around that. You know, whether it's, it, it's mechanics, maintainers, uh, logistics folks, uh, folks running the, the, the airports, uh, you know, flight attendants worried about safety constantly, travel agents, all of those things. But what I would tell you, uh, something that I find really intriguing. Now, if, if you went back to, to and got back in your way back machine and, and talked to, you know, young Wayne Monteith back in high school, and you gave me the option of being uh, an airline pilot or a rocket pilot, I, I can tell you the direction I would have leaned. Uh, and it would certainly be to be a rocket pilot. And that's what we're seeing today with operations like Virgin Galactic. You actually have pilots trained to fly essentially a rocket ship. So this is almost, for, for those of you, again, we'll go back in the Wayback Machine, you know, this is kind of Buck Rogers, uh, you know, long before warp drive, uh, that, that we had this excitement. And so, so I think the aperture is completely wide open and not just for technical degrees. Uh, you know, uh, at some point in the, probably in the very back, which again, will hopefully help excite. the. Yeah, no, and that's really one of the goals of this event is bridging that divide and being an accessible place for those who aren't uh, on the inside and may feel intimidated by the technical details or, you know, scared they won't understand and uh, trying to provide an accessible entry point there. Um, at, as space is becoming this more mainstream area, and you, as you talked about, you know, if we're doing it on the ground, we're probably going to need it in space. Um, if you could convince one, you know, the public one thing about space, what, what would that be? 
Um, I, I would work to shift the narrative that space isn't important. Space is mm. absolutely important. We've seen it throughout, throughout our history. You know, uh, whether it's uh, GPS, which allows us to have exquisite communications, uh, to be able to use an ATM at, at the gas station, uh, all of these secondary things, you know, it, it, I'll go to the old, you know, the, the old joker analogy that, you know, I don't need uh, uh, no stinking satellites. All I need is my, my handheld GPS device. And it's like, well, that's an interesting concept. But, but how important space is, you know, from that to microprocessor advances to, quite frankly, solar cells, all of those things that, that, that we utilize here uh, on the planet that we take for granted. And if you, if you really are truly interested in affecting climate and affecting climate change positively and being concerned about our, our, our environment, there's really no better way to get a sense of how the earth uh, is evolving and how the earth, and, uh, and I'll use a, absolutely a non-scientific term, but how the earth feels uh, uh, without sensors in space that be able to take that holistic view of the entire planet. And so I think it's critically important for, for folks to understand that the dollars that are spent in space translate directly and indirectly to our quality of life and the future of our planet here. And, and quite frankly, you know, whether you look back to, to when we were a seafaring nation or an aviation nation, you know, as humans, we're explorers. And it's time to push the bounds. It's time to go off world uh, and, and create our, or, or turn science fiction into science reality, whether it's, whether it's going to Mars or, you know, it's, it's a, you know, warp drive or uh, maybe a flux capacitor, who knows, but uh, all of those things are in the realm of, of the possible. Yeah, <clears throat> no, I think that's, that's a phenomenal uh, way to look at it. You know, I, when I talk about, or talk to people who are saying, you know, we should fix the earth first. I talk about how, you know, we're not, you know, shooting kinetic projectiles at Mars or the moon and just ramming them into the ground. And, you know, it's filled with billions of dollars. I'm like, no, these are, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of prototypes of systems we can use here on the ground. Not all of them are going to work, but a lot of them end up making our lives insanely better. And so, yeah, I think you're exactly right there. Um, I know we're at time, and so I want to offer you uh, a chance for any closing comments before we uh, transition out. Well, Tim, I, you know, I just, again, I appreciate the opportunity to spend time with you. And as we talk about the environment, and, I, and I'm confident that y'all have, have addressed this and will continue to address it, but we can't forget how important space sustainability is as well. Mm, and, yeah. and being good stewards uh, of that environment, because quite frankly, if you don't have a a safe environment. There is no business. There is no exploration. If you can't get to space, none of the rest of it exists. So I think it's critically important as we go forward, particularly as we see these super constellations go up, that we're, we're also cognizant of our responsibility to protect that environment, which is fragile you know, around our planet. Uh, and it needs to be built into our system. And, and quite frankly, we need to move forward with, with making sure things don't continue to bump into each other. Uh, and encourage those companies who are looking to, to, to find innovative ways to remove debris that's already on mm -hmm. orbit. And so, yeah. you know, the environment here is, is precious and as is, you know, our near earth environment as well. And, and we have a responsibility to take care of it. Yeah, well said. Thank you, Wayne. Thanks, Tim. Really appreciate it. And thank you, Lee, again. Thank you, Wayne. It's always great to hear such passion and animation from a regulator. Uh, it's really, really fun to see how excited you are about, about everything that's going on. Thanks again. All right. Our next feature is Space Money, where we talk with investors, CFOs, analysts, and economists about money for, in, and from space. And while we're talking about money, it is a good chance to remind you that we are a nonprofit organization that depends on your generosity to advance this program. If you're enjoying today's conversations, please consider making a donation or sponsoring our next event like Terry Trevino did on the registration page to help cover the cost of this event every month.
the website is www.f4f, that's the number four, dot space. Jeff Krusey is with us today. He is a self-taught engineer turned entrepreneur and investor across a variety of deep tech fields. <clears throat> Excuse me. He spent nearly a decade working with space tech startups and leads the investment team at Seraphim Space, the oldest and most prolific space tech specialist fund with $350 million under management. Prior to Seraphim, Jeff managed strategy at Viasat, a provider of satellite broadband and secure networking systems for defense and commercial markets. He worked across a variety of early stage startups, including as co-founder and CEO of Deep C, that's S-E-E, -E, a next generation augmented reality optics company. Before becoming an entrepreneur, Jeff led climate tech venture capital for DTE Energy Ventures, and he's a fellow Wharton grad. Jeff, it's so great to have you on from across the pond. Your uh, the screen is yours. Great, yeah, thank you, Lee. Uh, thank you all for having me. Um, really appreciate it. Um, so I, I think the topic of discussion today, um, you know, has a lot to do with sustainability, and I think one of the areas that you know I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about. Um, is orbital debris um, and something that I think about a lot um, because we've invested in quite a few companies that are um, have constellations in orbit and um, we constantly have to think about the risks that those companies are exposed to and one of the major ones being orbital debris. Um, also worth mentioning, we've invested in, in sort of the security side of that as well um, in companies like uh, Leo Labs, who's you know, working hard to track everything that's up there, um, but also with uh, companies that are, um, you know, developing ways to clean up orbit as well. So companies like uh, Dorbit, for example. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think one of the things that that, that troubles me um, constantly is just how much debris is up there. Um, and so it, it, it's easy to assume that, you know, there's, there's lots of objects up there, um, but I, I, I think it's it's hard to imagine how much is actually up there. So just to give you an idea, um, uh, softball size or larger objects in orbit, um, we have about 23,000 of those. Um, and marble sized objects, so like a little bit over a centimeter, um, we, we have about 500,000 of those objects. And then, um, you know, pieces that are, are, are you know, maybe uh, under a centimeter, um, I mean, that, that's in the many, many millions of, of objects. So there's, there's a lot of mass flying around up there um, and, and flying around at incredible rates. Um, so, I mean, something like 22,000 miles an hour in, in Leo. So um, that, that can be incredibly destructive um, very quickly, um, in, uh, especially if, if you've got a big constellation in orbit. Um, so, uh, you know, what, what, What's particularly difficult about that is it's really hard to track those tiny little objects um, in, in space, um, and so uh, you know how how do how do we deal with that? And that's you know one of the reasons we we've you know backed deorbit is because um, you know there might not be a market today, but you know it, it's a problem that we know is approaching and and needs to be worked on for a long time. Um, and you know it it's it's not in the too distant past when. We, you know, we've seen some collisions and we've seen, you know, the number of those tiny little objects that are flying around very quickly up there um, grow dramatically. Um, and so um, I think, uh, especially when we're in this new era of, of, you know, the space domain being important, not just to the US, but to other countries, um, we have to be particularly careful um, because we don't, we don't want anybody firing a missile at a satellite that can create a catastrophic uh, uh, um, debris field for us all. So um, I, I think one of the, 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 the difficulties right now, though, is um, there's really not any great uh, mitigation plans currently. We have things like the 25-year rule, which means you know, you're supposed to comply with um, this the statute that says you know after tw you know within 25 years of mission completion that you're supposed to um, uh, deorbit um, your 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 spacecraft. 
um, uh, from Leo, and um, that that's that's well intentioned, um, but space is still a little bit lawless in the sense that there's only like 50% compliance with that with that rule. Um, you know, people have other motivations, oftentimes financial, and there's nobody really paying you to to clean up orbit just yet. Hey, can um, I ask a? I'm going to interrupt just for a second. Whose yeah. rule is that? Uh, I mean, I that that's that's a difficult one to say um, because it would be great if if there were you know all the major countries that are actually going to space um, had a cooperative agreement amongst them that that would be wonderful um, given current political socio political climate I don't know that that's realistic um, and and so um, so I think. You know there will have to be some sort of market incentive and what i mean by that is i think and this is just me maybe being a bit of a cynic um i, I think we we will have to experience um a collision that really does put everybody on high alert um and and that will compel um not only you know stakeholders uh you know like the companies that are flying in those particular orbits to start cleaning those up um, but also, um, you know, I, I think that there's a role for insurance companies or, or some sort of financial mechanism like that um, to play um, in, in helping create sort of a financial incentive to, um, you know, mitigate, um, but also eventually um, remediate any of that kind of debris that is up there. Did that answer your question? Well, it got into new territory for sure. Um, the 25 year rule, who's who uh, put that in motion? Um, so I think that was a, I think that was ESA originally. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and that was sort of uh, uh, a rule that everybody was hoping you know, companies would comply with. But like I said, very yeah. few do. Enforcement is a is a concern. Yeah. yeah thank yeah. you. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, quite all right. Um, if, if there's any other questions, happy happy to take those. Or, okay, I'll just I'll keep going. Um, so yeah, um, so most of the mass that's out there right now it, it is in Leo, which is you know it's got its pluses and minuses, but um, you know I, I think you know good news is some of that will remediate itself, thankfully. Um, but because that's where most of the mass is going these days, uh, we really need to pay close attention to what's going on there. Um, and so, um, you know, I think, you know, the, 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 the toughest part right now is that we, we need to have companies start figuring out, you know, exit plans for, for their spacecraft and, and including that as part of their mission. Um, whereas before, you know, we could just put it into a different orbit. That's sort of like a junk pile and that would have been fine. Um, and, and figuring out some sort of mechanism for, to get companies to comply with that. Um, and you know, that, I mean, and everybody's painfully aware of that. So like, you know, we have national space policy, um, directives that, that, that outline that pretty clearly for us, um, in terms of, you know, needing active debris removal. And so one of the things that I focus a lot on is like how, how we do that. Um, and so th there's, there's lots of different types of solutions, you know, everything from I've seen um, satellites that that eject nets to capture small debris, um, all the way up to companies like Astroscale, who have these robotic arms that can, can latch on to, um, you know, out of uh, out of service satellites and, and take them where they need to be. Um, and and so it's it's really, in my line of work, a question of timing. Um, and, and that's, that's a difficult one because who knows when that next collision will happen. Um, and I think it, it's, it's probably closer than we could ever imagine. Um, I, I, I was talking to somebody from Leo Labs not too long ago, um, in just a matter of a few hours, they had over 400 conjunction alerts. Um, and, and, and that's a lot, um, especially when, you know, these are largely being, uh, these constellations are right now are largely being sort of manually uh, administered and, and there really isn't sort of that autonomous layer to allow for like timely um, uh, uh, 
movements uh, of the satellites to, to get them out of the, you know, each other's you know, path. Um, and so I, I think I think there's, there's quite a few different roles to play here um, in terms of, you know, the investors um, looking to help, you know, in terms of uh, cleaning up debris. So one thing that, you know, we've we've, we've considered actually is in more common practice terrestrially are ESG standards. Um, and and those those are great because they're not typically enforced. A lot of companies adopt that because they know that's the right thing to do because you know we only have one globe and and you know I think you know there, there's a good analogy to draw out as well for orbit I mean and I think you know our, our, our world extends you know into our atmosphere so um, you know I would I would really like to see companies start implementing ESG standards um, that are that are putting up satellites committing to you know some level of remediation um, or, or mitigation um, for orbit cleanup, and and the more often we can get companies doing that, um, the, the better. Um, and, and so, um, you know, how how could how could that be implemented? Well, just like a lot of investors require their companies to uh, comply with ESG standards, um, we could we could ask you know the companies that we invest in to cl comply with very similar standards um, to, to be to, you know be to be good stewards. And so. Um, you know that that's something we're giving a lot of consideration to because um, those, you know, taking care of our orbits is, is really important to us, especially if, you know, we think it's you know fertile ground, you know, for for future markets. Um, we we have to continue to ensure that. Um, and um, I think you know, in all, um, I think. It's it's really something that um, is is we, we don't have any tremendously good solutions just yet. Um, I, I I think you know you know like I was pointing out earlier, um, we can ask companies to you know deorbit their satellites after X number of years uh, um, past mission complete, but it still doesn't address the issue around the very tiny objects that are out there that actually present the greatest risk. Um, because you know, because they can penetrate through a satellite um, at the, those high rates. So um, that is almost like its own separate problem. And how do we take care of that? I actually don't have a good answer. I don't know that anybody has a good answer right now. Um, that's part of what I'm looking for. Um, <laughs> is, is is trying to find the company that can solve that problem because I think the company that does figure out a cost-effective way to solve that problem will be a very big deal um, into the future. Um, yeah, it seems there are opportunities, as you know, we've, we've heard about on the engineering side, but there are also these sort of structural businesses that that get into insurance. Um, that's not something that we've talked about yet today. Um, and I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, I think, you know, it's it's something that unfortunately comes out of, um, you know, a, a negative experience. So I mean, I think a lot of like, satellite operators they worry about whether or not they're going to have to um you know place an insurance claim because their their solar array didn't all open up all the way and they're at you know a quarter of the capacity that they're expecting mm. so it, it's not really a, a foreign concept to to the industry um it, it, it's it's somebody needs to take the first step to ensure that um so um you know going back to what i was describing earlier there there is a role for countries to play to start asking companies to, to abide by some kind of um, remediation or mitigation strategy um, or, or policy. Um, and then, um, I mean, they could even, you know, do things like um, subsidize the insurance market to, uh, to, to ensure that, that that takes place. Um, talk, so ESG standards, uh, I like how you talk about it in a sort of a social pressure kind of way, you know, publicly traded companies, are going to want to make sure that their press releases say how involved they are in sustainability. Um, and then at you as a private investor, um, you can drive some of the same behaviors. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about ESG standards and what what could be first? Yeah, happy to. Um, and, and so I, I would I would go a little bit further and, and say it's a bit more than just social pressure. Um, there is that component, definitely. Yeah. Um, but there's also um, 
there is a, a financial incentive as well. And, I, and I'll give you sort of a, uh, an example. Um, when, when we go out to raise a venture capital fund, many of the people that would invest in a venture capital fund um, require us to implement those standards. Right. Um, so, so it sort of trickles down um, and, it, and, it's, and it's, it's enforceable, um, which I think it needs to be because nobody's going to do it. Or I don't think yeah. um, the majority of people will do it on their own. Um, because sometimes it does add costs and, and deteriorates the economics a little bit. Um, but, you know, big picture, it's probably in that positive. So, um, yeah, I, I, and, and we're seeing that more and more um, as well. Um, I mean, we, we just raised a new fund, and that was the top question we were asked um, by, by investors was, you know, what, what is our policy? What does that look like? Um, how far does that extend, you know, for your space companies that, aren't necessarily on Earth. Um, so uh, we, we had to spend a lot of time thinking about that and considering that. And so, um, I mean, I, I would say it's probably still, I mean, we, we do have a very well flushed out ESG standard on the terrestrial side. We're still working out how to, you know, write that kind of policy um, in orbit, so to speak. Yeah. And you talked a little bit about political will that you believe it's going to take an event or a couple of events um, really to generate the political will to get over that hump that everybody's talking about today. Um, how near disaster does that need to be in order to be heated? Yeah, um, so uh, that's, a, that's, that's a tough question to answer. Um, I, 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 I don't know if this is the short version. Um, how, I mean, Again, like I said, I, I'm a bit of a cynic sometimes, and I unfortunately think there, there, it'll, it'll require a collision with a large debris field for people to actually start worrying about it. You know, involving more than just two parties um, is really what it comes down to. Um, I mean, and especially so if it's near um, assets that are of you know very high value, particularly to government. So if it's near a very sensitive satellite. Mm -hmm. um, then, then I think we'll start to see, um, you know, legislation move much quicker. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Let's take a step backwards um, and talk about Seraphim uh, investment criteria, life cycle expectations. You know, where do you start? You're the, you've been around the longest, so you may have seen a few exits and, and, you know, what does that look like? How do you make decisions? Yeah. Um, so uh, when Seraphim started off, it was a, a, a fairly traditional looking venture capital fund um, that was focused on seed and Series A investments. Um, and it, it was originally actually designed for just Series A investments. But what we realized quite early on was that um, there was actually quite a gap on, on the seed side, which meant we weren't seeing enough quality companies at Series A for us to actually make the return we thought we would. So we had to move a little bit um, further down the stream upstream, or further up yeah. the stream um, <clears throat> uh, to, to help um, curate some of that deal flow. Um, and so we actually uh, we, we founded uh, an accelerator called Sarah from Space Camp um, to work with companies on the seed side. So. Um, we have a very different set of criteria for companies that we look at uh, at seed stage versus Series A and, and beyond. Um, and so at, at seed stage, we're, we're looking for um, a few things, and it's, there's no like good formula for it either. Um, so we're looking for um, a, a high quality team, and, and that can come in so many different forms um, depending on the business. But uh, usually there, there's two basic components. There's you know, a highly technical team or founder that, um, you know, you know, where their competitive moat is, is due to the, some of the technology that this person's developed and has yeah. great insights into that nobody else does. Um, the other, the other side of it is, you know, oftentimes there's a brilliant engineer, um, but they might not have all the commercial experience. So we try and pair that with, um, you know, another founder or teammate that has some of that experience in terms of going to the market or, or a similar market to, to, you know, um, you know, the, the ones that they have previously. Um, we, we try to look for some, you know, what we consider technology de-risking. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe there, there is, um, you know, feasibility demonstrated with the lab or benchtop prototype. 
Um, maybe there was there, uh, a sensor was flown on a hosted payload somewhere. Um, maybe the, the, the software was tested um, with a client in orbit. Um, there, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of different ways to, to go about de-risking technology, but we try and look for some indication of de-risking. It doesn't need to be completely de-risked. That's part of being an early stage investor is taking yeah. that on. Um, but we, we want to see some movement there. Um, and then, you know, if there's, if there's actually, we don't expect for a company to have tremendous amounts of revenue at that point in time, but if there's some kind of revenue generation, um, you know, in terms of, well, I guess not revenue generation, but more, it, it depends on how you want to define it. But like, there's a lot of grant funding available these days for companies um, uh, working on early development of technology through programs like the Cibber program. Um, you know, there, there's agencies that write tons of grants in Europe, um, like, like the European Space Agency. Um, the UK has a few, um, and and then as well as from from the militaries, uh, respective militaries. So the MOD, the DOD, they you know they clearly have invested interest in space, so you can get a lot of non-dilutive funding um, there. Yeah. So uh, and we found that companies that are uh, at good at getting a lot of that non-dilutive funding, um, oftentimes. Um, are, are, are more successful down the road because they use that as force multiplying and keeping in mind not to get stuck as a body shot for the DOD. But um, I, I think you know that that does go a long way at the earlier stages. Um, and then uh, you know moving on from oh so you know investing at that stage I mean we'll, we'll typically write checks um, between 100 and 250k um, for those companies and. We we typically don't take leading positions or large positions at the seed mm -hmm. stage mm -hmm. um, because we're really more or less buying optionality and, and hoping we can work with the company to help them develop, knock down a bunch of milestones and, um, you know, take a, a, a more leading um, investor role at, at, the, at the Series A and beyond. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and then going into Series A, um, I mean, that that's probably around, you know, two to five million and then it scales up and um, you know now that we have a much larger fund because we actually listed on the London Stock Exchange and raised a bunch of fresh capital um, we are now doing more growth stage investing as well so we're trying to span more of the life cycle of these companies um, and, and think it's important that they could have a specialist a sector specialist supporting them through all of that um, yeah. and so um, that that's really important um, to us because um, you know, we have the backing of a lot of industry stakeholders as well. So companies like Airbus, SES, yeah. um, MDA, um, and, and, you know, getting a lot of our portfolio companies exposure there because um, quite often they'll, they'll walk away um, from those conversations with the new customer, channel partner, co-developer, sometimes even co-investor. So, um, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of value that we try and bring to them uh, that way as well. That's great. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, you're in London, you've just been listed on the London Stock Exchange, if I heard that right. Um, talk a little bit about being based in the UK, uh, how that changes the dynamic, how that changes the space discussion um, for, for an investor. Yeah, um, so I, it, it's probably worth mentioning the reason we went with a less traditional route um, was because we saw a lot of challenges within the traditional VC structure of a fund, which typically has a 10-year lifespan. Um, and that, that's, that's usually fine in, in more general venture capital, but oftentimes space companies um, you know, are more capital intensive, take longer, um, and, and a 10-year fund, just we didn't feel fit very well in terms of timescales. So um, we wanted to uh, figure out a way to put together a permanent capital vehicle and, and where we, we could have more latitude to take longer term views on companies. And we were able to do that going through, going through this IPO. Um, it also gave us more access to capital. Um, so we didn't need to spend a year and a half raising a fund. We could do that in a, much, um, uh, in a more expeditious fashion. Um, and then, you know, to answer your question about, you know, what's how, how does how does being in, in the UK differ or, um, you know, how is that different over here versus maybe the US, for example? Um, and, and it's a lot different. Um, it, it's I, I would say um, there in, in the UK, there's there's actually quite a bit of technical talent here. 
Um, it's really impressive, actually. Um, and and that, you know, due to, the, you know, the great educational institutions that they have out here um, and, and have built a nice cluster, uh, space cluster for themselves, um, you know, being a relatively smaller country compared to the U.S. Um, and so I, am, it, I think a lot of people are surprised to find actually the three top space countries are U.S., China, and the U.K., um, and then like by, by a lot. So um, I, I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of technical talent here, not as much capital, um, but I think that's mm -hmm. changing now. Yeah. Um, because I think investors outside of the UK are also realizing, well, they can, they can, you know, they can sort of arbitrage that a little bit. They, they don't have to pay, you know, you know, top tier quality talent um, the same in the UK that they would in the US oftentimes. And um, you can, and you still got a lot of uh, ecosystem support. Um, but I think it's also worth mentioning that, you know, the view that we take is, you know, there's a lot of overlap um, in space and Intel slash defense. Um, and especially, um, you know, because, well, there's, there's a lot of overlap in Intel and defense. Um, and that overlap also is between a lot of the Five Eyes allied countries as well. So being in the UK um, and being in both the US um, ecosystem really does give us a large advantage to see sort of uh, get a panoptic view of all the companies out there so we can be better informed as an investor. Um, the only downside to it is like, I'm, I'm quite often up well past midnight talking to companies um, on the West Coast of the US, which is fine. I, I, I signed yeah. up for this job and I love it. But um, um, and, and thankfully, you know, we'll be opening up an office in the US pretty soon because, um, you know, to be a, a, a credible space tech investor, you really do need to be aligned with um, the US and, and the, the, the government there because, um, you know, for the foreseeable future, there will likely be the largest and most consistent customer. Um, and, and so uh, we need to sort of be in both places at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would love to ask more questions about Brexit and comparison and contrast with some of your uh, cohorts in space investing with to have different different ways of going about it. Red wire voyagers are just different structures. Um, but we'll have to have you back another day, perhaps for our November Space Money Conference. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd love to be there. Um, and, and thank you for having me. Oh, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. All right. Our next speaker is Jeremy Grimmett. He is the founder and chief executive officer of Rogue Space Systems Corporation. He started his career in the U.S. Army, where he specialized in missile guidance systems for both ground and air defense platforms. Since then, he's attended Harvard University's School of Extension Studies, where he is pursuing undergraduate and master's degrees in government and international relations, respectively. After founding and running a successful technology services company, Jeremy founded Rogue Space Systems Corporation in 2020 and brought his expertise in AI, tech, and robotics to advance space systems, orbital vehicles, and space services. His startup is developing orbital robots to service and transport assets in LEO, GEO, and we don't hear a lot about it, MEO. <laughs> Jeremy, the screen is yours. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, I will share my screen and we'll get, uh, we'll get going. So, Thank you guys so much for having me today. And um, it's, um, it, it's uh, really a pleasure to be here and, and talk to everybody. We've, um, we've been working really hard over the course of the past uh, couple of years, uh, trying to advance our philosophies on the space debris and uh, trying to get more sustainability out into the market. Um, <clears throat> so what we're gonna talk a little bit about is, you know, what Rogue is doing, uh, what kind of uh, some of our ideas are uh, for the future. And I'm really gonna probably spend a lot of time trying to answer questions and trying to make this more of a conversation about what's going on out there, uh, as opposed to just uh, some sort of a lecture. So, because I know there's a lot of curiosity and a lot of, uh, a lot of inference and a lot of misinformation, quite honestly, out there. 
And I think it's uh, important that we try to get uh, good, clear, accurate information uh, uh, to everybody. So again, my name is Jeremy Grimmett with Rogue Space Systems, and uh, we're building space robots. Um, uh, this is actually one of the images of Fred. Um, he's a, uh, a utility vehicle uh, where we'd be able to, uh, we've got some robotics on it, uh, so a lot of power and a lot of propulsive capability to uh, move around inside of orbit. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, that's me. Um, I think everyone is, 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 uh, is really clearly aware of the problems that we have out in, uh, out in space. I mean, this is, uh, everybody's probably been to like uh, stuffinspace.com. Uh, you guys have probably seen uh, this. I think it's a little bit more updated on this one. <clears throat> but this is all real time data out of the 18 space track wing. Um, and it's, uh, as you can clearly see, there's a lot of space debris. There's a lot of active satellites. Uh, we've got, uh, I want to, I think those little yellow dots that are going across, I'm pretty sure those are Starlinks. Um, a lot of dead rocket bodies. And uh, the really great thing from a company commercial perspective is that there's a lot of space and there's no one company that's going to be able to go and deal with all of these uh, blue and gray dots that are out there and uh, the soon to be gray uh, dots, which are all the red ones, uh, which are, you know, dead or excuse me, operating satellites. So um, just taking a quick tour real quick. If we go look down on the North Pole, um, this out here is geostationary orbit. That's where um, some of the most high value assets um, in space are located. You have everything from a 70, you know, 50, 75 million dollar satellite to billion dollar satellites sitting out here. There's approximately 550 uh, plus um, uh, active satellites in geostationary orbit that generate uh, about 260 some billion dollars, no, 166 billion dollars a year in revenue. So that's 550 assets doing 160 billion dollars a year. That's uh, that's a lot of money um, that's uh, tied up into the space economy. Now, um, what what really starts getting interesting is you know, how much money do these companies lose in case of a failure? How much money do they lose uh, if there's a debris strike, uh, things like that? Um, or uh, in the case of defense, what are the national security ramifications of losing capability out in geostationary orbit, which is where a lot of our defense capability as far as satellite, uh, satellites in space are concerned, that's really where uh, the bread and butter, so to speak, of the defense agencies uh, really lies out there. So uh, that is where Rogue is really focused, is uh, uh, increasing our capability to eventually get out into geo and cislunar uh, orbits. Now, the area in between uh, the ball, which is right around here, 2,000 kilometers or so, and geostationary, which is all around here, this in between, that's actually MEO. And as you can see, there's a lot of assets that are flying around out there um, that, especially with respect to rocket bodies that uh, are on very slow trajectories back down to earth that need to be removed or repurposed or, or recycled in some kind of way. That's where Rogue comes in. That's where we're really starting to uh, focus uh, and try and bring sustainability uh, inside uh, a space economy that is very nascent. Um, so, let's see, there we go. So that's uh, that's really what we're working towards. Um, there's more and more uh, systems out there that are going to die. There's increased chances of debris uh, in collisions, what they call conjunctions. Um, and there's extremely limited capability when it comes to disposing or removing these uh, these uh, uncontrolled pieces of debris out in space. And 
those are the solutions that we're really focused on as an organization. Now, in order to achieve that, in order to deal with all that fun stuff, uh, we've developed a suite of uh, robots in order to go out into space and try and help deal with that, both from a servicing perspective as well as debris mitigation or debris removal. And we, so we have inspection, monitoring, and observing. That's our LARA spacecraft. We have Fred, which is capture. Uh, he's got some actual robotic arms and stuff on him. You can see him right here, right there. So he's got four of them. Looks really cool whenever you put them in video. If we have time, I might show you the little snippet that we have. Um, kind of looks like a wasp coming in. It's pretty cool. Um, sorry, we're kind of nerdy over here, so, so forgive me. Um, and then, of course, we have Charlie. Uh, it's a 16U CubeSat format, and uh, inside of him, there's some very fine robotic uh, capability. Uh, you, I'm sure everybody's seen Matrix, you know, the kind of like tentacle looking arms. That's the kind of stuff that's uh, inside of Charlie uh, that we're working on. Very fine motor skill uh, types of uh, capability. Uh, in order to accomplish all this, you got to be able to perceive an object. You got to be able to think about it, okay? Uh, and then uh, your relative, you know, think about your relative position and the motion and things like that. And then you have to be able to move in relation to that object. Um, these are big differentiators uh, uh, of Rogue uh, that our systems are capable of doing. And that's why we're uh, eventually going to be a infrastructure uh, uh, piece inside of space. And that's why we're kind of the triple A of space, where we're going to be able to go and lend a hand or take the junk out of the road, so to speak. Um, so these are our solutions that we're putting in, because our philosophy is that there is no one single solution to these types of problems. It's going to be a suite of capability, a suite of problems. And there are going to be times where there are not things that we can actually do. There are going to be times when we have to partner with another company like Northrop Grumman on the mission extension vehicle or an Astroscale or a clear space or a deorbit. They can have a capability that we may not necessarily do. But what's really cool about space is that there's a lot of cooperation. Uh, the landscape is one where we're always trying to find ways to work together uh, because all of us go back to the simple fact that um, there is just a whole lot of space and nobody's going to be able to deal with all these dots. So there's plenty of money out there. And if you attack, so to speak, if you attack this problem from the perspective of it not necessarily being a market, but an economy. So if you look at the philosophy, if you take upon the philosophy and the belief system that we are trying to go and support and enable an economy, then we're not really fighting and arguing over who gets more market share. We're trying to support and enable an economy. And that economy is worth trillions. It's not worth a few billion or trillions. So by taking that kind of philosophy and that the tide rises, you know, when the tide rises, it lifts everybody up. Um, that type of philosophy really helps garner a cooperative spirit inside of um, inside of space and the space industry as a whole. So these are some of the solutions, and that's kind of the direction that we're headed. And um, I think I've got a video here that, yes, Trisha told me to play this video, and I do what Trisha tells me to do. So um, this is only about a two, two or three minute video, so I'll play it. We aren't hearing the sound, but we can see the video. Oh, you can? Sorry about that. Can you hear sound now? We hear it, but it's muffled. If you could narrate a little bit, 
to let us know. I'm really messing this up. I'm not a very good presenter on my own laptop. Um, this is what I'm going to do. Now I'm on uh, LinkedIn. I'm just going to walk you through what the video says. Okay. What the video is talking about is the fact that we are really focused on develop, doing rapid development of space technology and space capabilities. Uh, one thing that uh, you may want to keep in mind is that we really only started just over a year ago. Now, the brainchild for this, uh, for this endeavor, uh, for Rogue, actually started March 15th of 2019. I remember it because I was at the MIT Space Conference on astropreneurship. It's kind of a cool word, astropreneurship. And um, somebody there, Van Espody, out of uh, Starburst and Techstars, told me to do two things. He said, go figure out a way to build small space robots that do cool stuff in space and uh, go build a team. So that's what I went and did. Um, and what we quickly figured out was nobody was paying to deal with the space debris problem because that's really where we started off. And then we took pivoted kind of, and we decided to go ahead and de uh, develop technology that was analog and symbiotic to dealing with the space debris problem so that eventually when the space debris market uh, um, matured, and there was an actual customer out there for us to go and have pay for it because before nobody was paying for it, um, <clears throat> we would be able to go and do that. So with all that being said, now you have rogue space systems roughly two and a half years later, and we've really only um, uh, been moving this operation along over the course of the past year. Now, here you can see this is kind of a shot of the International Space Station. We would be able to deploy orbots off the International Space Station to go and debris, uh, de uh, mitigate or deal with an issue or provide some sort of assistance that might be out there uh, or that might be needed. Um, uh, we can get <laughs> alerts from distressed satellites and go and help that satellite uh, in case there's a problem. And then I'm going to get to the really cool part because that's the part that I really like uh, is Fred in motion. I'm hoping that you guys can kind of see it. I'll put a link. Uh, I'll put a link in the chat so everybody can go get it. But that's Fred and you'll see Laura here. And this is just a piece of space debris. And what we're doing is you'll see Fred. So you'll see him kind of pinning back his solar panels and he kind of opens up his, uh, his arms so that he can uh, go in on that piece of debris. Um, let's see. So let's see here. There you go. So he's unfolding his arms, his, his, uh, his solar panels actually pinned back to get out of the way. And Laura is sitting over here in the background monitoring and making sure that all the information and telemetry is actually accurate. So these guys are actually working together in order to go and get this object that, uh, that Fred is tracking and, or that we've been tasked to go and remove. So that's, uh, that's, that's a little bit about Rogue and uh, about what our capabilities are and the different things that we're working with. And um, I can open it up to q and I know I'm a little bit ahead of schedule, but I hope that's okay. No, that's, that's great. We, um, we love seeing that. And, and nerdy is just fine with this crowd, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, Love the comment. We got some comments in the chat about your uh, philosophy of talking about an economy. I think that you've articulated something that we've danced around a little bit in some of our earlier conversations today uh, in talking about, you know, this isn't something that you just 
go and make money at right away. Um, no. But in order to continue making money, the $166 billion for 500, 550 assets, you have to keep that economy healthy. And it's one of those aspects. So, so great feedback there. Um, I wanted to hear a little bit of the backstory about the naming. Can you just uh, warm us up with, with where Fred, Laura, and uh, Charlie come from? Yeah, so uh, Fred um, is um, Fred is uh, my co-founder's uh, father-in-law uh, that uh, that passed away. Uh, Laura uh, was named after my adoptive mother that passed away a couple years ago. Um, uh, uh, Charlie is after my other co-founder. His father passed away, <laughs> so we kind of have a theme going on. But what's kind of cool about it is that uh, as we kind of march through the names, uh, the idea is that each person's going to get to pick a namesake. They're, they're going to get to uh, name one. Um, and they identify with who that person was, right? Yeah. So yeah. my my adoptive mother, Laura, she was always watching. She was always observing, making sure things were okay and being this wonderful mother that she was. So it was appropriate that Laura was named after her. Uh, Charlie, uh, a little fixer, um, uh, a tinker, uh, somebody that actually worked on uh, the very early versions of the GPS satellites. Uh, that's John's dad. Uh, so it lined up. Same thing with uh, with Mike's uh, uh, past father-in-law. He was a guy that would get in big, high on a hunky, and uh, you know, get in there and fix things and um, take care of things. So there's a backstory by each one of them, and the reason being is that we wanted to try and humanize each of the Orbots, right? Uh, it's not, Rogue is not, um, we do, everybody says they do things differently, right? Every company is going to say, oh, we, you know, we do things different and we have a different culture and, and all this stuff. And, and a lot of times it's, it's kind of a line of, of BS, but with, with Rogue, we really do try to build a community. It's, we really don't like to refer to ourselves as a business or which we are, but uh, we really try to um, we really try to refer ourselves as a community because it's really what we are. Um, we try to bring in people and we cultivate this culture of community and cooperation. And we try to live up to the values that we actually put on the website, uh, where we put the ideas above self and. You know, we're not beyond reproach. I'm okay. It's okay that the CEO and founder of the company has a bad idea. That's okay. <laughs> it's okay for, and I, I actually saw Rob McPherson. He's actually a rogue guy. I'm surprised he's here. Um, Rob McPherson in the audience. It's okay to say, Jeremy, that's a stupid idea. We, we should not be doing that. It's okay because the mission and the goal of what we're on, what we're trying to do is expand and enable human capability in space. That is the mission. That's what we're focused on. That's what we're trying to achieve. And by, by focusing in that way and looking at it from an economic, looking at it as an economy, not a market, uh, and trying to help everyone and having the spirit of cooperation, that's, that's really how we're going to be successful in space. And I see Simon Reed out of D-Orbit. Um, Simon, I, I'm a little, I'm a little jealous of you guys right now, to be quite honest with you. You got two bill, two point one billion euros, man. I, I it, it's, I gotta tell you, it, I don't know if you guys know European Space Agency. Um, he, uh, they, uh, they're working with D-Orbit UK, and is giving them two point one billion dollars to help with the space debris problem. Uh, so this is, uh, it's pretty awesome. It's amazing. Congratulations. We got a few extra euros, send it over <laughs> here to the States, buddy. Uh, happy to give you guys a hand. Um, but, uh, that, that's, you know, we really do try to live these, these philosophies and 
we try to live that vision and we try to conduct ourselves within the greater space community in, in alignment with that. That's great. And uh, it sounds like that um, characterization of your company and the way you're going about things has resonated with AFRL. Tell us about yeah. that deal and where it's headed. Well, uh, we have a deal with AFRL to provide them a lot of data and analysis on the various um, on some tasks that we're trying to get up uh, and execute for them in space next year. Uh, we're trying to get on 20, uh, SCP-28 Bravo launch, may slide to uh, 28 Charlie or maybe something else. Frankly, we don't know. It's all kind of in flux. We, we know we're going up. We just don't know what ride we're getting yet. Um, we, we know the, there's a bus. We're just not sure which station we're going to or what <laughs> bus we're taking. Um, but that's the good news. Yeah, AFRL is uh, really, uh, and Space Force as a whole, is really pushing uh, and trying to drive advancement uh, for orbital services and debris uh, uh, removal capabilities. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's getting competitive internationally. There is some competition here in the States, but again, if uh, if we get lined up together and we work on this stuff together, it's gonna it's gonna help everybody. Great philosophy there as well. Um, talk about the development of the technology. Um, you know, you have sort of a mixed background in all sorts of different things, uh, but this guy at, at the MIT conference told you, "Hey, go with the robotics piece." Um, go go with it. Do you yeah. see? the uh, technology that you're developing now, having additional applications on the moon, going forward, other applications. Oh yeah. Yeah, I, I, you have, so. All right, so the, the way that we look at the technology development is that it's iterative. So it starts off with Lara, but all the tech that we're developing inside of Lara goes into Fred, goes into Charlie, goes into Bob, uh, there's actually a Bob. He's Who's not on Bob? here. Uh, Bob is just straight transport. He's pickup drop off. Um, he, he's yeah. He's that's he's the really big guy. Just, he's not necessarily big, but he can be scaled. But um, uh, yeah, he's just straight pickup drop off. Um, but all of the technology actually is foundational and starts off over here with Lara. So all that vision capability, all the AI, all that stuff goes and tracks into mm -hmm. subsequent versions and form factors. So we're not reinventing the wheel over and over and over again. And we're not going out there developing reaction wheels and flight computers. And we're not doing all that mess. We, we, take, we partner with Nano Avionics. Uh, we let them do what they do best, which is integrate uh, this type of technology. And then we focus very specifically on the technology that um, that we need to develop that enables us to deliver services because that's what Rogue really is. We're a services organization. We're not a spacecraft company. The, the, the spacecraft are nothing more than mechanisms and tools that allow us to deliver the debris removal service or the communication service or the orbit raising service and so on and so forth. Now you've just exposed your your technology background. <laughs> there you go. That's that's, that's what we do. So yeah, um, you know, I started off with uh, Thad and and Patriot. I did IT, and I oversaw some pretty major uh, AI projects and and some very large network engineering projects, and ran my own company for a while, and then dropped out of school and started this. So, you know, hey. Technically, I'm a college dropout, but nobody's really shaking a stick at me yet. So I, I guess I'm OK. Yeah. And tell me, you know, you didn't even though you're working on missiles, you know, not quite touching space. What drove you to decide to be an astropreneur instead of another tech venture, the next thing on Earth? So it, that's that's it's an interesting question. Um, it's a very good question. There's, and it has to do, there's a few factors that, that really came into this. The first one was 
everybody has when I was a little kid, right? Whenever I was a little boy, I wanted to do this, right? Everybody has that. So we're just going to skip that part. We're just going to move on because that's that's an assumption. Um, the second piece of this is that what I learned at that conference and, and through my studies and the research papers is that um, space is not a three, five, seven year play. It is a 10, 20, 50, 100 year type of business. And once you get there, once you have success, once you get on orbit, you're basically done. Yeah. You, you have that success that you can latch on to and um, you, can, you can really make some real life-changing types of money and advancements in the, in the industry. So I was really interested in a long-term play. The second piece of that is that through my research papers and my studies and things like that, we got asked a very fundamental question about what separates Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Richard Branson, what really separates them from us, okay, which is the average guy, the guy that's got to worry about getting his kids to school, the guy that's got to worry about getting his mortgage paid, cover his insurance, you know, pay for medical bills, you know, the people that are like me. What separates those guys, these billionaires from us? And the first answer is usually, well, several billions of dollars. That's what separates us. But that's not really what it is. The real separation is what the money enables and what it represents. And what that represents is freedom. Freedom to think about these big problems. Freedom to think about what do we do if an asteroid blows up Earth, where do we go? Uh, freedom to think about backup plans for the human species. Freedom to think about space debris. Freedom to think about these really huge, massive problems that we have as a species. They have that freedom because they have the money so that they're not worried about the car payment or their house payment or getting food on the table for the kids or getting their kids to school. They're not worried about that mess. So their cycles, they're freed up. So it's the freedom. And so after getting permission from my wife to have that kind of freedom, <laughs> um, she allowed me to start thinking about these problems and run off and just start a space company. Um, so that's how we actually got here is through a research paper and my wife saying, yes, Jeremy, you may put us in the poorhouse and this might fail miserably, but if we're going to fail, we're going to fail spectacularly huge. <laughs> and that's what we're doing. So we're going for it. We went big and you can't get much bigger than space. Sounds like uh, she needs to have a, a, a orbot named after her at some point. So. I think so. Yeah, I think she's uh, she's definitely earned her stripes in this endeavor so far. <laughs> well, so. you you're not surprised. Uh, uh, I've heard that a lot from people that I've talked to in this industry. Uh, there's there are a lot of spouses out there doing doing a lot of hard work, making sure that the they're the hardest working ones. I got to tell you, it, it, it's it's very true. They are the hardest working people in the space industry because. I don't know how she puts up with me and I sure as hell don't know how she puts up with, with everything that we got going on. So, um, it, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty, it's humble. It's a humbling experience. I'll put it to you like that. <laughs> well, Jeremy, it's been a great pleasure getting to know you a little bit and look forward to hearing Thanks. the update on your AFRL, uh, launch when it happens. Hey, that sounds fantastic. Thank you guys so much for having me. And if there's anyone, uh, um, if there's anyone that has questions, feel free to reach out to me, Jeremy, J-E-R-O-M-Y at rogue.space um, and I'm reachable on LinkedIn. So everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you. Hey, thank you all. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Space debris challenge. And if we go on to the next slide, um, the main challenge we're trying to address is that for the past, you know, since the beginning of the space age, past six decades or so, the, the global space industry has really been a disposable society. Uh, we've launched rockets and satellites and used them for a few years, and then we just throw them away and leave them up there. 
Um, so there is already quite a large population of space debris up there, and those things are starting to knock into each other and create more and more debris. Um, and uh, although aerodynamic drag will tend to lower the orbit of those satellites and eventually drag them out of, out of orbit, if they're above you know six or, or 700 kilometers, they're going to stay up there for hundreds and hundreds of years. So that trash doesn't just decay and go away for the most part. Um, and a big challenge or issue right now is that uh, a number of organizations and, and other countries are starting to uh, put up mega constellations, constellations of hundreds or thousands or even tens of thousands of satellites into low Earth orbit, uh, many of them all kind of rather packed close to each other. Uh, and that is already driving a uh, fairly explosive growth of the active space debris population, which is going to drive ex explosive growth of the space debris population. Um, and uh, unless we uh, uh, unless we start to get uh, a hold of this challenge now, um, it by the time it really becomes a huge issue, uh, it'll already be too late to clean it up. Uh, so really now is the time to act and be taking active measures both to mitigate the further growth of space debris and to start uh, doing active removal of existing space debris. The real challenge there from, from a business and governmental perspective is that nobody wants to foot the bill for cleaning up this, uh, this big waste problem. Uh, you know, there are, there's no government entity that is mandated to mandated and funded to address this problem. So nobody really wants to touch it with with anyone anywhere near a 10 foot pole. Um, there has been some progress uh, with with entities in other countries, um, mainly funded by those other countries to start developing and demonstrating some of these capabilities. But uh, really, we need a, a significant, sustained global effort to start to get a hold of this problem uh, in order to ensure the long term sustainability of low Earth operations for uh, US government, NASA, commercial space, and, and everybody else. So, uh, I'd like to talk about um, three areas where we have been working and are working. Uh, if you could scroll up to the next slide, please. Okay, solution overview. So uh, most of my talk, I'll talk about uh, work we've been doing on a affordable, uh, lightweight, fairly simple end of life deorbit solution called the Terminator Tape. Uh, and then I'll talk about new work we're doing on um, robotic systems to enable long-term sustainability of spacecraft, upgrading and repairing them. Uh, and then I'll talk about a, a somewhat longer term vision for how we might address that problem of no, nobody wanting to clean up the space debris problem by trying to turn that problem into an opportunity. Um, and I call that mining the orbital midden. Uh, so scroll down to the next slide, please. So the Terminator tape, uh, we, so we've been working on uh, end of life deorbit solutions for basically since the beginning of the company 27 years ago. Uh, we had fits and starts where we tried various uh, approaches and the early ones weren't, were not commercially successful um, in large part because we were too early for the market and nobody really needed to, needed them. Nobody had a requirement for them, so nobody wanted to pay anything for them. Um, but also the, our early solutions were probably too complex and too expensive. So about uh, 12 years ago, we, we took another look at the problem and came up, we tried to come up with kind of the simplest, stupidest solution that we could. Um, and so we came up with a Terminator tape and basically it's a box with some long, thin but wide conductive tape folded up into it and a release mechanism. Uh, so the idea is that this Terminator tape gets mounted to pretty much any surface of a spacecraft uh, prior to launch. And uh, during the spacecraft mission, it's, it's passive, inactive. When the mission is complete, uh, either the, the spacecraft or a timer system activates the module activating release mechanism, which pops open the box, the cover flies off and the momentum of the cover pulls out this conductive tape and everything stays stuck together. So we're not uh, creating a bit additional space debris. 
And what that uh, conductive tape does is it accelerates the orbital decay of the spacecraft through passive interactions with the space environment, generating enhanced drag through two different mechanisms. One is just by uh, creating a larger drag area for interaction with the neutral particles in space. So in greatly increasing the aerodynamic drag on the system. And then because it's conducting, it also interacts with the Earth's magnetic field and the conducting plasma in the, in the ionosphere to generate a little bit of current along that tether, which interacts with the Earth's magnetic field to, to act as a drag force, uh, helping to lower the orbit of the spacecraft. Um, so it, it's, it, again, it's really intended to be as simple, lightweight, low cost, low risk, solution as we come up with. And I think it's been fairly successful in that regard. Next slide, please. So the, the, uh, the basic theory behind how the Terminator tape works, um, again, as I said before, in, in part, it acts just as a, uh, a drag, uh, aerodynamic drag decelerator, providing a larger drag area uh, to uh, bump into neutral particles in, in the upper atmosphere but also it generates a little bit of electrodynamic drag. And because the tether is moving across the Earth's magnetic field, you get a uh, Lorentz uh, voltage induced along that tape so that the ends of the tape are biased relative to the ambient environment. So uh, a portion of the tape can collect electrons from the plasma in the ionosphere and then the other end of the tape, actually most of the tape will collect ions. So you can get a little bit of current flowing along that tape and that current interacts back with the magnetic field to give you a J cross B force, which opposes the motion of the spacecraft. Uh, so it's a drag force and helps to, to lower the orbit of the spacecraft. Um, now that, that performance is maximized through stable gravity gradient orientation. And the gravity gradient force naturally provides that. It pulls the tape out, tensions it, and, and helps to align it along the local vertical. Uh, but as, as uh, I'll get to in a few slides, when, when you get down to lower altitudes, the, the aerodynamic drag does tend to uh, dominate and causes the, the tether to, or the tape to swing um, back behind the spacecraft. Uh, but it still still produces a lot of drag. And by the time you get, get down to that region, you've already basically done the job. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so we have uh, qualified and flown uh, two different versions of it. Uh, so it's a very readily scalable solution. So we can make larger units. Uh, but th these are the two that so far we've qualified and flown on the left is the what we call the NSTT. It used to be called the Nanosat Terminator Tape, but most people are using it on Microsat, so that got confusing. So now we're just calling it the NSTT. Um, that unit is less than a kilogram, 830, 830 grams, um, and it has uh, flown on three spacecraft, as I'll talk about in a minute. And then the CSTT, which is intended for CubeSats and small Nanosats, uh, is uh, about the size of a drink coaster. It fits onto any side of a uh, standard CubeSat. Um, and two of those are on orbit as now as well. But as I said, it's a readily scalable solution. So we can uh, easily make larger and different configurations. Next slide, please. So as I said, we, uh, we have, um, so far, three of these units have been activated on orbit, and we're three for three with successful deployments. Uh, the first two launched were on um, sat uh, microsats built by the University Nanosat Research Program, funded by AFRL, on two satellites, one called NPSAT-1 and the other called PROX-1. Uh, both of those had uh, timer units that we also provided um, that were completely um, um, independent of the spacecraft. So the whole thing was just a bolt-on solution and they were set to activate the tape after a certain amount of time. Uh, the first one, PROX-1, it was uh, programmed to activate after uh, three months and it, and it did, as you can see in the graph there, kind of in the middle. Uh, the NPSAT unit was programmed to activate after 18 months and right on schedule it did uh, right around uh, Christmas last year. 
And you can see that once, once they deployed, the, the decay rate of the orbit ex uh, increased quite dramatically. Uh, both those satellites are up at about 700 kilometers altitude, 710. Uh, so they are going to take on the order of 10 to 10 to 12 years to completely deorbit. Uh, but that is less than the 25 years required, and it's much, much less than the hundreds or thousands of years they would have stayed up there uh, if they had no dry deorbit solution. Uh, more recently, uh, another unit was launched on an experiment called Drag Racer. Uh, Drag Racer was a collaborative uh, IR&D effort performed by Tethers Unlimited, Millennium Space Systems, uh, with help from Tricept and uh, Rocket Lab, who launched it. Uh, on the Drag Racer experiment, two identical spacecraft were launched. One was called Augury, and that had no Terminator tape. The other is called Alchemy, and that did have a Terminator tape. Um, and the purpose of this was to get really good um, uh, comparative data between with and without cases. Uh, so you can see in the graph on the right, um, the, the tape on Alchemy was deployed very soon after deployment from the rocket, and it immediately started deorbiting much, much faster than Alchemy satellite. Uh, and Alchemy actually, uh, sorry, than the Augury satellite. The Alchemy satellite actually completed its reentry uh, on the 19th of July of this year. Uh, so that was right around eight months after launch. Um, whereas current projections of the Augury satellite indicated it'll take somewhere around eight to 10 years to deorbit, uh, depending upon how the solar cycle goes. Uh, so you can see that the, the Terminator tape did, did produce a, a very significant uh, reduction in the uh, end of life deorbit time of that spacecraft. Both, both of these were deployed from deployed into 500 kilometer altitude orbits. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the, the Terminator tape is a, it's a completely passive device. So once we pop the release mechanism, there's no active elements, no electronics, no power, no control. Um, and what that means is it, it's, uh, it, it's basically like a parachute. Uh, so it is similar to um, some of the other drag solutions, such as uh, drag sails, drag skirts, uh, deployable panels, that sort of thing. Um, and, but I wanted to talk about, and, and the challenge there is that um, although you're reducing the, uh, the, the deorbit time for the spacecraft, you are increasing the collisional cross-section of the spacecraft when you deploy this tape or, or the other drag solutions. Um, so if you look at the traditional uh, comparison of what's called the area time product, the amount of time the spacecraft sent, spends in orbit and the area it sweeps out as it's uh, going around in orbit, the, these drag devices, um, the Terminator tape can reduce the, um, the area time product or the ATP somewhat, maybe 20 to 50%. Um, but really what's more significant, more important is that it is bringing it out of, out of orbit much more rapidly. And the issue there is if you only consider the area time product in, in your collision risk um, analyses, you may be forgetting the fact that the population of spacecraft in low Earth orbit is increasing very rapidly. Uh, so we've done some analyses uh, in this, this graph here shows uh, the results of some of those where we take into account uh, the fact that the population of spacecraft in low Earth orbit is expected to grow by uh, ten, you know, hundreds or hun tens to hundreds of thousands of objects over the next 10 to 20 years. Um, so you can, so the, in, on, on this graph, um, the dark black line shows a satellite deorbiting um, with a terminator tape. Um, so it comes down fairly rapidly. The gray line towards the bottom uh, shows the, um, the, the, uh, the, the same satellite, but without a drag device. And uh, the the dotted lines, uh, sorry, the dotted line uh, sh shows the deorbit of the uh, satellite without the drag tape. Um, the lower gray line is showing the cumulative collision risk of the case with the Terminator tape, and the dotted gray line is showing the cumulative collision risk 
of the satellite without a terminator tape. And even though the area time product uh, with the, the area of the terminator tape system can be larger or comparable, the cumulative risk can be a lot lower just because you're getting it down faster before the population of debris and active satellites gets to be too large. So that's uh, what we've been doing on Terminator tape. Um, again, it's intended to be a really low cost, uh, lightweight, simple solution. Um, now we're, we're starting to look at longer term and how do we help with the long term sustainability of, of both operations in low Earth orbit and sustainability sustainability of satellites. So next slide, please. Currently, we are starting work on a project called Gauntlet, where we are working to integrate uh, capability, we're, we're working to create a uh, low cost and lightweight robotic servicing payload for, uh, for spacecraft. Uh, so we uh, so over the past 10 years, we've been de developing robotic arms and connectors and sensors and, and various elements of this, as, as well as control software. And under Gauntlet, we're bringing them together to create a lightweight, low-cost payload that's designed to integrate onto a wide variety of different uh, existing satellite um, buses. So we can hopefully take existing heritage satellite buses and enable them to be transformed into a servicing capable spacecraft. Um, and the way this can address uh, space sustainability is it helps to address that throwaway culture of, of the space industry, where uh, instead of having spacecraft be depreciating assets that you put up and use for five, 10, 15 years and then throw away, you know, as their, as their value is decreasing, spacecraft can become appreciating assets, more like real estate, where once we get them up there, we can refuel them, we can upgrade them, add on, add on additional capabilities, and they be, can become assets that uh, appreciate, grow in value and capability over time. Uh, so again, DIU is a, is a new effort funded by DIU where we're gonna be putting together this uh, payload and hopefully working towards a demonstration of its capabilities within the next three years. Next slide. And then to go back to that challenge of how do we clean up the existing space debris when nobody wants to pay for it, uh, we're looking at uh, kind of an end around to this problem where can, we're looking at the challenge of can we turn space debris into a resource that we could use to create things of value that could be sold and then, uh, then enable a commercial effort to actually go and collect space debris, turn them into antennas or uh, habitats or, or whatever, and sell them and create a and produce a profit at it. Uh, so we don't need to have to go to the government and ask for you know billions of dollars to clean up the existing space debris. Uh, a big challenge in collecting space debris is that all these satellites and objects are in <clears throat> a wide variety of different orbits. And to be able to go around to all these different orbits, particularly changing inclination is extremely expensive if you're using a propellant based thruster. Uh, it's basically not, not affordable um, unless you're using an incredibly high ISP electric propulsion system that's gonna take forever to do it. Um, so we are exploring the, the viability of using electrodynamic tethers, uh, which work kind of opposite to how the Terminator tape works, but instead of doing passive drag against Earth's magnetic field. We're using power from uh, solar cells to drive a current along the tether and push against the Earth's magnetic field to raise or lower the orbit of the spacecraft and change its inclination and other orbital elements. Um, so, so we're looking at, you know, how, it, how do we put together a system like that? Um, how much would it cost? How quickly could it go around and visit these various objects and collect them? Um, and can we bring them together into kind of a, a, a trash pile or a midden that a recycling system could go and munch them up and uh, spit out um, feedstock for new kinds of in-space manufacturing capabilities to make, again, antennas or space habitats or whatever. Uh, so that's, that's a new uh, longer term effort that we're, we're just starting out. Um, but that, you know, that's one of the ways we're looking to help help the long-term space sustainability. And the last slide, please. 
uh, I think the last slide is, yeah, just my summary slide. So again, Terminator tape, it's, it's now flight proven. We're three for three successful deployments and we have one complete uh, deorbit under our belt. <clears throat> and it's a, a very affordable, lightweight solution. Uh, we're working on these uh, ro robotics as well as modular spacecraft architectures to enable spacecraft to become sustainable, appreciating, uh, appreciating systems. And then we're looking at uh, how can we take, uh, how can we turn the space debris problem into an opportunity and a resource for future space infrastructure. So thanks very much for your attention. Any questions? Yeah, I'm curious how you determined the length and width of the Terminator tape. Uh, so we deliberately keep the the length of the tape uh, to be under 100 meters, typically. Uh, and that's partially driven by the fact that when uh, Space Command and other folks do conjunction analyses, you know, looking at the probability of uh, two spacecraft colliding, they tip, those spacecraft typically have an uncertainty envelope that's typically on the order of 300 meters. Uh, so we didn't want to make those people have to change the way they do those analyses. So we try to keep the tape relatively short. Um, and then the width is basically driven by, you know, how much footprint we can have on the spacecraft mm -hmm. um, and, you know, how we package it and, and how much mass the, the satellite is satellite integrator is willing to give us. Uh, so the, the ones that have flown so far have been 70 meters long and about uh, 15 or 16 centimeters wide. Yeah, so less about the actual functioning of the electrodynamics, but more about just logistics. Yeah, we could, we could bring it down much faster if we had a much longer tape. <laughs> sure. Um, but then, you know, if you start having kilometer long scale tapes, people who already have active satellites up there start to get more more and more concerned and you know so so we we try to keep it short so it won't be a collision concern for most people yeah uh, talk a little bit about you you sold tethers unlimited uh what almost a year ago a little over uh, a year ago yep a little over a year ago and um tell us how that's going and then about partnerships uh, several of our other speakers have talked about partnering with other companies Tell us about how you've approached that since you've been, you're a little more seasoned in, in that. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, we started Tethers Unlimited 27 years ago. Uh, and most of that time we were a small business. We did a lot of our early stage development of these technologies and others under uh, NASA and DOD SBIR contracts. Uh, we, we were never, I guess we were too early to get all the VC money that's now being thrown around willy nilly. Uh, so we did this all organically growing through getting contracts and uh, selling products and delivering them and getting revenue from that. Uh, but then uh, a little over a year ago, May of 2020, uh, we were acquired uh, by a company that's now called ARCA, A-R-K-A. Their website is ARKA.org. Um, they uh, also Previously, they had purchased Emergent Technologies, which is a ground station modem company. Uh, and last fall, they acquired Danbury Mission Technologies, which is a uh, medium uh, size enterprise that produces high precision optics for space systems. Um, so, so we have two sibling companies um, and it, it's, it's definitely a change. It's definitely interesting. We're no, no, long, no longer able to go after SBIRs, which is, um, you know, a little frustrating, but we are uh, now, we are having some success both selling our products into bigger programs. And we've, we've landed a few um, spacecraft missions, experiment de demonstration missions of our own uh, that we're going to go perform. So, uh, we're you know we're we're in the process of, of stepping up from being a being a small business to to being a part part of a you know medium sized enterprise. Um, you know there, there's there's ups you know pluses and minuses there a little, a little bit more um, process and and structure, um, but we're still having fun at what we do. Uh, and then in terms of t teaming, um, that that also has been been really important. What I didn't really understand early in the early in my career, early in our 
company's history was, you know, the importance of um, getting in with a with a big prime uh, and, you know, becoming a trusted partner of them and, and working with them to develop and and transition new technologies. Uh, so we've, we've done a much better job of that over the past 10 years. Uh, and, and now we work with a wide variety of big, small and, and medium sized primes, um, both as a, a parts vendor, as a um, R&D partner. And, and sometimes we're sometimes we're the prime and, and they're the they're the sub. So. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure as a new entrepreneur, as such a leader early in this economy to to solve those puzzles um, has been really helpful to others who are following your footsteps. Um, we have a question in the chat. Uh, Rob, are you looking at electrodynamic tethers for propellantless orbital station keeping and maneuvering? Yeah, we've done a fair amount of work on that over the years. Um, and and as the main, main thing we're looking at right now is is that if, is that effort looking at using that for collecting space debris. Um, we, we previously have done a number of studies and even built prototype hardware of systems uh, for electrodynamic maneuvering of spacecraft. Um, we haven't haven't yet uh, gotten that all the way to flight, uh, but I'm, I'm still hopeful that we'll get to do that before too long. And to close out, tell me, um, you've put Terminator tape in space, it's demonstrated, um, but still nobody wants to pay to have their own satellites deorbited yet. Tell me when you think the turning point is coming. I, I, think, I think it's coming uh, fairly soon. Um, you know, the, these, the SpaceX's, OneWeb's, uh, the South Korean company, you know, a lot of people are starting to put up very large constellations and, you know, they're, they're working hard to make their satellites very reliable. And I think most of the time they are baselining the plan to use their onboard thrusters to deorbit the spacecraft at end of life. Um, and that, that'll be great, but that only works if the spacecraft is actually operating, you know, has, if it's wheels, conk out or it's radio dies or whatever, you're not going to be able to point it in the right direction and to, to thrust to bring it down. So we, we definitely see an opportunity or getting increased interest in Terminator tape as primarily a backup yeah. uh, end of life to orbit solution, just to make sure that those satellites get down quickly out of their operational constellations, because, you know, with tens of thousands of satellites in a, in a narrow altitude band, just having one dead satellite wandering through your constellation is a big operational headache and, and a significant operating cost. So I, I think that, you know, as those systems, uh, you know, get online and uh, progress there, those, those folks are starting to look at how they're going to address that problem long term. Great. Thank you so very much for returning and sharing more of your story. Sure. Thanks for having me here. Thanks for everyone for paying attention. <laughs> All right, our next speaker is Toby Harris. He is the Global Head of Space Situational Awareness at AstroScale UK and Europe. He's responsible for ensuring SSA needs for current and future missions and for developing and implementing AstroScale's SSA strategy. Toby was previously Head of Orbital Systems with the Chief Engineer's Office at the UK Space Agency where he oversaw technical aspects of licensing UK spacecraft, helped develop the UK licensing process and UK spaceflight policies, and supported the creation of the 2018 Space Industry Bill. Toby has headed the UK delegation to UN COPUS, Scientific and Technical Subcommittee, and represented the UK as policy lead for the Interagency Debris Coordination Committee. Thank you for being here, Toby, and uh, sharing your presentation across multiple space debris conferences, even this week. Thank you. Yeah, I think I've got six of them or something like that, but they're all <laughs> slightly different. They're all tailored to, to who I'm speaking to. So hopefully there'll be something different in each one. Um, brilliant. So shall I share my screen in that case? I'll let you know when we can see it.
it's up and not yet in great. presentation mode. There it is. Looks great. Brilliant. Okay, so um, as Lee said, I'm head of SSA at um, AstraScale. I've uh, been there since November. Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about Elsa D, um, our recent spacecraft launched um, uh, to, to test some demonstration technologies, and also um, how that particular mission is going to um, help develop some of our SSA capabilities in the future. So just a brief introduction to AstroScale for those of you who haven't heard of us before. Uh, we're a commercial venture with a focus on space sustainability. Um, our mission is to develop new technologies and advanced business cases, um, look at international policies with the goal of trying to reduce all the debris and trying to support the long-term use of space. And obviously our vision is, is in line with that, securing safe, sustainable development space um, for the future. And space situational awareness plays an important role in AstroScales in our missions and what we intend to do in the future for two main reasons. First of all, we need space situational awareness to meet our mission goals. Uh, we can't perform our missions without having that capability, and I'll explain to you why shortly. Um, and then secondly, we want to be able to use the missions that we're developing, uh, not just for active debris removal or end of life services, but also to look at how they can contribute to space situational awareness um, and missions. So I'll give you a quick overview of the type of missions that AstroScale are currently involved in. It's quite a busy slide, so I'll, I'll work through it kind of slowly. Um, so we're an international company, AstroScale. We're based in the UK, in the US, Israel, Japan, um, and Singapore. Um, we have subsidiaries all over the place. Um, and each area is, is kind of developing uh, missions in parallel of one another, focusing on slightly different areas. Um, so in the UK, for example, and Japan, we've been working on LCD, or rather have been working on LCD, which was recently launched in March. Again, I'll speak about that in a bit more detail in a second. Also in the UK, we're currently working on a UK space agency funded active debris removal mission. So it's early phase zero, phase A uh, study at the moment, with the goal of developing a further mission in 2025. Also in the UK, we're looking at what's called ELSA-M. So ELSA is, ELSA-D is the demonstration mission. Following on for that is the ELSA-M, which is a multi-client mission. Um, this will be subsequent to um, the success of the ELSA-D mission and will basically involve um, us working alongside OneWeb and ESA to look at actually deorbiting uh, or performing an in-orbit demonstration mission of deorbiting a, um, a spacecraft. In Japan, we're currently looking at the Address J mission, which is an inspection mission. So the goal here is to actually go up to a defunct Japanese H2A upper stage um, and then inspect the rocket, the, the body itself um, as part of this uh, CRD2 JAXA funded project. And that will be launching in 2023. And then following on from that will be Address J2, we hope, which will be the actual deorbit of this rocket body. So rather than just going up and inspecting it, the service will go up there. Uh, capture it using some sort of mechanism and then deorbit the whole rocket body um, into the atmosphere. But in the US, the focus is mainly on life extension in GEO. So in Japan and the UK, the focus is on LEO, whilst in the US, we're looking more at GEO. Um, and this is uh, the development of our Alexi spacecraft. Um, and this is um, supported by um, Astroscale Israel, who were actually originally effective space and bought out by Astroscale um, a couple of years ago. And the goal is to launch our first life extension mission in 2023 to go to geosynchronous orbit and stay there for about five years, extending the, the life of a, of a client up there. As well as the, uh, the missions themselves, we're also developing our national in-orbit servicing um, operations facility uh, in Harwell, just a few miles from me in the UK. And then in the US, uh, sorry, in Japan, we're also developing our ground segment uh, with the Tosuka ground station in Yokohama. So Elsa D, I mentioned it a few times. We like to think of it as the world's first end of life demonstration mission. Now there's a subtle difference between end of life and active debris removal. Active debris removal is generally the idea of going up to a random piece of junk that's up there, grabbing onto it somehow, and then removing it from orbit. End of life is where a spacecraft has been pre-prepared in advance. Uh, to be deorbited. So it might have some sort of docking plate attached to it or some sort of mechanism that enables it to be captured. Um, so it doesn't require 
uh, a robotic arm or a net or some other um, abstract um, system, it would be designed to be removed. And so it would have to be um, done in advance of the launch. So LCD is actually demonstrating technologies for both active debris removal and end of life demonstration. But the goal is to follow on to this LTRM, which would be an end of life mission. Um, so the, the mission itself consists of two spacecraft, the servicer and a client. Um, there's a ferromagnetic docking plate, which is on the servicer and connected to the client. So the two spacecraft are currently um, launched together. Uh, it was successfully launched on March 22nd, designed to explore a number of different uh, key operations for an end of life service. So including client search, inspection, capture reorbit, and then end of life deorbit. It's licensed for the UK Space Agency, includes a number of partners, including uh, UK-based companies such as SSTL, as well as GMB, CGI, Rear, and various others. And it's going to currently being operated um, at the, at the um, National Orbit Servicing Control Centre at the Catapult. So just to give a quick run through of the LCD mission itself, uh, there's quite a number of phases to it, seven phases, um, and there's sort of three, well, there's now four because phase three has been split. There are these four demonstration phases, which are kind of sort of the meat of the mission, as it were. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about where we are at the moment in just a second. But for the time being, uh, we have the LEOPS phase, we have the phase, uh, the commissioning phase, and we have phase 3A, which is a simple manual capture of the target. So initially, the two spacecraft are got together at the moment. Um, and what would happen in phase 3A is the, the, uh, the, the, the target would simply be detached and then recaptured again. I'll talk about that in a second. Phase 3B, which will be subsequent to that, um, involves the disconnection of the target um, and then reconnection again, but with a certain distance between the two, and it would involve onboard autonomy of the spacecraft as well. Um, again, I'll talk about it in a little bit more detail in a second. Phase 4 is kind of the next step, the slightly more advanced uh, mission. So in this case, the, the spacecraft can be separated, and then the target spacecraft uh, would actually be put into a tumble motion. So it'd be rotating about a spin axis. And then the goal then is to actually maneuver the, the, the spacecraft, the servicer to the client and actually move it into a local orbit about that tumbling object. So it's quite a complicated uh, bit of um, guidance and navigation to ensure that it does this. We call it dance maneuver, where it's actually moving around um, in a local orbit about that object, at which point it will then connect and dock with the spacecraft together. And then the final demonstration, phase five, um, it's kind of like everything put together where we would disconnect, we'd put it into a tumble and actually we would try and lose the target. So the, the servicer would move into a different orbit, uh, only a slightly different orbit, uh, move a certain distance away. Um, and then it would rely on its, um, on its uh, uh, relative navigation equipment and onboard sensors to find the target, move maneuver into the uh, range of it, perform the dance maneuver to try and um, synchronize itself with the target and then dock with it uh, to complete the mission. And so at the end of that, uh, once all those, those mission phases are completed, uh, it will perform a descent burn um, and then naturally decay into the Earth's atmosphere over a number of years um, and then pass away. So where are we at the moment? So um, obviously we've launched, so pre-launch is all done dusted. Phase one with the, uh, the launch and early operation phase. So there, there was no problems there either. Um, we had good signal acquisition, solar array deployment, um, and the orbit was uh, successfully injected into the correct area. Uh, just for, just for, the, for those in the know, 550 kilometers sun synchronous is very, very close to the Starlink constellation. I think it's just a few kilometers away. Um, and so we've, we've made sure we've coordinated with those, uh, those spacecraft and others in those kind of orbits. Um, and then for the most part of the last uh, four months, we've been doing the commissioning phases. So testing in place of the ground segment, ensuring the subsystems are calibrated and ensuring the client's activated okay. We just recently completed the phase 3A demonstration on August 26th, and we are now currently looking at when to do the phase 3B demo. And so I've kind of talked about this in a little, a little bit of detail already, uh, just a bit, more, a bit more information there. So on August 26th, the, uh, the client was separated from the service for the first time, um, and it was manually captured. So this means that it wasn't using the onboard software to do it. It was doing it through, purely through um, the telemetry, telecommands from the ground segment. Um, and so during this mission, during this particular demonstration, uh, we checked out and calibrated the rendezvous sensors. 
and then we verified the relevant ground systems infrastructure and the operating procedures. Phase 3B, which will be hopefully in the next month or so, uh, will be something very similar, but the distance will be greater. So this one, it only lasted literally 15 seconds or so, this particular demonstration. The next one will be quite a bit longer than that. There'll be a large distance between the two. And we're actually hoping that from a ground-based um, observation perspective, we'll be able to see separation between the two objects as well. Um, and this time it will be using the onboard autonomous software to actually uh, dock with the target. So it won't rely just on ground telemetry. And the reason is um, when you're relying on ground telemetry and telecommands, you have to wait for a pass um, and you only have a few passes per orbit. Uh, we actually have a total of 12 or 16 ground stations um, for these missions. So we've got uh, as much coverage as we feasibly can get for this type of mission. Normal missions don't have nearly as many ground stations. So we have got quite a lot of past coverage, uh, but what we'd like to do is try and to uh, use that as a redundant capability and try and do as much of this uh, work on board using autonomous software as possible. Okay, so how does this relate to space situational awareness? So any mission, SSA is fundamentally important. The rendezvous and proximity operation missions such as LTD also have significant um, additional needs. Um, and actually any mission involving a second spacecraft in close proximity will sort of need these additional um, SSA capabilities. And we want to try and use LCD to try and explore what those capabilities need to be and how we can access those, those, um, those, those needs as it were. So I won't go through this table in too much detail. This is kind of a work in progress to try and understand what kind of accuracy and precision and frequency of data we need uh, for space situational awareness. And I've kind of sort of labeled different color coding there. So blue is basically indicating this is a kind of a standard SSA product, as it were, that most missions require. So understanding where your spacecraft is. So in this case, the service to state and also providing collision avoidance um, capabilities. So using an SSA provider to screen against other objects in the orbital environment. And then we also have launch collision avoidance for the initial launch phase and space weather analysis if, for example, that was something that might be an issue for the mission or something that's important um, in terms of scientific study. The orange ones there are ones that are more focused on the wrong they're doing proximity uh, mission itself. So the client state, where that client is um, in relation to the, the, the servicer itself, it becomes less important when they're in close proximity because you're using relative navigation on board the spacecraft. But when they're further away, you need SSA to try and know where you're heading to if you're moving between orbits, for example. Also, another important one, less important for LCD, but for other space missions in the future, particularly active debris removal, is looking at the attitude rate of the climb. If it's spinning in an unstable or quick rotation, then it might be a very difficult object to um, capture. And so that's one of the things we need to understand about it. Um, and so that's where SSA can play a part. And then also the collision avoidance when you're in close proximity to another object also needs some subtle um, uh, understanding of how that should work. Uh, when you're moving around, perhaps performing a collision avoidance, uh, or you have an, a conjunction warning just before you're about to do a demonstration or during the demonstration, you need to be clear on how the processes are, are set out for that kind of event. So these are all the kind of things that we're sort of looking at at the moment. And so we want to be able to try and meet some of these um, RPO SSA needs, and we want to use LCD to try and do some of that. Um, so at the moment, LCD is providing us with lots of interesting ground truth measurements. Um, we have the GPS position and we have the attitude and tumble rate, so that's telemetry from the spacecraft. Uh, and we also have access to other data that's either derived from that or might be considered um, specific um, state data from, for example, laser ranging stations. Um, so we have also, as well as that, the, the burn and maneuver schedule of the spacecraft. So we have quite a lot of what I consider ground truth measurements of the spacecraft. What we want to be able to try and do is combine that with SSA observations from existing systems or novel ground-based sensors and even space-based sensors and basically try and validate novel systems, trying to work out whether we can calibrate sensors for these kind of missions and develop new capabilities for RPO missions. Now, at the moment, it's pretty much business as usual, but in the future, when we're doing these sort of phase four and five demonstrations, where spacecraft are moving apart, moving together and doing these dance maneuvers, it's going to be quite interesting to see how the ground-based systems reflect what's actually happening for ground truth. And so just a, a quick aside here, um, in, in terms of our ground-based SST COLA support, so obviously space safety is top priority in, in developing the uh, LCD mission. 
Um, so we perform conjunction analysis and coordinate and share data with various other spacecraft operators and SSA service providers. We currently work with ESA and the 18th Space Control Squadron, as well as um, liaise with NASA and also have a contract with SpaceNav providing us advanced SSA information. That's particularly important given the orbit where we're in, the rather large amount of traffic of other spacecraft in the area. Uh, we need to be clear that when, we, when we're doing these demonstrations, uh, that it's safe to do so. So at the moment, we are in almost like a stage of trying to gather SSA data, help calibrate those SSA service providers um, so we can begin to use this information when we actually perform the demonstration phases. Um, so we've been using um, space track data through the 18th Space Control Squadron. We've been uh, working with Leo Labs, um, EUSST and AGI ComSpoc um, to use their observations and to use our telemetry uh, to understand more about um, you know, how, the, how this mission is going to look like in the future and how we can use their services or develop their services to support these kind of missions. And this is going to be particularly important for us as we look to the future with the Address J mission, actually removing a uh, rocket body, and then the UKSA ADR mission, again, which will be looking to remove a defunct UK spacecraft. As well as uh, radar observations, we've been liaising with the International Laser Ranging Service and the Austrian Academy of Science at GRAS, uh, and they've been providing us both satellite laser ranging observations as well as light curve data. Um, and the light curve and photometry data is quite interesting. It's one of the things that we are keen to um, explore more in the future. As I said, one of our key um, sort of client SSA requirements is understanding the tumble rate of the target. So understanding how these defunct objects are moving um, in advance of launch and also taking observations before launch and then predicting what that tumble rate might look like when the spacecraft's actually there, because it might be six months, it might be a year between when the observations are made and when the spacecraft actually gets to its target um, will be quite important. So this is another area that we're really keen to explore. We've also been working with a company called Share My Space, based in France, who've been doing some similar LEO optical observations. Um, they're currently calibrating for photometry, and you've kind of got an image there on the left of a short streak of Elsa D crossing the night sky from the 18th of July. Um, and again, this is, this is trying to understand how we can use their capabilities in the future, perhaps calibrating against LCD um, and to understand how it can be used for future missions as well. As well as doing ground-based work, we've also been working with a company called HA Robotics in Australia to look at space-based imagery. Uh, and they're actually using a novel approach to imaging objects in orbit using um, Earth observation cameras, observing spacecraft as it flies past. Um, and so this takes quite a bit of ingenuity and timing and image processing. Um, and they recently captured an image of Elsa D. So in here in the sort of 60 frame video, um, as it sort of scooted past at relatively slow 45 meters per second, uh, which is, which is uh, phenomenally slow given how fast most of these objects move past one another. We're kind of interested in this for two reasons, mainly because we want to look at whether we can use space-based resolved imagery to observe potential future active debris removal targets. So identifying the craft condition, any structures that might be used for load bearing, any anomalies that might make the target difficult to um, capture or attach onto. And we also want to use this for transparency and confidence building. Um, RPO missions, obviously there's, there's a very gray area between civil activities involving rendezvous and proximity and also um, the sort of counter space type um, area as well. And so being able to observe the missions as they happen uh, in using resolved imagery or using space-based capabilities is something that we'd be keen to um, investigate further as a way of trying to provide that third party reassurance of what our missions are all about. And finally, we're also looking at whether we can use the cameras on board LCD. Um, these are basically visual cameras used for um, like I said, relative navigation and pose estimation of the target, but whether we can use them for broader SSA purposes. Can they capture objects in geo? Can they capture objects moving around? Um, and can we use that to augment ground-based sensors? So this is something where we're kind of trying to repurpose the existing sensors and perhaps understand how they could be modified or augmented in the future to provide a, a, almost like an SSA platform as a secondary purpose for the mission. Um, and this kind of um, also extends the idea of almost like a, 
uh, a distributed architecture of in-orbit SSA satellites. If everyone has a camera on, you can use that to augment ground-based networks and provide a much better view of what's happening in space. And we're working closely with ESA on this to see how we can uh, develop this capability. And so that's my summary. I think that's about all from me. So basically, just in summary, obviously we recognize the importance of SSA to RPO missions, particularly ADR and end of life. Uh, we're still developing SSA requirements for future missions, and we're trying to use LCD as much as possible to support this. Um, and we're also very keen to collaborate with both SSA service providers and other spacecraft operators to help uh, better understand this. Um, and finally, we're trying to use the capabilities on board the spacecraft on LCD and in future LCRM and Address J to see whether we can repurpose those instruments to support um, in situ SSA. Um, and I think that's about it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we've heard throughout the day a little bit about uh, where things are, solutions for specific capture and recycling mechanisms, but to have it placed in this overarching presentation about what space situational awareness is and encompasses, uh, as well as to know the broader scope of Astroscale's mission is really helpful um, in understanding the big picture about the space debris problem. So thank you very much. No problem. Um, we talked earlier today also about the legalities, the difficult situation when you're, you're pulling down something, deorbiting something that um, may have questionable ownership or, or isn't <laughs> directly owned by the entity working on it. Talk about what you needed to do from a legal standpoint to prepare for the LCM mission. Um, you know, whose rocket body is that? And, um, you know, what, what permissions did you need to get or are you working on getting for that mission? Yeah, sure. The, the, the legal issue is always uh, very tricky. I remember working on some of these legal issues when I was at the space agency. Um, and I'm quite glad I'm on the other side of the table now, actually, because it's not <laughs> trivial by any means. Um, so LCD is obviously very trivial because they're both our spacecraft. So there's no problems there. Any liability and what have you is, is purely on, um, on Astro scale. LCRM is um, it's a partnership with OneWeb and through ESA and funded by UK Space Agency. So that's going to involve um, a contractual agreement with OneWeb, um, who are technically licensed by the UK Space Agency. Um, and so from a liability point of view, it's, it's basically a single nation, so it shouldn't be too much of an issue. I think that's, again... Uh, where, where you know, things can become, become quite complicated when you're involving international uh, liability issues and international um, problems, potentially. Um, and with Address J, which is going to be um, Astroscale's the orbit of a Japanese rocket body. Again, um, the mission is likely to be licensed through JAXA. Uh, it's a Japanese rocket body. And so hopefully there shouldn't be any too many issues with that either. Again, if something goes wrong, um, it's going to be on um, on Japan ultimately to um, to you know be accountable for that um, and also Astroscale Japan as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think the real problem comes when you'll start talking about service uh, that involves um, you know a, another company from another nation. Um, there will be contractual agreements you'll have to have between the commercial entities, um, and then there'll potentially have to be. Um, MOUs between the, the, the licensing nations as well, or some sort of agreement there as well. Um, certainly, it can become very, very complicated when you're involving a third party, or in fact, even, even a fourth party into to, to, to mix as well. Um, and so I think in the future, when we're looking at ADR missions of um, third party objects, perhaps ones with um, ambiguous ownership, is going to be very, very difficult. Uh, obviously, in space, everything is technically owned, although it's it's not necessarily clear who owns what sometimes, particularly after fragmentation. Um, and so these are the kind of things that have to be worked through, at, I guess, not just the national level. I know that UK Space Agency is doing some work on this, but I think international agreements can be key on this. Great. And uh, Michael Lane had a great question about some of the acquisitions that you've made. You talked a lot about partnerships. Uh, in executing the work and sounds like you're drawing a little bit of those into a vertical integration system. So talk a little bit about your investment criteria for acquisitions um, and where you see that going forward. 
Okay, uh, I will do my best. That's a little bit out of my, my <laughs> remit of knowledge. A little there. out of your window. <laughs> so I certainly know that um, Effective Space, who are based in Israel, were developing a life extension spacecraft. I can't remember the name at the time. Um, and this was in an area that we felt would complement the, um, the active debris removal and end of life um, uh, capabilities that we're developing already. And that's where I think um, that the, the idea that we would then almost partner with, um, or, or, well, buy out, I guess, eventually, um, effective space and make that part of Astroscale US. And I think that is that was also part of in light of the, the MEV mission by Northrop Grumman um, in the US. And so I think the idea was to almost um, work alongside that mission and, and, and develop capabilities in the US there. I think from uh, UK and Japan side, um, I don't think we've made any recent acquisitions as of yet. Um, and whether or when we're going to make any acquisitions, I'm, I'm not sure. Again, that's a little bit outside of my, my remit of knowledge, but, you know, we, we, we'll just have to wait and see, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for the attempt at it. Appreciate it. Um, <laughs> you, you talked a little bit about in the mission about driving policy. Um, and this ties back to talking to the public, Astro Scale. You, you said you're giving six presentations. <laughs> um, we, you have a podcast, not you, but Astro Scale has a podcast to talk about these issues. Why is public engagement important to the space debris problem? I mean, I think um, in some ways it has a parallel to, to climate change, I guess. You've probably heard that before, and it, I think it's quite true in some ways. In one way, they're very different problems, but in some ways there is a, a common, certainly from a policy point of view and a public engagement point of view. Um, you know, once you get a critical mass of people saying this is a problem, something needs to be done about it, that's when governments tend to step up and do something about it. And I think there are conscious efforts at the moment in the international community to do something about the space debris problem. And again, it does parallel climate change in that way. Everyone needs to do their part. It is a global problem. Um, I think the difference with space debris is that it's less impactful on people in their general lives. Space debris, you hear about it on the news every now and then, but it's not something that's going to affect your day-to-day -day life. Uh, whilst potentially climate change, as we've seen recently with, with floods and various other bits and pieces, really does. Um, so I think it's really important to make sure that people are aware that it is a problem, even though if it's not right in their face every day, it is something, again, a bit like climate change. It's something that we can fix really, well, much easier now than sort of 10 or 20 years down the line when we've had one or two more significant collisions uh, which are causing havoc up there. So I think it's really important to, to keep that public engagement going uh, and make people as aware as possible that, of the, the potential future issues. Great points. Thank you. And it sounds like uh, with the address J and Elsa M, there will be some spectacular shows in the sky coming up. Can we get alerts on our phone for when to look into the sky at night? <laughs> we do have a um, we do have a map on our website actually that shows where Elsa B is at the time. Um, and I think there will be some communications about when we're doing these demos. So hopefully, if you've got a telescope that can track a Leo spacecraft. And uh, then look out for those those announcements and perhaps you'll be able to see a couple of dots move away from another and then join again. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here today, Toby. Really appreciate no problem. your time. Thanks for inviting me. All right. Our next speaker is from Scout Space that's actually working on some of the similar things uh, in imaging that were shown in Toby's presentation. Uh, he is the CTO of SCOUT, which is providing space-based situational awareness and a new way to maintain custody of this space environment. His team is flying vision systems into space, which provide scalable and prol proliferated insights on objects in orbit at a fidelity up to 1,000 times better than what we can achieve from the ground. Sergio has a history of using model-based systems engineering to drive innovation in small satellites, advanced propulsion, and spacecraft space environment interactions, R&D. Sergio lost a satellite in 2017 under the current space situa situa situational awareness paradigm and seeks to make spaceflight more reliable and transparent. He brought the first commercial space-based situational awareness vision system from concept to orbit in less than nine months 
and is using his multidisciplinary background to enable a more prosperous and sustainable space ecosystem. He's deeply embedded in the space startup landscape and was employee number one at Deep Space Industries. Sergio, thanks for being here. Thank you, Lee. Um, and uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, so I, yeah, I've been I've been all all around uh, this ecosystem, and everything that I'm hearing uh, today, you know, reflects a lot of what we have conversations about within our team, within our collaborators. And space situation awareness is something that is all encompassing um, mm -hmm. for kind of a roadmap forward. My uh, kind of plan of action here for uh, for this conversation is a little bit casual. I'm going to kind of talk about a lot of problems. Uh, kind of just scope things out at a, at a very high level um, and just kind of discuss uh, how how things fit together, how, um, you know, this landscape kind of comes together and, and kind of draw some connect connections between uh, different phases of operations and different elements of our uh, kind of space operations uh, ecosystem. So the the kind of core of it uh, that I want to preface with is that as Scout, my team sees it, uh, spacecraft today are flying blind in a very literal sense in an uncertain environment where assets that are worth billions can be lost without anyone knowing how or who's at fault. And we're also um, in, a, in a very challenging position because we're, we're at an inflection point of growth and also one where we're starting to see the effects of that growth actually uh, represent themselves in uh, clear and active kind of threats to our livelihood. Uh, this is what you could call the, the Wild West phase right before uh, the federal government started rolling in and kind of reorganizing everything. Um, this is a, a good and a bad thing uh, because it feels like things are finally coming to uh, a head and finally getting organized where people can actually enact um, the ability to do things more easily uh, and uh, st set standards in space uh, for kind of safeguarding it. But also um, it's, it's tough because that means that some, you know, bad things can be happening and are, are kind of happening on an ongoing basis uh, in orbit that, that do present uh, kind of concerns for a lot of people. So uh, I'll probably just stick to this, this slide for a lot of, a lot of the discussion because uh, this is kind of the core of what I'm getting at here. Uh, I'm going to talk about space congestion, space conjunctions, uh, which anyone that's operated a satellite has had to deal with at some point. I'm uh, going to talk a bit about the space debris environment um, and kind of add on a couple of bits to uh, to what's recently been discussed as well on that. Um, going to talk about opportunities being discovered and pursued within that space and kind of the roadmap to get there. And uh, I'll also talk a little bit about Scout and the fundamental capabilities we believe are required to make space safer and make space the place where we're doing business uh, like satellite uh, servicing, debris mitigation, recycling of, of objects in orbit. Um, and I'll also talk about how, how we're gonna get to that future uh, in a general sense. I wanna talk a little bit about the space ecosystem, new space, uh, how startups fit into the picture. So the space industry is reliant on two primary pillars, uh, financing and data. That's very big generalization, but data can be anything. It can be ESPN. It can be uh, oversight of, of infrastructure. It can be GPS. Uh, it can be whatever whatever it is. It's data. It can be astronauts gathering information on how to, you know, change change the world um, with a biological system. But in the future, there will be new things added onto that. Uh, there's going to be tourism. There's going to be an import export economy. Uh, there's going to even be immigration. But today, we have data systems and we have the money that it takes to keep them up there. And a lot of it just kind of falls out of those, everything falls out of those two elements. Um, why that's important is because uh, really the data itself has to be paid for in some way. It all comes back to financing. And it's something that we don't talk much about because it's much less exciting than anything that we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of, oh yes, I flew this thing or I did this operation or this is the first time this has ever been done. But um, that money comes from investors, it comes from insurers, uh, it comes from a market uh, that that supports and accepts the operational risks and operational costs for space. Uh, here's the thing, space is super profitable. Historically, investment into it 
has reliable, reliably provided a tremendous return. But space insurance is increasingly a really challenging market to be in. Uh, since the early 2010s, insurance premiums have been depressed, which is great for operators and owners, but it's also made insurers a little bit more risk averse. Um, and a significant failure can wipe out a huge fraction of the market. Uh, insurers often do operate at a loss, uh, especially recently. Since 2018, 2019, we've seen some pretty pretty rough um, kind of claims uh, numbers compared to the total insurance premium market. We've seen a lot of growth in space populations in the past couple of years. Um, yes, insurance premiums falling has helped a little bit, but a lot of it has also come from a lowering barrier of entry uh, to do so. But whenever you have more people uh, in the pool, um, you know, there, there's, there's, it's, it's more crowded. You know, maybe someone is going to pee in there. That's, it's a higher probability of it happening. I'm not saying anyone will, but it could happen more so. And so uh, that's caused the knock-on effect also of uh, some insurers pulling out of Leo collision markets. Uh, and that's been something that was uh, unprecedented previously. Oh, you're just not going to insure if I crash into something. That's, that's insane. But it does make sense because uh, we're seeing higher and higher risks of it. And we're existing within and working within uh, space domain awareness uh, paradigm and environment where we cannot accurately and consistently maintain custody of in-space objects and debris. Uh, and I think that that's, those two words there are really important, accuracy and consistency. Space assets may come into close proximity with dozens of undetected objects every day. And close proximity can mean a couple of kilometers, even up to 10 kilometers. Um, if you really want to go out that far, that number even rises further. Uh, that's our estimation anyway. We're right now seeing two huge concerns to space operations. The, uh, the objects that are going to fly within us, within our range, uh, that we can't see, um, but we should be able to avoid. And then there's the stuff that we can see, but we don't know precisely enough where that stuff is uh, to know exactly when we need to avoid it. And what that lends itself to is a increasing number of conjunction avoidance maneuvers. We get a lot of CDMs, uh, conjunction data messages, which say, hey, this is a concern. There might be a collision. Uh, we, should, we might want to avoid. Uh, there's a one in 10,000 chance. Well, one in 10,000 chance, we don't know what that even means. Uh, but the threshold for uh, how much risk we can take is, well, pretty low because nobody wants to cause a new space debris event. No one wants to just sit around and wait for their spacecraft to become a cloud of debris. But the problem is that it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of money and it confuses the environment even further to be avoiding things, especially when things that, when you're avoiding something that isn't even there. And so we're now in an environment where space traffic management is not really a reality, where people are constantly avoiding stuff every single day. We get hundreds of CDMs every day and well, we just got to deal with those and we have to wait until the ground station providers and the data providers, uh, the Numericas, the X Analytics, the Leo Labs state, oh yeah, this is the new you know, updated uh, TLE. This is where we expect this, this satellite to be. Uh, and now we have to update our projections and it's just this ongoing um, kind of rolling basis of, okay, what, what's gonna cause a CDM today uh, for my satellite? And every time that we undergo, uh, we have to manage a CDM, that costs a lot of money. Uh, even if it's only for a couple of days uh, of, I have a three day lead time for potential conjunction. Well, those costs can range from a small satellite operator spending about $10,000 for that kind of avoidance maneuver trade study and having to do that avoidance maneuver uh, to maybe $25,000. Um, and that's for generally uh, things in LEO and smaller satellites. When you're talking about a big geosat, uh, God forbid we're talking about uh, actual service outage. Uh, think about losing losing uh, you know ESPN during the Super Bowl because you know, there's a rock that might come within uh, you know 500 meters of a satellite that's providing that information. So I've previously lost a satellite to these unknown causes. I spent months to no avail trying to diagnose and reconnect with it. 
few million dollars, years of work. And in the end, we had a blip in orbit that we couldn't even be 100% certain uh, was actually our satellite because it was a CubeSat, it was very small, and it wasn't able to transmit reliably. So maybe that glint was off. Uh, the resolution that we could see things in was not good enough for us to ever determine anything really about it uh, from the moment that the astronauts lost sight of it on the ISS. And that's where we're, we're really kind of trying to, to you know, change things because there's no means of verification. There's no means of providing that additional knowledge layer that we think people should have about what's going on in space. This picture here uh, is, a, is a bit of a composite, uh, but when you see something like that from the ground, all you see is a big cloud. There's not really a lot there that you can discern very clearly uh, from the ground, but you could navigate it if you had information on site. So, with, with all that kind of uh, as, a, as a long, long meandering kind of preamble, um, space traffic will grow, um, people, spacecraft are flying blind. And what we think is that not only do we have inadequate custody of space right now, we're going to get even worse as things uh, become busier and busier. We're going to be losing track of satellites all the time. And uh, the nightmare scenarios for Kessler syndrome are exponential. But uh, what we don't consider with things like Kessler syndrome is service outages or um, loss of sight of objects that are undergoing this, um, this growth of uh, debris populations. All we're going to be able to see is a debris cloud and then a, and then a more diffuse debris cloud and then you know more and more just snaking out across orbit random objects. We're not going to know exactly what the um, propagation metrics are for these different pieces of debris. And we're not gonna know where the smaller bits are that we can't even detect right now. So when things happen to spacecraft, beyond the fact that we don't know very well what it looks like, we also have a lot of trouble figuring out what does happen in the first place uh, because of a couple different uh, layers of information. Um, it's, a, it's a game of telephone with your spacecraft. Something might've hit a solar panel or uh, there might have been an arcing that occurred in the wrong spot. But all that you know is that there's some weird power readings. So there's very little that we can do right now to prevent failures, provide local support, and keep satellites uh, you know, healthy on an ongoing basis beyond looking at our telemetry and trying uh, things whenever things look like they're off. But we're operating on an environment and a zeitgeist of lessons learned prepare us for hopefully uh, the, the known unknowns, but the next thing that you know, it's 1 a.m. in the control room and everyone's shouting over each other because something really odd happened or a way that we thought was going to help our satellite uh, recover from an anomaly actually caused it to just become much worse off. So bringing that back to, um, you know, the insurance bit, most things in space aren't insured. Uh, which is, which is crazy to think about uh, from the outside coming in, but it's high risk. The, the, the profile is very, very high risk. The profitability is good enough for a lot of people that they don't actually even bother insuring their things. But what we wanna do is it, generally in the industry is make it safe enough that people feel confident insuring things uh, on a broader basis. We've have less than half of geosats insured uh, and much, much less than that in LEO and MEO environments. Uh, and those are more uncertain, but we also have much actually better data fidelity on those, just worse coverage. So there's a lot of different um, balances that are in interplay here. But what, um, what we're seeing is that trying to mitigate the risks of space operations or make space operations more sustainable, a lot of times comes down to Let's make satellites serviceable. Let's make satellites refuelable. Yes, we should do both. We should allow for satellites to be uh, actually upgradable, um, and all of that. We can go to the mechanic and get a new, a, a new, a new wheel, a set of wheels put onto our cars. Yes, but we are not in a place right now where we can jump into that. Uh, we're still mostly using ground-based SDA. Uh, Astroscale is dipping their toes into space-based SSA and using that information uh, for their operations and satellite in, in, in the satellite servicing and debris segment. Well, that is, that is the first step. 
is building out and proliferating the ability to know what's going on in space from space. Because if we don't know what's going on in space, we are lacking really, really high quality data that is uh, anywhere between 50 and 1,000 times better than we can get from the ground in terms of resolution, in terms of reliability, uh, and in terms of different modalities that we can observe things through uh, in orbit compared to what we can do from the ground. Sure, eventually, when we're touching a satellite, we know all sorts of things about it, but that's not very scalable, uh, or that's not very scalable right now. Uh, you know, we have maybe direct access to what's going on a satellite. We might even be able to fix it if something's gone wrong, whereas we won't be able to fix something from the distance by just looking at it. But by just looking at it, we can have a lot of information on it that can help the people that are operating that satellite fix it. So Scout is focused on that segment, building a scalable satellite-based solution to avert, you know, a better understand these risky conjunctions, better understand satellite failures, better characterize the space debris environment and track things like ongoing crises, like, uh, like growing debris clouds on an ongoing basis. Uh, we wanna add certainty to what's going on in space. Because when you see something like this, uh, you know, even from space, it's a, it's a little blob. It's a, it's a small satellite. It's got kind of discrete features. I've made it even blurrier on purpose because we're just seeing something that could be space trash. It could be an asset of interest. It can be the satellite that you're supposed to be servicing. Um, it could even be an opportunity to recycle a bit and put it on something else. It could be a random solar panel that's flying off that you can take back to, you know, your 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 space station that you might want to retrofit onto something else in the you know crazy world of 2150. But right now, it's just a picture, and we just downlink a lot of imagery, and we need to take it to the next level for characterizing and cataloging and comprehensively introducing these systems, these objects that we observe into um, kind of a, a, well, a database that we are maintaining both from the ground and from space so that we can get the most data on these systems possible. We need to better understand the uncertainty of uh, when you're looking at something and it's a long ways away. Who knows where exactly it is um, because your error margins for knowing where it is from the ground are you know, upwards of a kilometer, really in the hundreds of meters. Uh, and if it's pretty well known, you know, in the in the dozens of meters, but uh, we need to get to the point where we can know things within centimeters. Uh, so we need surveyors in space in general. When you're looking at something from the ground uh, and you're looking at a satellite, you see something on the left. Uh, and you don't know if there's been a part split off of it. You don't know if it's actually a debris cloud. You don't know if there's been a loss of operations unless your satellite tells you that everything's fine. Uh, at which point then you can start being concerned about whether um, that's a false negative and actually something's gone wrong, but it's kind of stuck in a loop. So um, I you know, am getting a little bit into what Scout is about uh, now, which is where we do this kind of full stack like threat detection, asset protection, safety of flight uh, capability that's implemented via small, even CubeSat scale uh, vision systems integrated with onboard uh, processing capabilities uh, that we've already implemented and flown uh, back in June uh, in our first scout vision uh, system on the Tenzing mission with OrbitFab. And that's being used right now as a local situation awareness tool, as an inspection tool uh, for uh, nearby satellite systems, and also is being used as a supplementary control system, a vision system for actually uh, you know, integrating into the control loops that we rely right now on mostly mm, GPS, uh, maybe we use LIDAR, uh, but it can be a lot smaller. It can be a lot more power uh, efficient, and it also can provide much broader uh, swath of information. So we've already implemented some of this capability. We've already kind of you know made the step over that hurdle of have we proved that this is a viable capability or that this is important to do? Uh, we think so. Um, you know, using AI-driven detection, identification, and tracking. Um, delivering local situation awareness, mapping space objects and debris uh, as a service to operators, as a service to satellite um, servicers to better understand what it is that they're going to be working on, what it is that they want to be working on. Um, and uh, we're also working towards multispectral uh, payloads that will also provide uh, some deeper insights on what's going on on the satellite to kind of go a little bit beneath the skin 
to figure out its uh, diagnostic kind of traceability. So that is a bit of a narrow scope. It's a very, it's a very tight kind of mission mission profile that we've kind of set ourselves up in, and that's where I think uh, things kind of come together is the discussion of the space ecosystem, because my start has been uh, at Deep Space Industries, and I worked at uh, another company called RAS Labs, and I've worked on, you know, from kind of the prime perspective, I've worked at an SBR farm, you know, I've worked in academia, I've worked in labs, and all of those segments, um, they all provide different things. I think that the drive to vertically integrate capabilities is uh, very high and very understandable and very human, but a lot of times it's necessary. I think that we are in a geopolitical perspective uh, dealing with, um, I don't like, uh, I don't subscribe to an inherently um, kind of adversarial stance geopolitically, but we are dealing with uh, something of a, of a balance of powers and there's differentiation on both ends. And efficiency is something that, um, that Europe and the US and well, Europe and the Western hemisphere uh, share in, in really interesting ways, um, but it's all disparate. And I think a lot of people are competing where they could be uplifting each other. Uh, a lot of people are developing their own vision systems. Yeah, that's totally great. Uh, but we're also integrating with people that might have their own vision systems and wanna focus on, um, you know, leveraging a little bit more data, a little bit more onboard kind of plug and play capability, or just want to get that off their off their plate or off their uh, OPEX. Uh, we're also working with the ground-based uh, SDA providers and uh, building out uh, better knowledge of things that then they can provide uh, from their ground-based radar systems. And um, that is something that we think is really important. As we make space more transparent, um, well, Currently, people are struggling to understand that there's not really anywhere that you can hide in space, um, but there's many opportunities to hide operations in space. But soon, if we proliferate the ability to see things uh, persistently in orbit, uh, which is what we seek to do at a large scale, there also won't be anywhere that you can hide your operations in space. And we think that that's something that's really important uh, to be able to do. Governments are starting to understand it and own up to it. Um, and so we just wanna kind of get that moving uh, even faster because every day, every month, every year that uh, we're not watching things that are going on in orbit uh, with a very keen eye is uh, another you know, 400,000 per year opportunities for uh, more debris to be formed and uh, people to do something stupid and accidentally crash into each other without oversight, validation or verification of their operations. So that's, Sergio, that's pretty much what I had, just an overarching. Thank you so much. Really fascinating. Um, it reminds me of the scene in Apollo 13, where after everything has happened, they think they know what, what took place. But that moment where that part of the spacecraft comes off and they're able to see firsthand the state of that explosion um, and and their reaction to that um, is, it tells you that a picture is worth a thousand words and um, seeing something can really change your understanding, even when you think you already understand it. That is something that that a lot of people are very, are very excited about. Like I can get pictures of this and exactly how this happened uh, where I don't just see a blur on the screen, but I can see something the size of a dime uh, on a satellite. I'm like, yeah, I guess. Uh, I personally uh, get it, but I'm, I'm really excited about uh, some of the aspects of an additional layer of, of knowledge, I think, uh, because seeing it, there's also a lot of false positives and a lot of uh, you know, things that we can convince ourselves of if we see something uh, that might be mm, uncertain. Uh, so... I, I am excited about uh, being able to see things more reliably, but I'm more excited, honestly, about um, you know the 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 fact that we're offloading all this work onto AI so that we can just kind of you know classify and detect and track and and move that move that uh, that data along in such a way that we're not necessarily looking at pictures all the time mm -hmm. um, because eventually it'll become 
boring, right? <laughs> and that's that's the hope that that space becomes boring. That's where we want to go. Uh, and for me, I just um, I'm very stoic about it. But uh, there, there's a lot of excitement, I think, in in being able to, you know, not just look at look at a satellite and figure out what went wrong, but uh, just just get the answer. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's something that insurers are cognizant of as well of a lot of the different anomalies and failures that we see every year. Um, they estimate, and we we similarly estimate that about 70 to 75 percent of these kinds of failures could be pre um, kind of predicted and even potentially mitigated um, by uh, an on-site inspection. So kind of the addition, the different layers and modalities of uh, applying space-based sensing, um, there's just so many of them, uh, but uh, at least ours right now is, uh, is kind of focused on the very close range of uh, validating and verifying where things are and at the very far range of, of kind of broadening the scope of what we can see. That's great. Uh, there is one question in the chat. Um, the data on failure rates, this is likely based on existing well-known manufacturers such as Airbus and Boeing. Do you see the percentage of failure increasing with the 40 times increase as new entrants who aren't as good at making sure their satellites last come into the market? So um, there, yeah, the, fa the, the failure rates, the failure uh, traceability uh, is probably only going to get worse, uh, honestly, because I think that we're not necessarily learning that how to better uh, catalog and diagnose uh, satellite failures. Um, mm -hmm. And we're getting more, more diverse sets of systems that are flying in orbit. Uh, about, um, we could see, we, we, we can see that about half of uh, satellite failures are traceable to ESD in general. Uh, and there's a lot of best practices that you can apply to mitigating ESD. Um, but best practices are best when they're applied 100% of the time, and they're not. Uh, but even if they are, uh, space is a plasma environment, and sometimes the sun coughs off a, pro a proton that would just punch right through your CPU, and there you go, uh, even if it's rad hard by design. Um, but the fundamental problem, I think, with those failure rates um, is that no matter where they come from, we have like a 12-step process to figuring out what even happened to cause that. And so as new entrants come into the market, we're just gonna have even more, I, I don't know, satellite no work. Eh, eh. We don't have, we don't have uh, six months and, you know, and, and $3 million to like diagnose this failure. We're going under because we lost our satellite. That's gonna happen a lot. And that has happened a lot. Yeah, it's uh, daunting, especially if insurers are bailing out of, of covering things and uh, yeah, you've, you've covered that as well. Um, really appreciate your review of Scout, but also the broad scope of your talk covering so many different aspects of the problem, really enlightening and hope you'll come back to share more later on. Yeah, always happy to share some uh, cheerful insights. <laughs> All right, our next speaker is Simon Reed. He is the Chief Operating Officer at the UK branch of D-Orbit, where he is responsible for leading D-Orbit's business and technology development. A uh, D-Orbit is a European new space company focusing on orbital transportation, debris mitigation, and removal. He is a business and technical manager with a solid informational technology background and 30 years of experience in the space industry, developing system architecture and operational software systems for clients such as European Space Agency, UMETSAT, UTELSAT, Galileo, and the UK Space Agency. Simon joined D-Orbit in mid-2019 because, in his words, D-Orbit is a truly interdisciplinary space company with capabilities that cover the whole lifetime of a space mission. His goal is to contribute to the growth of the UK space industry by identifying and pursuing its untapped potential. Simon, thank you for being here and the screen is yours. Well, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Uh, Lee, I've been uh, sitting around and picking up the, the really nice atmosphere <laughs> in this conversation so far. Um, and I uh, hope I can uh, contribute a little bit to the discussion. Um, so what, what I've done is I've really kind of pulled together a few things together. Um, 
uh, from various slides. We didn't have anything potentially prepared, but um, you know, the topic's such an important one that I thought I'd uh, yeah just pull a few things together. So the, so there's a bit of uh, difference between the style and some of the slides and things like that because I pulled some things together. And in fact, some of it was related to some news we had actually just today. So there's some you know, a good good reason. Uh, <laughs> Good, we like informal and good timing. You know, yeah, information that's comes at us in any form. That's good. So I'll I'll see how we go, and then if you feel free to ask any questions or, or what have you. So I wanted to, you know, I'm picking up on this um, theme of sustainability, right? So, so do your bit is is you know is 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 it's got sustainability within its ethos right from the beginning. Um, so as a benefit corporation, that's a kind of type of organisation who defines itself and measures itself for positive purpose and impact on society. And I think we were the first aerospace company in the world to be certified by, uh, as such. So I think we went looking for to find such a thing, and I think it's beginning to, to grow that B Corp movement you know, across all industries. But our vision is about in-space servicing and transportation um, and enabling profitable business. So it's how do you make business sustainable as well as what you're doing being sustainable. So there's no good having one without the other. They need to be hand in hand, right? Um, and space, you know, is a natural resource, but we have to use responsibly. And we're in an amazing um, juncture in the space industry at the moment. So much change, so much growth, um, and uh, exciting. It's an exciting time to be here. And uh, Diorbit's a really exciting company to be working in as part of that. I've been here for two years um, since working on more traditional, you know, space in uh, science missions and telecoms and and some robotic exploration missions and so on. But what's happening now? in the orbit and generally everything's happening so fast, right? Everything's happening so fast. So I thought in the, com in the sort of context of debris, there are so many different aspects to it <laughs> um, in, in the problem and also the solution, or at least how do we address that? And I've seen a couple of the earlier speakers talking about collaboration, and I think that's really important. And, the, and it's, we have to embrace the diversity. There isn't one answer to any of the parts of the solution. And there is that sense of trying to sort of compete, that's competing sort of spirit that sometimes maybe drags us back when we're talking with other organizations. But we try to be really collaborative and much of our success is based on the success of our customers and our, and our partners. Um, and as, you know, as responsible company, we want to, Bring, it's important to bring the whole of the thing forward, the whole safety agenda forward, not just treat it as a business opportunity. Right? So the three sort of themes in terms of avoiding, let's try and avoid, make sure we avoid debris in the first place. Okay? So there's lots of talk about removal, of course, and that's quite high profile. And you know, uh, Astroscale had a really good news today in their step towards their goals. Um, but, you know, but that's, that's not the answer, right? There's too much there already and we can't sort of rely on the solution, which, which means we just create the junk just to remove it. That just makes no sense, right? So we have to avoid it, make sure we avoid that happening in the first place. There's many measure, uh, measures that we could take now. There's, there's many things we can do which are not difficult at all and we could do better. Another part is then detection of the existing debris we kind of don't really know enough about what's there. Um, so those risks are kind of unknown. We don't know, it's a lack of precision, a lack, lack of knowledge you know, and precise enough information. So we need to really work on getting better information about the existing debris to be able to address it. Right? So I thought I'd just go through a little bit about the Orbit's wider vision um, and achievements so far and sort of where we're heading in terms of the business sustainability in the context of that. And then I've got sort of three topics that we've been working on um, more recently, or I'm just about to start. Or one, one is um, uh, our, our debris removal devices, which was a actually the, the, 
the first uh, deal it's named after. <laughs> it's very first, uh, it was founded on the basis of uh, a debris removal um, service. Um, but we've just recently uh, announced today a, a co contract with the European Space Agency to, to deliver that functionality for them. So I can give some details on that. Um, we've also been looking quite detailed working with the UK Space Agency on using um, our existing satellites for uh, detecting uh, debris, which has come up earlier as well. So that's that's a good, good, good thing. I can go into a bit more how, how we do that and, and it's an exploiting opportunity really. Um, and so often we talk about other people's debris. Right? <laughs> how do you deal with other people's problems, right? So I wanted to talk a bit about responsibility as, as a spacecraft operator ourselves, um, which we are as well. <laughs> so you know, to go and remove debris and to do things, we're creating things in space. So we need to be part of that avoidance story as, as well. Um, and recently we did an analysis connected with the um, UNUSA, United Nations um, tools uh, outer space and they've got some long-term sustainability guidelines, which we have assessed ourselves against. And uh, one of my colleagues went to a big uh, conference a few weeks ago. So I stole some of her slides just to do that assessment. Actually, we were quite surprised on the feedback that we got on, the, on, on that. So, you know, again, it's easy things that we, we can do, which perhaps go beyond the rules and the, and the, and the, and the sort of norms. Uh, it's, it's actually not that difficult for everyone to do that. Um, so hopefully we can keep going. So Deorbit is founded in 10 years ago. In, uh, we're based near Lake Como. So it's a great place to visit. I haven't managed to be there go there myself the last 18 months, but um, um, I'm part of the UK team. Um, we, we, we've got an office in Harwell where many of the companies are based, but we're also setting up in Cornwall where we're building, bringing the launch service that Deorbit offers from the UK as well. Um, we've got a, a software office in uh, Portugal and a commercial office in the US as well. So the big vision is really creating logistics infrastructure in space, thinking future economies. Um, nowadays, all our economies are based on Earth, but it won't be long before there's a sustainable, permanent presence in space where we're sort of doing business, making money in space, basically. And that needs an infrastructure to, to sustain it and support it. So we've got to make sure that infrastructure is sustainable. Um, is both a fundamental part of this infrastructure that we need to have. Um, and, and so this is a key thing that we are focusing on. So just a bit of history and a sort of and the roadmap. So I mentioned that we started um, 10 years ago with this uh, product for decommissioning called D3. Um, in order to develop, so that is a product, I'll go into more detail later. It's a product that you attach to a, a spacecraft or device to make sure it gets removed from orbit at the end of its life, either on a planned or unplanned basis. Um, and in order to develop that, we actually demonstrate, built a satellite called DSAT around it uh, to be able to sort of demonstrate that capability. Um, as others have said, there wasn't much of a market for such a thing, um, but that capability we took forward, we could see the emerging market in uh, um, space transportation, CubeSats, New Space, and develop that technology into our current service. And then beyond that, we go into in, in orbit servicing and waste management. Then the, the imperative for recycling comes and then manufacturing in space and so on. So I think the point I'm trying to break here is that each of these steps builds upon the previous one. So this is how we're doing it from a sustainability point in terms of our business. We're kind of making money at each step in order to invest in the next step. And I think that's you know, a lesson learned, which is kind of working for us in that sense. So it's great having these big visions, but you know, you've got to try and persuade somebody to, to invest in it. And if there's a very long return cycle. So our investors include uh, Seraphim. So we had Jeff earlier, so that was, was sort of part of 
nice, nice to see the connection there. So in terms of where we are now, um, we went through our um, uh, 10 year cycle. Um, we had our first uh, uh, satellite in space in 2017. And then in the last um, 10 months, we delivered successful commercial space transportation missions. Um, and uh, the next one is due to take place in December. So as a company, we were the first company to develop an active decommissioning device system, and the first to be this precise in orbit positioning service as well. So we're really push, pushing boundaries and moving forward sort of as fast as the market can allow us. Um, so this is our platform, our satellite platform, which we currently is a very versatile that we use for our current services and also as a platform for our future ones as well. Um, which includes in, uh, in the future, uh, in-orbit servicing and debris removal and so on and so forth. And I explain how we're gonna get there in a second. So right now, the service is around getting into space. Is it perhaps creating debris? <laughs> but um, there is a big market and there's a, a real challenge in getting enough uh, oper uh, to get, get uh, that technology into the right places in space. And so that is the market which we're currently addressing. So this is sort of how we do it. Um, uh, hopefully that will work. So there's a quick video showing the um, satellite in orbit transportation service. So after release from a launcher, um, all we, the... We are not seeing the video. We're not, not seeing, seeing the video. Okay, never mind, I'll abandon that idea. <laughs> so, <laughs> that doesn't work. I can move on. I can move on. Um, you're not sharing your screen at all just so you know we, we are looking at your face I, <laughs> I didn't realize i thought sorry not to have brought it up That's soon my, my bad there we go there we go and maybe try the video again oh there that's we go good. yeah that's, that's okay good. you can see that oh that's beautiful oh, my apologies so the in-orbit transportation service is delivering um, space. Um, uh, so the point here is that when, when, you're, uh, when, you, when you're a commercial uh, satellite system, you need to be able to go to specific orbital slots, whereas the launcher might not be going to where you need. So this is a kind of a taxi service that takes you to that extra, extra place. Okay, so... Uh, so we've just missed, missed all my previous slides. And anyway, so here's the, the, here's the business imperative for that, um, which is the uh, uh, faster time to revenue and get, get into space. Um, so if we've just missed, missed a few, I'd like to just sort of maybe dwell on, on this one on the roadmap thing. So this is where we're talking about the historical uh, context of um, delivery into space. Um, and, and, and every step, step beyond it. Okay. So where we are now is, is, is sort of building up on our capabilities. So um, we've had four successful missions. Um, this is a picture taken, this is a Planet Labs dove that was uh, delivered into space um, uh, on our first mission. And so there's a real imperative there. We see the questions like, are we creating new debris? But also, are, we are in a posi unique position in this context to be able to develop technologies to detect and remove debris as well. And we can test that um, because we're automatically close to these objects when we're releasing them. I'll move, move on a little bit. There's a video, I hope you could see that one, of, of, a, of a release, a couple of releases, and a little bit more eye candy there with another customer that we released. So now we're busy doing this, this thing uh, every, every few months. Um, so time's moving on, so I'll kind of, kind of zoom in a bit. Um, one, of, one of the things we do, apart from just releasing CubeSats, is take um, clients as a hosted payload on our missions. And uh, on our latest mission, we're happy to take a client with a, a, a drag sale. So at soon, soon and uh, in a few months' time, we'll be deploying that. And, rem and, uh, and, and, and yeah, removing our satellite from object, 
from uh, space using that and taking really detailed data uh, on, on the descent. So D3 is our decommissioning device, which I said is attached to a, an object before um, release from, from a spacecraft. From, from, it's attached to a spacecraft or an object before it is um, launched. And its purpose is a, like a mini self-contained system with its own propulsion, which will remove objects from space at the end of life. Um, we just announced today a, a contract with the European Space Agency to develop such a device under the European Space Safety Programme. Um, and its function is uh, as I previously described, but we are uh, focusing initially on a particular application on a, on a launch dispenser. So it will be used uh, to attach to a, a VESPA device, which is part of the Vega launcher. And actually it's gonna be connected with the mission, uh, which ESA has, is running called the Clear Space Mission to remove an old VESPA. So this is an interesting, uh, you know, forcing the situation almost that when we're removing an old, vest, an old piece of debris, it's a fantastic step. But are we creating new debris in the, in the process? So no, of course, you can't do that. So that's a sort of an interesting kind of uh, juxtaposition of, of, of challenges. But it makes those questions come to life, come to life. Um, so as that system will be um, delivered um, on, onto the VESPA, and this is the concept of operation. So immediately after release um, and, and, the, and the dispenser is finished with, we'll switch on our device, detumble the, the, um, the, uh, the object, and then remove it within 24 hours. So that's a really another important point that, that compares with you know, guidelines to re remove within 25 years, or you even use drag sails and other technique, passive techniques. You know, you're still at, at, at risk during that time and you're not in control of when, where actually the re-entry takes place as well, which is something that we, that we will be doing. Um, yeah, I'll move on, I'll move on. So on the topic of um, using our spacecraft, so we're having regular launches. So we're doing one of these every few weeks, which means we're building up a, a constellation of, of satellites in space. Um, and we have been investigating whether we can use the opportunity with our cameras on board um, and other things that don't, don't really cost us much to take on board to actually see if we can detect debris and contribute to the, the challenge of, of, of information about debris um, without creating special missions necessarily. Um, so this is, uh, we're exploiting these uh, cameras that we've got on board. Um, and we're also exploiting RF techniques. Where we're able to actually pick up um, RF signals from passing telecommunication satellites and, and, the, and the radar shadow of those can be used to actually detect the, and, and characterize the objects as well. So we've been studying this over the last year or so with the European space, with the UK Space Agency. So this is just bringing data into uh, an SST processing center, which UK is actually setting up. So how am I time-wise, Lee, at the moment? We have about seven minutes. Okay, thank you. So, um, uh, so you know, we've got quite a lot of interesting observations there where we've detected that we can see things from our cameras. Um, perhaps we can upgrade them in future missions. That's what we're looking for. But of course, getting the data is one thing. The next thing is the data problem. There's so much data. How do we actually deal with that data? That's another really big part of what we're, we're looking at on SST and also a wider context. So we're working on building uh, in orbit cloud computing capabilities and, and software and you know, proper data center type um, processing that's actually able to just pin down the tiny bits of information which might be useful and get those expedited. Um, so um, as well as opportunistic data collection, 
we're, that we're in, in space, we've got a very versatile satellite, which has got um, very high maneuverable capabilities. We could actually take orders to look at, look at specific parts of debris as well. So we know certain objects might be threatening to another object, so, you know, to, to one piece of our critical infrastructure or another satellite. So the, 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 the range of, of error in the, in the existing knowledge just from ground-based observations is sufficient to want to know more and find that information you just can't possibly find out or see from the ground. So, so this is another case for, for doing this kind of thing. And because we're there anyway, the cost is, you know, I wouldn't say, you know, the cost is nothing compared to, uh, and the timeliness is nothing because we're already there ready on station be able to actually respond. So if there is a debris collision and lots of new debris, we might well be in a position to help, you know, find out information, the new set of information about what's happening. So, um, yeah, so what about this um, UNUSA, um, long-term sustainability guidelines, and how do we behave as a satellite operator? Um, so these are the guidelines that have been set out and then you sort of respond to how you behave in, in, in response to those. Um, so it's, you know, the technology and the design uh, that addresses the risks of being in orbit. Um, so our ION satellite is fully redundant in every single subsystem, including the propulsion. So this is quite a rare thing. People don't tend to do that. They re do reliability um, studies and so on. Um, but we make sure that actually we effectively got a, a decommissioning device built into the design of our satellite. And that in itself is increasing the reliability of it. We always do a regular collision analysis for ourselves, but also the uh, our clients before we re release them. That's a really important part of our service. We need to obviously not put them in the path of uh, you know, some, something that's coming. Um, and, and yeah, the, I've already talked about the B-Corp thing. Uh, the conjunction assessments during all our orbital flights. Um, we, we use um, commercial software and then developing our own software um, as well and trying to build that sort of um, be part of that infrastructure as well in order to make sure, our, again, our, we're, not, we're not contributing to the debris problem. Um, and finally, um, it's a, a, a part of these long-term sustainability guidance guidelines. It's not only about you, it's about how you behave in the community. And we have two sort of themes, uh, initiatives. One is the Deorbit Academy, Academy and the other thing, Distributed Space. Um, the Deorbit Academy is our sort of training professional development program where we use sort of outreach to members of the local community, um, you know, education and support, and maybe young engineers who want to be inspired to find their own solutions in the future. And distributed space is our concept of um, business expansion, but sort of effective and low cost access to space for countries that do not have the resources. Um, so we're really keen on, on reaching out uh, in that sense as well. So um, we've got some lessons learned, um, which is my final slide um, from this UNUSA concept. And one is the quality side. Now we've been working in the sort of new space industry um, where a lot of focus has been on developing things very fast. Um, sometimes it's the idea is it doesn't matter if you're sending a thousand satellites and some of them don't work, you know, that, that's, that's a problem, right? So I think we have to really not forget the quality of everything we do. And in fact, we, we've got a really large uh, quality PA department in our company, um, sort of proportionally is bigger than the most, which is probably not, not well understood. And, and collaboration. So we want to work together, like, like I said at the beginning. Okay, so, so one, one I, example is that drag sale collaboration with our the German company, if you like. We're helping them develop their product, which is going to help 
um, you know, them as a business, but also the, the whole keep the whole uh, environment of, of sustainability. And we want to coordinate and be part of that, you know, that network coordination of tracking of objects. Um, because we think everybody should as, as, a, as a responsible operator. So there, I'll finish there. Thank you. So if we want to start sort of chatting, I've tried to rush through a few different topics. This is so fascinating because earlier we talked with a company that talked about how companies should lower their quality standards if they can be confident they'll they'll have a space tug available and overall the economics of that whereas you've taken this different track of ensuring quality so that either you have decommissioning capabilities from the start um or not talk about that interplay just a little bit mm. that decision making lower quality standards yes i guess you can sort of lower your reliability requirements your, your, your needs and so if you've got um backup systems yeah like a space tug um or or, or other solutions that kind of is viable i guess i'm not sure if that's the same as reducing your quality um because you know a space tug service will cost you money anyway whatever you do i mean you take out insurance and that sort of thing yeah. i think there's a good point there in terms of uh, sort of your investment as, and your versus your return on on these kind of mitigation measures so it's, it, it's really valuable that people are thinking about this putting their numbers on you know in a spreadsheet and working out the best way of doing it um there are things like the, the decommissioning device, which itself can add to the, um, uh, you know, change, it changes that equation, right? So, and it could be used just for, as part of your plans decommissioning, if not part of your unplanned decommissioning. Um, and you know, we've got a history where satellites have a design lifetime. People tend to push beyond the end of that lifetime. And if you've got more backup, capability there that add, makes that safer and and it's more economically sustainable to do that as well so um, that's and especially if you're able to do things with a controlled re-entry as opposed to passive re-entry there are all these things that sort of add up to being more sustainable yeah i mean we love to let our mars rovers run for <laughs> years and years and years after they were supposed to be done and it's kind of a different equation. If you can do something uh, to decommission while your satellite's still alive, that could have value as well. Yeah. Yeah, but thinking ahead is, is easier. So I think as Toby said earlier, um, pre-planning the possibility that you might need a tug means that it's far easier to remove an object that's, that's got some kind of cooperative aspect to that possibility um, is, really, is really important. And uh, that makes such a difference. And that's easy to do these days as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting a sense for Deorbit's sort of core competencies just from the variety in the conversation. You talked about your the way that you grow as a company, right? You want to make sure that you're funding additional growth with success um, from, from the original business. And so there's yes, sort of a sustainability I mean. there and then this same sustainability about how do we get ahead of the problem using guidance from UNUSA um, and, and change the way we do something from the very start in order to succeed. Yeah, this is one of the areas where we're trying to help push the boundaries, right? So UNUSA yeah. and there's guidelines and there's rules and regulations, right? So how can we kind of, there's always a, talk about um, enforcement and, and rules mm -hmm. and licensing and so on. But how can you, um, you know, how can the regulator make a rule about something that they don't know whether it will work or not? You know? <laughs> or, or they don't know whether this behavior is actually um, effective or not. Okay. So if we sit back and wait, you know, they need to spend the money and then and it will take, you know, it can take decades to, for things to move. But we want to do things by 
doing and showing, right? And and uh, we've got this great opportunity from our that's been created as a side effect of our existing commercial service, yeah. where we're going into space every few weeks. So this allows us and this allows our partners to try things out, okay, with a new way of doing space. It doesn't really matter if you do your test and it doesn't work, if you've done it as a test, which is contained within a few months, and then you learn and then you do it again. And then the successful test feeds right back to the regulator. And there you've got a mark, you know, a way of creating uh, products in the marketplace. You know? And the way then the regulator can start being more strict and, and actually forcing people to, to take those, um, you know, use those products or, or you know, um, take that approach you, you you use that best practice because it is you know somebody else has proven that it is it is doable yeah learning by getting to do something over and over again you know that's how which is I... which is so different than than what's ingrained into a typical space engineering life cycle it really <laughs> is it really that's one of the contrasts i come from oil and gas and being newer to the space industry that's one of the main contrasts that I draw between the two industries is that oil and gas people have their failures thrown in their face on a weekly basis uh, and space people don't. But I'm really excited to hear about uh, that level of activity with deorbit. Great, thank you. Um, let's see if there are any questions um, going back in the chat. I think we have covered what we wanted to cover today and i hope you'll come back and give us an update at another time okay thank you very much thank you all right everyone it has been a pleasure having you all on screen with us again today and we hope you've enjoyed our programming if you are a loyal listener or a brand new friend please consider helping us cover the cost of the show you can sponsor a talk like the generous Terry Trevino has done, or make a donation at registration for our next event at www.f4f.space slash conversations. We'll be back tomorrow for more conversations featuring George Neald, Pete Garretson, Christopher Johnson, Michael Lane, Inara Tabir, Madhu Thangabelu, David Chevron, and Megan Crawford. Don't miss it. I'm Lee Steinke with Foundation for the Future, and we'll see you tomorrow.